Good morning, Austin. We are calling to order meeting number 276 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, September 12th, 2019 at 10 a.m. at our offices at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. We'll begin with item number two. Commissioner Stebbins, please. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, in front of you have the minutes from the August 15th, 2019 uh, commission meeting. I'd move the adoption of the minutes from that meeting, again, subject to any grammatical corrections or other immaterial changes. Any discussion? You know, I did, um, I'm sorry. I did have a question, um, and I should have asked um, Director Wells, and um, maybe somebody will remember. On uh, page five, when she talks about uh, the, the junket uh, licensing requirements, she clarified that uh, at the very end of that page five, she clarified that when the IEB is referring to junkets, they're specifically re referring to junkets and Macau. I thought it was not Macau. I In the context of marketing, right. we're not really talking about us licensing the junkets in Macau or whatever that scheme we is there. We can make that change. Okay. Yeah. Any other um, suggested edits or questions or comments? Sure, it's not here, but they're excellent. Thank you. Do I um, have a second to Commissioner Stebbins' motion? I second with that correction. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. Thank you. As you can see, we're missing today Commissioner Cameron. Um, I think she's on a lovely golf course at the Ryder Club. <laughs> Cup uh, in Scotland, so we um, hoping that she has good Scotland weather, but we are missing her today. So. Okay, administrative update, Director Petrosian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. A couple things I just want to update you on. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we traditionally release gross gaming revenue for the previous month on the 15th. The 15th is a Sunday, so as we follow our past practice, um, we'll release that on Monday the 16th. So just uh, an FYI. Uh, the next thing I want to do was to give you an update on some staffing issues, some what I call open positions, um, some of which are open but are in the interviewing process and or background check process. So I'll, I'll let you know what they are. We have a senior enforcement council that is in the interviewing process. In fact, some interviews are happening this morning. We have gaming agents in Metro Boston. Um, we have three offers made for people in background check and may have an additional position for a backfill on someone we found out may be leaving us. So um, if there are folks who are interested in being a gaming agent, please keep uh, posted with our website and um, that may be an opportunity for someone. We have a senior systems engineer. We have an offer out with a background check in process. We have an IT cloud specialist position. We haven't interviewed that one because that one is contingent upon some structural IT changes, which I, that's another issue I may come back to you uh, with and explain with our CIO. Um, so just hold off on that one, please. We do have, however, a senior service desk specialist. We have an offer made to a, a great individual who's in the background check right now. Uh, we expect that should be um, taken care of relatively soon. And also, the IEB lost their open source specialist, so we're in the process of um, refining that uh, job posting and having that posted. You have to get an HRD template. We'll get that done and get that out soon. So those are our open positions. Does anyone have any questions on those? And just in case you do, I brought our HR person. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, the next thing I want to do is recognize um, Director Vander Linden. Um, who was asked to serve on Singapore has a National Council on Problem Gaming. Within that National Council, they have an international advisory panel. And Mark has been asked to serve on the international advisory panel, which I think is a tribute to a lot of the work that he and, I would say in part, the Commission does on responsible gaming. Um, uh, previous members of that are people we no, Dr. Volbert has been a previous member of that. Keith White has been a previous member of that. 
Um, and I think um, uh, Mark uh, will do a great job. Um, and as much as I think we are a leader, I also uh, believe that participating in that will benefit us also. So I just wanted to congratulate Mark on that and let you all know about that. Yeah, let me just add to that to that point. Um, I think, as you as you alluded to, Director, the the work that uh, we've done here is recognized, and we've talked about this uh, uh, before. It's recognized in other places as really uh, important for the industry, for the business model, and of course, most importantly, for the players. And um, I really uh, think that Director Van der Linden could come at a later time, either today or a later commission meeting, and give more details of the trip that sure. he already took um, and some of the feedback uh, that he, uh, what we learn from um, what they wrestle with in other jurisdictions. Uh, Singapore is really a premier market in, in Asia and uh, one that, uh, again, as you say, we could learn from. But um, uh, it's, it's great that, uh, that he was um, asked to participate and, uh, and then he's able to do that. Great. Thank you. I uh, just want to note that Director Wells just came in. Is there any need to clarify that, uh, to go over with Director Wells, the um, edit on the minutes? We're good. I think we're good. Excellent. Thank you so much. And congratulations to Mark. The next item on the agenda is consideration of a petition filed with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission relative to the 2016 denial of the application for a gaming license submitted by Mass Gaming and Entertainment. Uh, before we begin, and if you'll indulge me, I would like to explain the process that we will follow today. Um, we are here on a procedural legal matter Accordingly, we will begin by asking our lawyers to brief us on the law pertaining to reconsideration or reopening of previous agency licensing decisions. We will then allow the petitioner to present its position to the commission. We expect that presentation to be limited to the very narrow issues related to reconsideration that are properly before the commission today. Of course, any commissioner may ask any question or offer any comment during the course of either presentation. Because this is a legal matter, we will not be opening the floor for public comments today. However, regardless of the outcome of today's review, there will be an appropriate time for public comment and input on the subject of a gaming establishment in Region C in the future. To that end, I would like to acknowledge received by the Commission of numerous written comments relative to Region C related issues. Since these comments were largely not directly related to the narrow issue now before us, they have not been included in the public materials for review by the Commission today. Again, these materials may be reviewed at the appropriate time in the future, and they're very critical to our process. Before I continue, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge the presence of at least we know of one elected official, our um, Mayor Rodriguez, who is here from Brockton today. I hope we haven't missed anyone else. Thank you, Mayor, for being here today, and thank you for your continued interest in this important subject matter and commitment to ensuring the best possible outcome for the region for the Commonwealth as a whole. We'd like to also pause for a moment at this point and remember a person who would undoubtedly have been present here today, the late Bill Carpenter, mayor of, of the city of Brockton, your predecessor. Bill is a great champion for the city of champions, a tremendous advocate for the region, and as I understand, an all around, all around good man will keep it in front of mind today during these proceedings. At the conclusion of the presentations by the Commission's Council and MG&E's Council, the Commissioners will discuss the matter in open meeting and vote on the outcome. The first question that we'll consider is whether the Commission has the authority 
to reconsider a previous decision relative to the award of a gaming license. Secondly, if we determine that we do possess that authority, we will decide whether there are sufficient grounds in this case, whether they exist to properly exercise that authority to reconsider the Commission's 2016 decision. As I mentioned, we are here today on a petition sub submitted by Mass Gaming and Entertainment for reconsideration of the Commission's prior decision to deny its application for a gaming license. It's important to clarify a few points at the outset because this is not uncomplicated. If the petition is allowed and the Commission agrees to reconsider its prior decision, it does not mean that the gaming license is awarded to Mass Gaming and Entertainment and they can go ahead and commence construction of a casino in Brockton. Instead, such a decision would only mean that the Commission agrees to set up a further proceeding in which we would review the prior application again and determine based on the particulars of the submission, including public input, whether to award the gambling, gaming a license. Excuse me. On the other hand, if the Commission denies Mass Gaming and Entertainment's petition today, it does not mean that there will never be a casino in Brockton <clears throat> or elsewhere in Regency. As long as the Regency gaming license has not been awarded, the Commission may choose to reopen Regency to bids from any interested party, including Mass Gaming and Entertainment, at any time. The question as to whether to reopen Regency is not before the Commission today, however. Do any of my uh, fellow colleagues have further comments before we turn over to our lawyers? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow up on the scope of what we're here for today, I did want to clarify there were a number of submissions by MG&E's counsel, um, particularly the one that came in this week. And just from my perspective going forward for our counsel and for MG&E's counsel, to me anything beyond page five in that submission is really beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. I want to hear what has to do with the question of law. Do we have the authority and should we? So I just want to make clear as we go forward to not only the parties here, but any other parties, um, anything past page five in that submission to me is beyond the scope of why we are here today. Any further um, comments or considerations? I think that um, Commissioner O'Brien has raised a, um, an important point. We did receive a PowerPoint, I believe, yesterday from MG&E, and uh, that is included in our our um, documents that was publicly posted and um, uh, I don't believe that any minds have been made up. Uh, in terms of relevancy, we would have to be convinced, um, of course, as to the narrow, how they're relevant to the narrow issue before us. Um, I'm speaking for myself when I say we, I really should only say I would have to be convinced. Um, and. You know, we will allow you the opportunity to make sure to be heard on all of that. When it, would, do, oh, I, when we, I believe you'll be going second and then you can explain this. Okay, excellent. And thank you. So I think at this point, uh, barring any other comments, excuse me, um, that we will turn now to Attorney Blue, Attorney Grossman, um, that's Catherine Blue and Todd Grossman, I understand that we've allocated, this is probably the best news for all of us, um, about 20 minutes for each argument. I only say that not for our front row, but for the folks behind, um, that we are limiting our presentations in a fair way. Um, and we thank you for proceeding. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. This morning, the legal department has a brief presentation regarding your discretion and authority to reconsider this matter. Mr. Grossman will be going through the PowerPoint that we put together and it will also be up on the screen. So go ahead, Mr. Grossman. Thank you and uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. As uh, Ms. Blue mentioned, we did prepare a PowerPoint that will uh, uh, run through, help us run through some of the legal issues uh, relative to this matter. As the Chair referenced previously, the Commission did receive a request from Mass Gaming and Entertainment 
seeking a reconsideration of a previous licensing decision. Uh, upon receipt, the chair asked that the legal department take a look at whether that is an issue that the commission can properly consider. So we'll focus our remarks on that. The first question as we lay out here then is, can the commission reconsider or reopen a previous decision relative to the award of a gaming license? The obvious companion to that question is question number two on the first slide, which is if the commission can reconsider or reopen a previous decision, what are the appropriate grounds upon which to base such a decision? So let's jump right into the, the first question on the next slide. The threshold issue, as we mentioned, presently before the commission is whether the commission can reconsider or reopen a previous deci decision relative to the award of a gaming license. And let's be specific about what the previous decision was. Mass Gaming and Entertainment has requested the commission reconsider its August 11th, 2016 decision to deny its application uh, for a gaming license to construct a gaming establishment in Brockton, Massachusetts. Their request um, is in the packet uh, for anyone to take a look at, as is the, that 2016 uh, decision. It is important to note what they have not asked. So Mass Gaming and Entertainment has not and has never in the past appealed that decision uh, to a court or otherwise or in any way asserted that the matter was incorrectly decided as a matter of law or wasn't supported by the facts in the record. This is an important distinction as we walk through the, the present uh, consideration as there are certain timeline issues that come into uh, play. With appeals, there are typically hard and fast timelines uh, that would preclude review of certain matters if they were filed beyond the timelines. Whereas with reconsideration, there are different uh, indicators that we should uh, look at to determine whether it's okay to consider a past decision. So on the next slide, we get into the actual legal authority. This seems to be a, well, a fairly well-settled area of the law. And the established principle is outlined in the first bullet where we say, and there are a number of cases that talk about this in slightly different language, but essentially, in the absence of express or perceived statutory limitations, administrative agencies possess an inherent power to reconsider their decisions. That's exactly the situation we have before us. MG&E has asked you to reconsider a past decision. That being said, there are limitations on that power. And the power to reconsider must be sparingly used if administrative decisions are to have resolving force on which persons can rely. Meaning that obviously once a decision is made, you don't want to just uh, go around changing decisions that people have come to rely upon unless there's a good reason for it. So that is part of the, this principle, that you are allowed to reconsider a decision, but you should do so sparingly and thoughtfully. The exercise to uh, reopen or not to reopen rests in the sound discretion of the commission. And it's reviewable only for an abuse of discretion. So that's the outer limit as to uh, how far courts have said that agencies can go. You can't obviously abuse the discretion that you have. And we'll go through some of the principles that you'll want to consider in determining how far you are allowed to go. But all summed up, the courts have said that administrative agencies have broad discretion over procedural matters before them. And the courts will defer to an agency's procedural rulings and review them for error of law or abuse of discretion. The matter presently before you is such a procedural matter, and the jurisprudence tells us that the Mass Gaming Commission has broad discretion over this as to whether to reopen the matter or not to reopen the matter. It's always helpful to take a look at the specific legal authority when it comes to the Commission's discretion. And we've cited this often, and you're uh, likely very familiar with it, but it's helpful to bring up in context like this as well. The commission has been granted a very broad discretion itself by statute, and it's explicit. It starts in chapter 23K, section uh, one, paragraph 10, says that the power and authority 
granted to the Commission shall be construed as broadly as necessary for the implementation, administration, and enforcement of this chapter. So we add these principles on top of the already existing jurisprudence that the courts have said apply to reconsideration. It's also helpful in the next two bullet points we talk about uh, to look at the, the vast discretion that the Commission has when it comes to the award of a gaming license itself. And the statute talks about it in a number of places. We've cited a couple of here for your reference. And these are important principles to bear in mind when you are determining whether or not to reopen or reconsider this present matter. So the statute says that the commission shall have all powers necessary or convenient to carry out and effectuate its purposes, including but not limited to the power to develop criteria in addition to those outlined in this chapter to assess which applications for gaming licenses will provide the highest and best value to the Commonwealth and the region in which a gaming establishment is located. That language, particularly the language that uh, talks about the highest and best value to the Commonwealth and the region, conveys a very clear intent by the legislature to grant the Commission broad discretion to determine whether or not to award a gaming license. So essentially, you would have to satisfy yourself based upon all the evidence and the facts before you, that any applicant has uh, satisfied you that they will provide such value. The statute goes on and talks about it in one other place that's worthy of uh, taking a look at. It's section 19A where the statute talks about the award of the category one gaming license in particular. And it says that gaming licenses shall only be issued to applicants who are qualified under the criteria set forth in the chapter, this chapter as determined by the Commission. Within any region, if the Commission is not convinced that there is an applicant that has both met the eligibility criteria and provided convincing evidence that the applicant will provide value to the region in which the gaming establishment is proposed to be located and to the Commonwealth, then no gaming license shall be awarded in that region. Again, it's helpful to look at the language in this provision that talks about uh, that there, there has to be convincing evidence that the applicant will provide value to the region. That again indicates um, a desire by the, the legislature and the governor to provide a broad grant of discretion to the commission over the award of, of a gaming license. And that's what we have uh, before us here today. So let's, let's take a quick look at the outer limits of that. What does an abuse of discretion actually look like? What does it mean? Well, the language is fairly broad, and it, the court has said that when reviewing an agency's decision for an abuse of discretion, that the court will look to see whether the decision was reasonable. Now, most of the things we do, we hope, are reasonable, but generally that means that they have to be based upon the record and the facts before you. The court has offered some specific guidance, though, in the context of reconsideration or reopenings. Uh, as to what it may consider to be the hallmarks of a reasonable decision. And it said here in the second paragraph, while each agency's decision to reopen a proceeding must be considered in the specific context of the circumstances presented and the statutory scheme involved, factors generally to be weighed by the agency include the advantages of preserving finality, the desire for stability, the degree of haste or care in making the first decision, timeliness, and the specific equities involved. So the 2016 Gaming Commission decision relative to the application of MG&E should be reviewed in the context of these principles. It has been suggested at times that there is actually uh, a statute that may impose an impediment here, and that is Chapter 23K, Section 17G. The question is whether that imposes a barrier to your reconsideration at all. So let's recall one of the principles we talked about a few slides back, where we said that in the absence of express or perceived statutory limitations, administrative agencies possess an inherent power to reconsider their decisions. So the question is, in this context, what, if any, is the significance of Section 17G? Well, 17G itself says that the Commission shall have full discretion as to whether to issue a license. 
that applicants shall have no legal right or privilege to a gaming license and shall not be entitled to any further review if denied by the commission. The language that we want to look at closely here are, is the phrase further review. What does further review mean? Does that mean court review? Does it mean review by the commission? Or what exactly um, is this provision of the law getting at? And the question being, does it impose specifically an express or a perceived statutory limitation of the sort that would preclude on its face the commission from reconsidering the previous licensing decision as MG&E has requested? It's our position that it does not, that that's not what that statute was in designed to uh, preclude. The commission itself has never formally opined on this section. Uh, but it seems clear to us that Section 17G was intended to preclude judicial review uh, of the award or denial of a gaming license, and that it was not intended to prevent the Commission from reviewing its own decision as to whether to award such a license. Mr. Grossman, I, um, <clears throat> I don't want to interrupt the cadence of uh, your presentation, but it might be helpful if we do uh, address some questions along the way. Just to be clear, in the City of Revere matter, the SJC language doesn't, doesn't say address the issue of administrative review. It only addresses judicial review. And the language in the statute says further review and doesn't say judicial review. While I respect your position, would it be fair to also say it hasn't been resolved with exact clarity that this is restricted to s strictly judicial review? That's a very fair position to take and reasonable. Um, the opinion we offer is ours. It's based upon our understanding of Chapter 23K and I think supported by what the SJC said in that Revere decision that you've referenced. And though the court was not squarely addressing the statute in the context we're looking at it here today, it did offer some insight as to what the purpose of the statute was. And I think it is applicable to, uh, to our review. And we've added that language here for you and everyone to take a look at. But it's really the second piece of the quoted language that I think gets to the clear intent of that particular statute, where the court said, this is the, the second provision, that second, Section 17G reveals a clear legislative intent to sharply curtail judicial review of commission licensing decisions and thereby avoid the costs and delays of protracted litigation. It seems, so this, I, I think a provision like this is somewhat unique to include in any type of licensing scheme. I've never seen one like it. I'm not saying they don't exist anywhere, but I've never seen anything quite like it. It seemed that in the development of the gaming law, the uh, legislature and governor were well aware that some of these decisions could be contentious. And they wanted to ensure that the decisions didn't get held up in court such that these facilities could never get constructed. So they included this language in 17G. But it seems counter to the rest of the jurisprudence on reconsideration and reopening to apply that restriction to yourself. Uh, because of the broad discretion that's afforded. Because of the otherwise no. broad discretion. Understood. And as we'll get into, I think, on the next slide, there are certain situations where you would definitely want to reconsider a decision. And, and just to be clear, 17G is limited to just the licensing decision. That, yes, it and, says the, and uh, the license. And the Commonwealth has only given the opportunity to award three, four. Well, four, four in the end, three, and then the slots. So it really was a provision that was limited in scope just for our licensing decisions. I believe so. Yes. But in, the suggestion is that finality was um, important, but at this point, your position is it's, it really is addressing judicial review. That's my position. Yep. Yes. Thank you very much. Before we move on to the next slide, there was some discussion in the past about whether or not we would need regs if we were going to move forward and reconsider. 
Um, I, I take it from sort of the discussion in the papers that have been submitted to us thus far that there doesn't seem to be a lot of dispute that we do not need to do that if we choose to reconsider. I just want to clarify that before we go any further into what would entail, what would be entailed in a reconsideration. I don't think you would need regulations per se. You would certainly need to agree upon a procedure of some sorts. We of course have an RFA 2 procedure. I would expect that any review would be at least somewhat modeled on that. So we do have some infrastructure, though not uh, Let me directly. stop you. Maybe I didn't, uh, let me make myself clear in terms of just the process for reconsidering. Oh. Am I to take it from the presentation of both of the parties that we do not need any sort of regulations for that. Is that no, a fair I statement? No, I don't believe you need. This is just a procedural matter before the committee. There had been conversation about that earlier. I just wanted to make clear for the record. We're proceeding on the on that. No, I think this okay. is the procedure. This is how we well, should do it. I, I, I agree with that, and thanks for clarifying. It's also, it occurs to me that these decisions are so few that for us to, mm -hmm. you know, issue regs around it, you know, whether we have four or five because there was one reconsideration or not would really defeat the purpose in my opinion of the of the regulations you I know, agree I mean regulations I think to, to, to in my mind come for things that are going to be repeated over and over yeah I I, I think that uh, Commissioner O'Brien was addressing an earlier letter that was right. issued by the Commission raising that question and it sounds yep. as though we've moved on based on yep. probably the input from our our fellow uh, counselors. Thank you. Um, the only other, uh, uh, before we move on, you did mention that um, MG&E did not pursue an appeal through the judicial um, process and that there were limits. Can you remind me on how many, uh, what the time limit is for, for seeking judicial review on? Uh, sure. If it's a, a 30A decision, you typically have 30 days. Um, if it's a certiorari claim, what did we say it was? It would be 60 days. 60 days. 60 days. And that case indicated that the more appropriate review process is certiorari. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else want to interrupt like I did? I, I, I actually have a question later on, but I, which I think you already sort of alluded to, but I, okay. I would want to. Right, we'll, and we'll reserve our right to ask questions throughout right. without hopefully disturbing your cadence too much. So, No, it, it's helpful you. not to get caught up in a cadence, so okay, I, great. I appreciate Thank that. You. Um, the next slide we talk about the actual grounds for reconsideration, and these are taken from a variety of cases on the subject, uh, and through those cases we found that some of the examples of appropriate grounds for an administrative agency to reconsider a decision include things like, and this is not an exclusive or exhaustive list, to remedy a fraud or a mistake, to address changes in a regulation or a regulatory scheme. Uh, if governing decisional law has changed, there was one instance in which the Supreme Court actually changed a legal principle upon which a previous decision was based. and even a number of years later, uh, going back to review that decision was appropriate to ensure that it was in conformance with the new law. Um, if there's a change to the applicable on the ground facts, or finally, to prevent a miscarriage of justice. The one that seems most applicable to the present matter would be a change to the applicable on the ground facts. We'll certainly leave it to uh, MG&E to make that point. Uh, but of all of them, uh, there's been no assertion of any fraud or mistake or anything like that. Those are just some of the other reasons that you could review an administrative decision. And just to get back to the timelines and the 17G discussion, these are the reasons why you don't ever want to box an administrative agency in and say you can never reconsider a, a decision because you could find out, and there, this has happened, not in, in our world, but in the administrative law world where you find out even many years later that a decision was based on mistaken information or someone who perjured themselves or something of that nature. So you want to make sure that administrative agencies have the ability to go back and correct the, the, the error or the, the decision that was based on 
um, that faulty information was made. And there's a passage here at the end that I think sums that all up. This case comes from a sex offender registry board case, uh, which of course is uh, oftentimes largely based on witness testimony and expert testimony, and people get um, classified as sex offenders based upon this testimony. And the court said in an instance like that, if the evidence the board substantially relied on in reaching its final classification decision were subsequently demonstrated to be false, inaccurate, or utterly unreliable, the board would retain the discretion to exercise this inherent authority to reconsider, to prevent or mitigate a miscarriage of justice. So I think that's just an illustration as to why you don't want hard and fast time frames or, or things like that assigned to reconsideration. And as we'll see coming up, Timeliness and time frames are an important factor to consider, but should not be the sole consideration in making a decision like this. I, actually, I might stop you before we get into the timeliness because this ties into the question I had. Um, so uh, the grounds for re reconsideration, uh, if I could tie that slide back to two slides ago where you also talk about the factors and uh, specific context and circumstances presented for, uh, to be weighed for the reconsideration. Um, the gaming license is clearly one of the most consequential licenses that this commission has made or will, will make. Um, in your opinion, does the magnitude of the decision uh, factor into uh, whether um, something like this should be reconsidered? I think you should consider everything. That in and of itself would not be a deciding factor. You should not just say that this is such a big decision that we're never going to reconsider it because there should be, there might be other circumstances that would lead you, like fraud or mistake or, or a change in the law or some of the other things we just talked about. So it's certainly something to consider and that's what the court did say here, that your, a decision to reconsider must be considered uh, in the specific context of the circumstances. So I'd say that is a factor. Um, but you could also consider the level of scrutiny that went into the decision and how, whether a lot of research went into it and preparation and thoughtfulness and things like that. So yes, it is a consideration, but not a yeah, deciding. It, it clearly cuts both ways. I was just thinking theoretically uh, if, uh, if if given the different consequence or the consequential aspect of decisions, in your opinion, uh, uh, have the courts opined whether those would be another factor to, 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 to consider in reconsidering? For, for instance, if it, there's a change of law, I could imagine a change of law um, would it, the, the, the status of the legal landscape at the time we considered an application might have deterred other applicants from applying. So if you only go back and reconsider the initial applicant or applicants and not think about those who may have been deterred from applying because of the legal landscape and then the legal landscape changes, that alone shouldn't be enough to just consider, reconsider the initial applicants, should it? it you know, and when it, in other words, factors that we'll, we'll never know, which may have led to a, a different bidding process. Uh, well, I think the answer is that any one factor could be outcome determinative, depending upon what it is and how right. clear it is. Um, and that's really up to the commission as to whether the circumstances are different from the way they were back when the decision was made. As a general matter though, I would say you want to look at these things holistically and decide based upon a number of factors what the reasonable outcome here should be. But certainly the complexities of the decision um, present a bunch of unknowns at the time the decision was made in the application. I, I think you may be alluding to uh, the, the competitive environment, uh, uh, exactly. you know, which, um, which was complicated and had multi-factors at the time, which may be changing. I think, if anything, that 
falls under the category of the, the underground facts uh, over there in the fifth, uh, uh, fifth bullet, um, which again, is one of the factors that we should, we should take into account. We can move on to slide nine, which addresses the timeliness issue. Uh, question that's been raised as to whether there's an express timeline uh, to exercise your inherent authority here. I think we've already really covered that, but our uh, position is that there is not. Um, this is distinct from an appeal where there is typically a uh, hard and fast timeline. But that being said, timing is a factor to be considered, and administrative de agency decisions, as we talked about, um, may be reviewed for an abuse of discretion. Uh, and as we said, for example, the 30A appeals typically have a 30-day deadline. So there are circumstances where there are hard and fast uh, deadlines. But this St. Paul uh, Fire and Marine Insurance case was just one example where a court actually did find that an administrative agency had abused its discretion based upon the timeliness issue. Um, and this case involved uh, cancellation of an insurance policy. It was a little bit complicated. Um, and there was an administrative agency decision where the, uh, the holder of the policy had appealed. They were denied. Shortly thereafter that the final decision was made, they learned that there had been a fraud involved um, that caused the cancellation of the policy. But they never, the, the policyholder never took any steps to ask for reconsideration then. They waited about five years later where there had been criminal charges and other circumstances uh, that arose. And the actual, the DIA did reopen the case. The uh, insurance company appealed, arguing that they waited too long. And the court said, yes, you waited too long. You knew about this five years ago. You should have raised it then. You should have sought reconsideration then. And so that's where the finality and the timeliness and all those types of issues uh, come into play. So there is a limit to reconsideration. Uh, and this is a, a good example of that. Um, the court has said, and we just added this here at the end, that if this would not be the time to do it necessarily. But if you wanted to prescribe some kind of time limit, which I don't think would necessarily be advisable because there are so many different circumstances that it could arise, that you could, by regulation, set a time limit on any reconsiderations of different decisions. Um, but we don't have one at the moment, uh, certainly, so that doesn't uh, come into play here. And so that's the, uh, the end of our presentation. We're happy, of course, to take any questions, or we can stand by as we go through. Because we could return to you we for further have. clarification. Yes. You're not going anywhere. We'll be here. Not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> any questions, Commissioner Stebbins? For Nope. Or Catherine. I mean, what's that? Thank you. Thank you. So I understand that MG and E is represented by counsel, Goodwin Proctor. I'd love for you to identify yourselves for our record and you know that you are um, on being streamed. So we would love for you uh, to be able to speak clearly into the microphone so that everybody at home can hear you as Are well. Are you suggesting that we should get a comb before yeah. we begin? Yeah. Uh, do you need a little break? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Madam Please Chair. proceed. Thank you. Th thank you. Ma Madam Chair and Commissioners, um, David Appel with me is Roberto Braceros, my partner uh, from Goodwin Proctor on behalf of MG&E and, &E, and on behalf of uh, Rush Street, the corporate parent of MG&E. &E, and uh, Neil Bloom, who's sitting w with us here, who yes. is the founder of Rush Street and the uh, co-owner of Rush Street and really the driving force behind Rush Street and behind this project. Um, so there's a, it, there, there's a slogan in the, in the law that if, um, if you agree with everything that the other side says, <laughs> uh, you really should just not open your mouth and sit down. Um, <laughs> But being a lawyer. Do you want to take that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should ask your client. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, incli I'm inclined to do that. Being a lawyer, I think I'm constitutionally incapable of, of doing that. So um, 
why don't we start with the quickly with the narrow legal question as framed by the as framed by the uh, by Mr. Grossman and, and Ms. Blue and the Commission staff um, and as applied to this matter can the Commission reconsider MG&E's application for a gaming license and uh, the answer is an unequivocal yes uh, we are we really are a hundred percent in agreement with everything Mr. Grossman said on the subject and we're not going to belabor that I think there's no no dispute here that the on the very narrow legal question that the Commission does have discretion the only dispute that has arisen is an 11th hour dispute in a, in a letter that was submitted on behalf of the, the NOTOS group, um, which we received, um, I think, the, on Tuesday, af Tuesday afternoon, and I believe as part of the Commission's packet, where they take the position, um, or a lawyer on behalf of the NOTOS group takes the position that, um, th that, the, uh, that the, the gaming law, specifically Chapter 23K, 17G, which Mr. Grossman talked about, uh, acts as a preclusion of some sort on the Commission's ability, discretion to reconsider. Um, what the notice group does not do, however, in their letter is that they cite to 17G, but conveniently leave out the first sentence of 17G. And the first sentence of 17G makes it clear that, quote, the Commission shall have full discretion as to whether whether to issue a, a license. They focus on the second part and the, 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 the language concerning further review and interpret that to mean that further review means that you yourselves cannot further review. But as Mr. Grossman pointed out, the SJC, I think, has clearly stated in the City of, Re City of Revere versus Mass Gaming Commission case that further review specifically within the meaning of 17G means and is limited to judicial review and doesn't in any way affect the broad discretion that is given to the commission by virtue of the first sentence in 17G. Uh, the notice group does not cite that binding authority from the SJC. So what we have here is on one side of the ledger we have, we have ourselves, we have the commission staff, we have seven justices of the SJC, and we have the law all saying you have discretion to reconsider. And on the other side, we have a, what, what frankly is a self-interested party, uh, ignoring the law and taking a different position. I don't think this is really a close call. Um, the, the next Could issue. You just read the first sentence to me in its entirety, please. Uh, the commission shall have full discretion as to whether to issue a license. Right, so that's issuing a license. That's issuing a license, but there's no time limit on that. There's no, it's, it's full discretion with regard to issuing a license and changing and then, your mind in the process or thinking about it again or, as we're suggesting, reconsidering an earlier decision. So yeah, I don't think it's debated uh, that when the application was before the commission that there was full discretion to, to whether or not to grant or deny. And then the next sentence is? The, ne the next sentence is, quote, applicants shall have no legal right or privilege to a gaming license and shall not be entitled to any further review if denied by the commission. If denied, right. If denied. Yeah. And so, so the it's question really is around the, the SJC has determined further review, at least with respect to judicial review, means that they, they are interpreting it as judicial review is precluded. But of course, they're allowing certiorari in terms of equities, correct? Uh, that's, that's conceivable. And they've yeah. left open that possibility. But they've made it clear that they are, they recognize that the legislature has given broad discretion to the commission and they're not going to interfere with that broad discretion so long as it's exercised in, so long as the discretion is not abused, so long as it's exercised in a reasonable fashion. Um, and there's nothing to suggest that reconsideration under these circumstances would be anything but reason, which I think gets us to uh, the next issue, which is the appropriate grounds for reconsideration, which is the second question as framed by uh, by Ms. Blue and Mr. Grossman, 
what are the appropriate grounds upon which to base a decision to, re to reconsider? And again, here we agree with the staff. You know, as the staff made it clear, Mr. Grossman made it clear in his presentation, there are, there are really many grounds on which to reconsider. And I think some of those grounds, a non-exclusive list, is on slide eight of the commission's of the commission's present of the commission staff's presentation, and one of those one of those many grounds is changed factual circumstances. Um, the, the 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 right to reconsider the grounds for reconsideration are expressly under the case law not limited to as the notice group again would suggest. Mitigating, mitigating a miscarriage of, trust, of justice. Again, it's the, the, te the touchstone here, the test here is what is reasonable? Is what, what is it, when is it reasonable for the, for the commission to reconsider? Here, you know, at least for today's purposes, we're certainly not gonna argue that there was a miscarriage of justice in the, in the original decision. Um, I think it could conceivably be argued, but that's not our point, certainly not here today. Here, our focus is on changed circumstances, which justify reconsideration, and the reasonableness of reconsideration under the circumstances. So let's turn to changed circumstances. Um, and we, we'd, like the, we'd like the commission to focus on three changed circumstances that have occurred between the denial decision that was made by the commission by a vote on April 28th of 2016 and then formalized, as Mr. Grossman indicated, in a written decision that was issued, I believe, on August 11th of, of 2016. And what has changed since then? And we're gonna focus on three changes, the first being uh, a change with regard to the status of the Mashpee Wampanoag. Um, and it's our position that the, the Mashpee have gone from a position where as of April of 2016, when the commission considered MG&E's petition, uh, initial petition, initial application, uh, they had land and trust status, they had broken ground, they were they, they were on their way to building a, a casino in Taunton. Uh, things have changed dramatically to the point where they really have no realistic chance of ever building a casino in Region City. And we're not gonna you know, debate whether or not, that, that's our view, but I think that, that is the natural inference from the facts that's of what's happened since April of 2016. Now we know that you know, some some commissioners um, may disagree with us as to how big a role uh, the Mashpee played in the decision to deny MG&E's application. Um, and we recognize that the commission has concerns separate and apart from the Mashpee. They had concerns with MG&E's design. They had concerns with other aspects of the proposal, which we're prepared to respond to. Uh, but I think there really can be no question that the Mashpee and the Mashpee status as of that time was a was a factor. Can I can I stop you for a moment? Factor. Sure. Is it your position that any change in circumstance on the ground would then allow someone moving for reconsideration to put additional evidence in on any other topic? So there were multiple reasons in this case that the application was denied in 2016. Is it your position that? a change in factual circumstances related to the Wampanoag would then allow you to present in front of us it's any other change in circumstance that you wanted to put in? Yeah, I, I, think, there's a, I think there's a materiality test, you know, and that the, the, the change in circumstances have to be important changes in circumstances that really uh, affect the decision or affect the people who would ultimately be affected by the decision. So it's you know, and obviously the commission in making the determination as to whether or not to reconsider, that's not reconsideration in and of itself. That shows the decision whether or not they're gonna re whether or not they're gonna reconsider. And to take into account material change circumstances, important change circumstances, I think is 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 valid. 
So are your change in circumstances the Wampanoag status, or is it beyond that? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, be, it's beyond that. I mean, we had, that's, that's the first of the change circumstances. And the, you know, I, but I, what I think is important here is to focus on the fact that you have to remember the context in which the denial was made. And when I say that the Wampanoag played a role in that denial, or their status at the time played a role, and we believe a crucial role, but we don't have to debate that right now. Well, it's but if you're changing circumstances, the Wampanoags, is there something in the vote or the public record or the oh, decision sure. that you want to point to that says, I am saying that this is part of why you should reconsider? Oh, uh, sure. There, uh, on, the, on the very day that the commission denied um, MG&E's application by a four to one vote, uh, then, then Chair Crosby um, noted quote, that the 800-pound elephant in the room, close quote, is the Mashpee Wampanoag and the status of the Mashpee Wampanoag. I mean, the Mashpee Wampanoag had appeared before the commission um, on March 15th of 2016. They had broken ground on April 5th of 2016. And this commission's consideration of MG&E's application occurred in late April and the denial was just a little over, a shade over three weeks after the Mashpee had broken ground. There were express discussion about saturation issues, concerns about saturation, and all of that has disappeared. And I would suggest that's a, you know, that's a, a humongous change in circumstances. Um, what leads us to the conclusion that the Mashpee really don't have a realistic chance are you know, facts, some of which, not all of which, but some of which we've outlined on slide, on slide three. And these are just facts. You know, these are undeniable, can't be disputed, that shortly after the Mashpee broke ground, uh, Federal Judge Young, here in the Federal Court in Boston, um, reversed the earlier decision of Interior and noted that the, the decision that they'd made to give land and trust status to the, to the Mashpee was clearly wrong. And he said, quote, with respect to the Department of Interior, this is not a close call, close, close quote. Uh, he remanded for uh, additional consideration by the Department of the Interior. And the Department of the Interior, in September of this past year, came out with an unequivocal position uh, rejecting an alternative ground that the Mashpee had presented for land and trust status. Uh, the Mashpee are appealing that in the courts. As you all know, it's very difficult to, to, to reverse a decision by, a, you know, by, by, by any administrative agency. And here, the Mashpee candidly acknowledged in a filing in federal court here in Boston just a little over a week ago um, that that its current challenge to DOI's 2018 decision, quote, could possibly require additional years of litigation, close quote. And I think that's an optimistic statement, if any. Uh, the Mashpee also owe their casino partner, the Genting Corporation from Malaysia, uh, in excess at this point of $440 million, which uh, Genting is prepared to write off and has stated in its in its books that it's, it's going to write off. Um, and it has been widely reported that there is an ongoing extensive federal grand jury investigation into the financial workings uh, of the Mashpee, uh, which has also caused a, or, or, or led to uh, a recall election for the Mashpee chairman, uh, Cedric Cromwell, which is scheduled to take place uh, later, this, later this week. So all of those facts, which again are undeniable, suggest that the situation that existed when this commission made its decision with that 800 pound elephant in the room uh, have changed dramatically. And that 800 pound elephant has shrunk to the point of disappearance. Is there Can a pending I? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, so just, just on that. Um, uh, if you're saying that was a big factor in, in, in the decision um, of, of the commission at the time, 
that 800 pound um, uh, gorilla. Could that have also, and we were, we were conducting a competitive procurement effectively uh, and soliciting uh, you know, anybody who would be interested. Uh, there was at least one other uh, proponent before that never got to us uh, in New Bedford uh, who was not able to put together a, a proposal. Uh, but be that, you know, that aside, uh, could that have been a factor uh, that prevented other applicants from uh, coming before us to make that decision? I, I think theoretically it could, it could have been, um, although all those other applicants, I believe, dropped out for express reasons uh, having to do with their own financial circumstances that really had nothing to do with the, with the, with the MASH rule. As expressed as, as expressed at the time, and I think you're referring to KG Urban and, and and others who had dropped out earlier, or or anyone else for or, that matter, or those that you may not even have known of could have right. just made a business decision based on the legal landscape at the time, as you put it, the breaking of ground. There could have been somebody who, stood running their numbers and said, with this factor doesn't make sense. And could, that's could have, theoretically. I don't think, it, you know, empirically that's what occurred. You don't have that evidence, but we will never know. Well, I think KG Urban, I, I think, submitted a letter to the commission, which they explained either in the letter or right. in public comments that they were unable to get financing, uh, which was <clears> one <throat> of the main reasons, if not the uh, exclusive reason, why they abandoned yep. their, their application. I think my point is that we'll never know if there was someone, and I, you know, I'm not being naive because I suspect that folks like you, Mr. Bloom, would know of your competitors, but I'm just, we really will never know if some other um, enterprise made a decision not to even whisper about being an applicant in light of the fact that there was breaking of ground. Well, it's interesting. We have the benefit of time, and we also have the benefit now of, um, of public comments that were solicited by the commission at the end of last year, uh, where it's been widely reported. Some of these changed facts regarding the MASH bill have been widely reported. And to the extent that anyone was interested or wanted to participate in a bidding process in Region, region C, there have been ample opportunities expressly in the context of the public comments to raise their hand and say they had such an interest, but we've heard nothing. You know, well, that, but that's, that, far, that's far different than actually having an open process with no other bidders, would you say? Would you agree with that? Um, an official RFR. An official RFR compared to open yeah. comment period. As, as a legal matter, but I don't think as a practical matter it is. But I mean, we have a statutory so framework that we have to follow in terms of if we go and issue well, any some, of these licenses, correct? Some of the competitors are in this room right now. And even people who aren't competing for a Regency license have submitted letters, such as the NOTOS group. I'm just asking on the question of law, that is not, asking for public comment is not the equivalent of determining an open bid and whether oh, there are other bidders. As a matter of law, well, that's, that, that's certainly true. But you know, there, there was a public process. There were five initial applicants. Three dropped out very quickly. KJ Urban, KG Urban dropped out a bit later. And all I'm suggesting is that there have been, there's been opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for others to at least suggest to the commission that they may be interested. And the only thing we've heard is recently from the NOTOS group, which is not interested in competing. You know, they're not interested in competing for a Category 1 license. I mean, they've made clear that they, they, they want to, they're prepared to make an investment of around $300 million for a slots parlor and a horse race track that would require a change in the law. They, do, they don't want to compete for a Category 1 license. They want to change the, the rules in the middle of the game to suit their interests. And they're, frankly, the only ones who've suggested anything in all this time, even though you know, there have been opportunities, again, many, many opportunities for people to say, uh, we're, we're interested, you know, now that the Mashpee are no longer a viable candidate. So in any event, the, just to quickly move. Just to add Go ahead. Yeah. on the change circumstances, I, and I'm not sure if it's in the notice letter or if I've just probably read it in the press, but I believe there's legislation pending too and uh, to perhaps recognize the tribe 
as uh, officially in a way that it would bypass the the DOI. Um, uh, there, there DOI is there is legislate there is legislation that you know that the Mashpee has been pushing in Congress. Uh, it's gone nowhere in it's gone nowhere in Congress. Uh, we we think that the chance of that legislation going anywhere is somewhere between zero and none. Even, you know, certainly in the Trump administration, um, even with a change in administration, uh, there is clear bipartisan opposition to that bill in the Senate, uh, which is not going to change even if Democrats take control of the Senate. Uh, so we think that, you know, the chance of that bill proceeding or making headway are close to zero. And even if it does somehow miraculously get through Congress, I think that there are very serious mm -hmm. constitutional concerns having to do with separation of powers uh, with respect to the introduction of that bill in the context of Judge Young's decision. You know, it really is an effort explicitly to overrule a, a decision by a federal judge in, an, in, in what is a final decision in an ongoing judicial matter. So I think that it, you know, even if they somehow, some way, years from now, got a bill through Congress, that would lead to additional years of, of litigation, if anything. Uh, and certainly would not be good for Brockton or for anyone else in southeastern Massachusetts or for the Commonwealth uh, as a whole. Mr. Bloom, did you want to say something? I heard you. Yes, I wanted to clarify uh, c in case there's any confusion. The other parties who were bidding and considered bidding uh, were all doing this uh, before the decision came out of the Department of Interior a few months before your meeting on a final decision. Uh, so that uh, it wasn't that they were uh, dissuaded by a decision that, that the land was going to be in trust. The land was not put in trust. The Department of Interior had spent, I think, something like four years and had been unable to make any decision in this matter. It was only a few months before your final de your decision that the Department of Interior ruled uh, that the land should go in trust. And the other parties who were bidding, potentially, dropped out before that decision. Um, just the last two, last two points, then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Braceres. Uh, other changed circumstances, which we mm -hmm. also regard as material changed circumstances here, is that in the, in the time between the denial and today, a, uh, a casino has opened across the Massachusetts border in Tiverton, Rhode Island, the Twin Rivers Casino. And as a result of the opening of that casino, uh, tens of millions of dollars in gaming revenue that would otherwise be coming to Massachusetts are now going to Rhode Island. Uh, also, you know, since this decision, both MGM has opened and Encore have opened, and we would suggest that as a result, Region C, which is arguably, and I think probably empirically, the neediest region in, in the state, has uh, been left further behind. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Perseros. Uh Thank you, uh, commissioners. And taking Commissioner O'Brien's um, instruction to, to heart, I'm going to speed through many of these slides and skip over many of the slides which uh, the, commissioner, the commissioners believe aren't relevant to today. I think that was slide six on. But um, talking about Region C, where Mr. Apfel left out, I think a good place to start is um, Madam Chair, at the start, talked about the grounds to exercise this broad discretion. There's great agreement that there's broad discretion, so let's talk about the grounds to exercise that. And the Commission's mission statement specifically says that the Commission is to strive to the greatest possible economic, to provide the greatest possible economic development benefits and revenues to the people of the Commonwealth. And what this means to Regency in Brockton, and Brockton is one of the few majority-minority cities in this state. And 
for years, Southeast Massachusetts has felt that they're the region left behind. Springfield has the MGM brand. Worcester has announced that you know, the Red Sox are moving the AAA team there. There's a lot of investment in Worcester from the colleges there. Boston gets the encore, and Region C is just left behind. And Brockton needs this. And Mayor Rodriguez, who came up here, he, he would invite you know, some opportunity to address the commission, uh, either now or at the end. Mr. Bloom, uh, with me and without me, has visited with Mayor Rodriguez and before that with Mayor Carpenter on multiple occasions. This is really a partnership. And when you talk to Mayor Rodriguez and his chief planner, um, Rob May, you know, they emphasize jobs, jobs, jobs. And as this slide talks, there would be 2,000 construction jobs, 1,800 permanent jobs for Brockton. This is a city that needs a new high school, one of the largest high schools east of the Mississippi. It needs a new high school. We're talking about um, you know, what, what would this mean is that we did a new report that we just submitted, an innovations report, economic study, that even with the new circumstances on the ground, the Twin River Casino, the MGM, the Encore, that this would provide $55 million in net additional tax revenues to the state annually, every year. That takes into consideration um, cannibalization. We have other studies as well. I know that we've talked with staff before about this. And this is one of those things that Mr. Bloom is looking to put as much as $700 million of his own money into this. You know he wants to get the studies right. And he believes in this. And he believes in this, obviously, for himself, but also for the city of Brockton. Now, um, we also talk about every year this would return $100 million in revenue annually from Rhode Island and Connecticut. This is money that we're losing every year to the casinos. And you know, it's in part one of the reasons why there's this bipartisan um, um, opposition to the Mashpee, because the senators, the Democratic senators in Rhode Island, are strongly opposed to any bill there. So um, you know, the last point is we talk about the re revitalization of Brockton and just how much that would mean. And on slide five, uh, Commissioner McDonald, uh, Superior Court Judge McDonald, he voted in favor of the application. It was a four to one decision. He was the lone uh, vote in favor. And what's notable is he wanted to support and grant the license even with the prospect of the Mashpee Casino just, I think it's 15 miles down the highway in Taunton. Despite that possibility of the Mashpee Casino, he still favored it. And I think his words um, you know, bear repeating here. So we've got a city of Brockton that desperately needs economic development, workforce development, and the infusion of capital in order to serve its citizens. And then we have in the form of Rush Street, a private party, not a government entity, a private party that is committed to invest almost $700 million into the community with a proven track record in three other urban areas. So I go back to the question, let's look at what a no vote means. A no vote means Brockton, we're sorry, you can't have it. Now, um, again, I invite the commission at the end of these remarks to, to hear from Mayor Rodriguez himself, because he'll tell you just how much this means for Brockton, but all of Southeast Massachusetts, and how they will take this to rebuild a school and have jobs. Now, I take Commissioner O'Brien's uh, suggestion to heart, and we'll skip over these slides. But I think it bears worth mentioning that Neil Bloom was a fundamental partner behind the Faneuil Hall project, behind the Copley Place project. Um, you could see these before and afters in hugely successful other developments, Niagara Falls, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Um, and we have, for the commission, just the dramatic success of these projects. This one is in Illinois. This one in Schenectady. You see the before and after of what the casino could look like in Worcester. Talk about Brockton. This is what it currently looks like. This is the fairgrounds in Brockton. 
This is notable is that the only other issue before the MASHP, and frankly, we all believe the MASHP were, as Chairman Crosby said, the 800 pound gorilla, 800 pound elephant in the room. There were comments about, well, I don't love the design. This was the design. Um, I think it looks okay, but there were comments that it didn't have this wow factor. Now, that was the only other real criticism here, and we, and that the location on the site. We have listened to that. We have met with the city planner, Rob May, and Mayor Rodriguez. We have presented this on their recommendations. This is what they want. They want something higher that can be seen from Route 24. The, the restaurants are moved closer to Belmont Street. The restaurants are accessible so that people can generate street traffic. And again, Uh, Mr. Sarah, so I'd like to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate the fact that you do want to move ahead on these slides. As a matter of straight and strict fairness, and Mayor Rodriguez, please mm -hmm. know that I say this with great respect. How do I reconcile the fact that my fellow commissioners in 2016 made a decision that did, it did deny awarding the application that you've now come before us to ask for reconsideration. How do I reconcile on a fairness factor that, that you would like to move ahead not only perhaps on reconsideration of the application that was before them in 2016, but now perhaps even an enhanced application where we haven't afforded a competitor who may right now have been spending a great deal of resources to assess their market in another community that's perhaps equally needy or equally well sighted. And they've in, been investing in their back rooms and in, in doing the numbers and perhaps hiring their own consultants and a mayor or an elected official who would also like to be here to be able to make a case for their application. How, as a matter of equity, the same equities that Judge Botsford weighed in her case, how do we reconcile that with respect to a reconsideration so, of, a, of a denied application? So, Madam Chair, I understand and you know, it's a good question, but I guess what I'd say is we are here, as you said, simply for the decision of whether we have the authority to um, to reconsider. We think that that's, you know, that's agreed upon with the parties. Um, perhaps in subsequent uh, hearings, we will discuss that question and set that question up. I think we believe very strongly that there are no such other competitors out there. There was a year ago, and we've been at this now for more than a year, we submitted our first letter in June of last year. And part of the process that the commission has set up has been, um, let's have a comment period. And we got comments. We got comments from Plain Ridge Casino. We got comments uh, from, from others. But there is no other competitor. And as you said, it's a relatively small market. We know who they are. And there are no others here. The Nodos group certainly knew how to chime in, even though they're not seeking a Regency license. And I think what you'll hear from the State House, from the legislature, is they don't want to amend the bill. And the inaction in Region C has really left open for um, other people, like the Nodos group, to look for something in Wareham that isn't Region C, to seek changes in the legislation, for Plain Ridge to try to seek a change in the legislation. There's this the vacuum there. And so it's in a way, it's putting form over substance, because in practice, everyone knows it's out there. But that is something, you know, there could be another comment period, you know, for the next meeting to see, you know, you know, if there are any other competitors. And in fact, Chairman Crosby actually, uh, uh, I think it was the meeting before he resigned, even suggested, because I think he saw that the delay in Region C, and, you know, we would you know, perhaps, you know, go back and look at that transcript because he saw and acknowledged the problems with the delay in Regency. And he recognized <clears> that. And I think to be clear, uh, we did have a little bit of work 
to be done earlier after my appointment but we did acknowledge right away that your motion for reconsideration and are here today in light of that so you've prompted the discussion and 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 we you know thank you for that and whether or not you know I can't speak for my fellow commissioners how Regency would have um, the discussions would have resumed but I suspect that no one here is forgetting about the you know Regency so but I am I am struck by something that Mr. Grossman you know brought to our attention is that we do have a statutory obligation to think about the highest and best value for the Commonwealth and if we were to proceed on one course with you and not do a competitive bid how can I personally as it one of four here one of five ultimately know that we we've, we've gotten that so I, I think the question is you know here we're talking you know what are what are the alternatives is that there's no other there's no other competitive bid out there they would have raised their hand they would have submitted a comment right so in a way it's a false option and you if you reopen it we're talking about another three years and by that time that's three more years of Tiverton and Twin River just you know eating into it. now we're not asking for the license today mm -hmm. and this is obviously a very public proceeding and if there's anyone else out there with more than half a billion dollars of investment that's interested in this they'll be monitoring it there are competitors in this hearing room monitoring this this is not a s secret so in a way this abstract theoretical possibility of another bidder is actually going to cost the state you know hundreds of millions of dollars it would lose 55 million dollars a year just in tax revenue just for the theoretical abstract you know possibility that there's somebody else out there there isn't that's the and if there is they have an opportunity to raise their hand and we see that with Plain Ridge trying to get a change in legislation Nodos group trying to get a change in legislation this vacuum in region C to extend it remains is just going to cause further clamoring for the legislature to act so you know this your, your question brings us to you know, really what is our penultimate slide um, you know what are the options here you know do nothing and I don't think anyone would suggest that's an option you know, further market research I mean candidly we can revisit the decision and grant the um, motion to reconsider and have time to do that we can do and, and we expect the market research to continue we have done three different studies um, a very recent study we just submitted and those studies take into account Encore they take into account the growth of Twin River and Tiverton and MGM which is really the completely you know not in the market um, they take all those things into consideration and and believe me Mr. Bloom um, as much as he wants to help Brockton he's not going to get into something where there's market problems and he's every development he's done has been a smashing success so um, this is a place where in a way we can trust the market forces you know waiting for the Mashpees that's just not going to happen that's you know that's completely ruled out unrealistic just not going to happen uh, you know change in the current gaming legislation I mean that's you know you know further delay could invite that and we've heard that from legislators who want to expand Regency change Regency as long as it's a vacuum um, and the last bullet is really what we're talking about a new competitive process and that again for it, I, I think we're sort of inviting that we've been inviting that the last year this is a very public thing we had public comment we got hundreds of submissions a lot of them were repeat submissions of course but we got submissions from market participants right and so you know in a way this has been a de facto competitive process informal competitive process we see the Nodos group we see Plain Ridge wanting more we now hear Worcester is looking to expand Regency so I think de facto informal competitive process has actually been going on and it would just put form over substance to say oh you know we're not going to exercise the discretion because there might be sometime down the road 
another competitor. Um, but again, we don't have to decide that today. Today, it's just whether we have the authority to do it, and it seems like we're in agreement here. Um, well, and then there's the second question, should we proceed? And should we, should we proceed? And we believe that you should proceed. Um, if the commission wants to receive further comment on that, then we would, you know, we could present further on that next month. Um, there, there are options to, you know, I, I do think it's a false alternative to look for other market participants, but the commission could be creative in a way to do that while moving forward with, with mass gaming, right? This is, there's, it's a long road to gr actually granting the license. We can keep moving forward, and to the extent that there are, you know, you know new competitors, there's another change in circumstance, and a realistic market participant, you know, wants to jump in. Well, there's, you know, that's going to happen before you ultimately grant a, a license here in any regard. There's, there's, you're not running the risk of granting a license tomorrow. I mean, if you were, we, we'd accept it. But um, you're not running a risk of granting a license tomorrow, and then two weeks from now, you know, a big corporation says, oh, we want it in. Um, all those big corporations know about this. And frankly, um, you know, the time that this process will take as we move forward, they'll have plenty of opportunity to jump in. Um, you know, we, we, we talked about all of this, it, it, and these are some of the things that Mass gaming has already achieved, you know, it, and, and in short, it has all the host community agreements. It was found suitable already. It was found suitable. And, you know, I think the bottom line on this is that Brockton wants it. And with the host agreements, the, the nearby community. And when was the host um, agreement put in place? That <coughs> yeah, it was date? back in back in 16. But they, they the have all. The vote was in 2016 as well. But when was the vote? We actually entered into it before, way before the, before the final hearing. And I should t say, if you look at that list of things that we have done, it will take years for a new person. They have to find a site. They, they have to uh, have a referendum. They have to, we entered into community agreements with all of the communities around there. Um, we did traffic studies economic impact studies and, and, and just meeting it's interesting because you meet with mayor rodriguez and his city planner and they, they know a whole of real estate in southeast massachusetts so there was even another parcel i mean th there aren't many parcels of this size that you could say oh you know maybe another city or another company will come up they're just not that many and in fact mayor rodriguez and uh, you know and, and and the city planner may actually referenced a large piece of property that has already been developed and say, you know, what are the other possible options? They're just not there, right? So again, it, it's, it's a false hypothetical abstract, but even if you're, you know, to protect against that, there's nothing stopping them from raising their hand and jumping in. They, they won't, we know they won't. There's not the land um, available like this near a highway that would be suitable. Um, and then uh, that's, you know, in closing, I know Mr. Bloom would just like to address the commission. In closing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, just to add one other factor here. Uh, there have been some uh, cities further south, okay, that have looked at this. And the economics don't work for them uh, because they're don't have the population as you go further south towards the water. And that's where the other competitors dropped out. And uh, this site is a terrific site in Brockton. It's really just a few minutes right off of the expressway. Uh, Route 24. And, and that's what makes this a, uh, a viable uh, project. But in all of these discussions, uh, we, we haven't really talked about a Brockton, which is so desperately in need, and I think that's a relevant consideration in this entire discussion. I've been working on this project for five, over five years. Um, this is an incredible opportunity for Brockton, who has 
such a need for jobs, economic development, and additional revenue. Uh, I, I wouldn't under, be undertaking this project if I thought I was going to have an economic uh, unsuccessful project. Uh, we're going to invest, as you know, about $700 million, of which uh, I personally going to be putting up $100 million plus. Uh, we have a partner who would be doing the same. Uh, I wouldn't let this go bad uh, for our reputation. I've never had a casino project that hasn't been successful. Uh, and as much as I want to do this for Brockton, I would not, I would not undertake it if I thought it wasn't going to work out. So we have gotten a variety of studies in terms of the uh, uh, viability. And we just got a recent one to take into consideration all of the factors that have occurred uh, s over the last few years. And we got it and have delivered it to you from the innovation group, which was just completed, I think, w within the last week. And their conclusion is that we get $351 million of annual gaming revenue. Uh, plus 55 million net uh, additional gaming taxes to the Commonwealth. And of that 351 million, 126 million comes from uh, Massachusetts rev uh, residents who are gambling uh, in Rhode Island and elsewhere. Um, and will get additional new uh, revenue from out of state parties. Uh, we also uh, got two other studies. They weren't full studies, but they gave us revenue ep estimates. They were commissioned by our partner, uh, and they were very close to the study that you have. Uh, a one group, GMA, was less than 5% less revenue, and the other group uh, was uh, uh, roughly almost 10% 10, 10 more than the 350. So you've got two other uh, groups have come up with numbers very close to the 350. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're convinced that this will be a reasonably successful project. And uh, I was here during all of the discussions uh, when the decision was made after this land had been put in trust. And really, the biggest concern uh, from everybody was the fact that should the Commonwealth have two casinos in Region C, if there was a real ch chance that the uh, uh, Indian tribe would have a casino and it was now in trust and that they just started construction. Um, that was a ma massive factor in the decision. Uh, we were not asked to make changes in our proposal it was mentioned at the final hearing, but we've made changes uh, that would make this a better project. We're happy to do that. We've discussed that with the city, uh, and it has a lot more wow factor. Uh, but I take great pride in redeveloping projects in distressed areas. I've done it before. I fe really feel good about it. Naturally, we want to make a profit, but we want to do something that's helpful for the state and the community. You could call all the mayors and other representatives of the cities we've done this, and they'd all tell you we did exactly what we were asked for and more. Uh, what Brockton gets out of this is huge, huge benefits. They get about $6 million of upfront uh, money, plus significant, as much as $10 million in traffic mitigation. We pay them a minimum of $10 million every year. Uh, they get 3,500 direct and indirect jobs, 1,800 direct. We give a preference to uh, Brockton re uh, residents for jobs, and to the extent they're not filled by Brockton, we uh, have agreed with all the surrounding communities to give them uh, a benefit. Uh, as far as same arrangements for local vendors, give them opportunities. Um, and the bottom line is, I've got to say this uh, honestly to you all, all right. If I don't get to build this, this is not going to change my life. I, 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 was, I was a poor kid. I got a good education. I was raised by a single mother. Um, I got lucky. Uh, I was a partner at a big law firm. I didn't have a dime to my name and started a real estate company. 
and This Is America turned out to be a great success. This won't change my life. But uh, you will have taken away a once in a lifetime opportunity for Brockton. And I urge all of you to go to Brockton and see what's going on there and the need for this project. It's 100,000 100, people. Uh, they have the biggest uh, uh, high school uh, uh, in New England that is in desperate need. Um, it's a minority majority city. Their unemployment rate is higher. There's a potential if we do this that the residential uh, market there would change and people could take the train into, Brock, into Boston where housing is so much cheaper there that you can't believe it. So I've got my heart in doing this for Brockton. I've hung in here for a long time. Uh, but I will tell you that I, I, I wouldn't do it if I was going to lose $700 million or ruin my reputation. So we feel this is going to be successful. I don't think it's a home run. Um, but it's going to be a very good investment. And uh, I urge you to reconsider uh, our application. Madam Chair, um, the Schenectady City officials actually offered to drive here to testify on behalf of Mr. Bloom. We, we told them that was not necessary, but I think Mayor Rodriguez would like to address the commission. So I did establish parameters um, that are important in terms of fairness and equity. It is very uncomfortable for me to stick to my guns in this case because I don't want to be disrespectful. Um, <clears throat> I do want to ask my fellow commissioners before we turn to your request, Mr. Braceres, that um, on this narrow threshold issue, do we have other questions? are the legal, the legal issues that are before us. Do we have other questions? Because as I said earlier, this is not uncomplicated given our responsibilities um, beyond the narrow statute that you've turned to today. Um, <clears throat> I'm the new kid here, but I take very seriously the overall um, obligations we have to the Commonwealth to achieve the highest and best value, like Mr. Bloom. I want to always do my homework, and I want to make sure we make decisions that are most informed. I have yet to be convinced that not getting more information on how a decision to go forward on your or other applications will be the best for the Commonwealth. I see that there have been studies done, and I would like to be able to confirm their accuracy. I'm not saying I don't believe they're not accurate. That's who I am, but I need to hear from my fellow commissioners because the grounds have to be reasonable and because of the competing statutory obligations, I want to make sure we act reasonably and don't abuse our discretion. Because that discretion is broad, but it is not absolute. Well, um, along, along, along the lines of what you, uh, what you um, articulate, uh, Madam Chair, I think um, uh, Mr. Bloom and, 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 and the lawyers present an argument, uh, I believe, towards us reopening or considering reopening the, the region. Um, their, uh, their, their argument relative to the highest and best value that I think ties to is one of opportunity cost and how much time um, they, it would take uh, to reopen versus, you know, there's seemingly uh, uh, just reconsider, which would also take time, admittedly. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, um, if that was one, if, what, if that, that, that's one, one thing for us to, um, to talk about, whether it's today or a later time, if we stick with the narrow question of the authority, which is what I think uh, we, we, we came to do, I'm glad that there's agreement between uh, the parties. I, 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 I agree with it. Uh, I think uh, we do have the broad authority. Now, whether we want to reconsider or not, that really is uh, when 
the question of the alternative, uh, which is well summarized in your presentation, um, is, is most relevant. Uh, would we want to uh, reopen, uh, um, you know, verify, confirm uh, those market studies? Um, uh, I do have a, a couple of questions of them, but I don't think it's relevant to address them uh, right now. I did read them with interest because I've been tracking that competitive landscape, for example. So um, I think this discussion should be around that second question. Um, and I am, um, uh, let's just say, 60-40 uh, on if we're going to do something, we should really consider reopening uh, the, uh, the, for, for um, <coughs> the, the bidding, if you will, to confirm or not, uh, uh, to study in more detail um, what is available or feasible in that, in that region. There's a couple of other things that come up, and I think you also mentioned them. The validity of the vote, uh, which was now, you know, it's bordering on four years, uh, whether we would um, require a, a, a new vote or, or could, are able to just, you know, um, use, uh, the city is able to use that vote and that host community agreement because it has changed or not. But that's one thing that through the opening of the bidding process, we could, we could confirm. Uh, I would agree with the chair and Commissioner Zuniga in terms of, I think it's unanimous that the commission has the authority to reconsider the decision that was made back in 2016 as to the question of whether we should in this case. Um, I think for a number of factors, um, the timeliness of it, um, which leads into, I think, the reasonableness of the request, also fundamental fairness and sort of a latches argument in terms of other people who would have been or could be current bidders. And while I respect the business acumen and the work that you've done, as someone sitting up here with a statutory mandate to get the highest and best value for the Commonwealth, saying, take my word for it, there's no other bidders, just doesn't suffice. It needs to be a fair, open, competitive, robust, transparent process. And so that, to me, cuts against the reasonableness of doing that. Um, while the Wampanoag status may have been a factor, when you go back and look at the comments and the rationale behind the rejection and denial of the application in 2016, um, it does not limit itself to that. And there were other concerns about the type of jobs, the quality of jobs, the pay of jobs, the site of the location itself across from the high school that you've been talking about, um, the close vote in the community of 140 and change. Would that, in fact, be weighing against reconsideration at this point in terms of fundamental fairness and reasonableness to the community? All of those factors, to me, when you weigh the basis for reconsidering something two years out in this landscape, cut against us reconsidering it at this point. A, a bigger conversation, no one has forgotten Regency. We are all fully aware that it is out there. Um, and I think that is a conversation for another day, but in terms of what is narrowly before us today, uh, I would agree that we have the authority, but based on um, the facts and the decision and the facts before us in terms of changed circumstances on the ground, I, I do not think that this is an appropriate move for the commission to make. I, I, not to repeat what some of my colleagues have already shared, I, I, I have certainly uh, come in agreement on jurisdiction um, when it comes to grounds for reconsideration, uh, though there are some uh, new facts as they've been pointed out to us. Uh, I think Commissioner Bryan made a good point in reviewing our record of our decision. Uh, uh, at least for me, some of those issues uh, did not weigh on my decision um, at, at that point to deny the application. Um, some of the other things that were pointed out and you know are currently on this slide uh, with respect to uh, the city of Brockton, those were a lot of the facts that were presented to us uh, uh, at the time of the first application hearing and you know, again to uh, echo the point if nothing to uh, stress our concern about this this commission has been well aware uh, that the way the legislation was structured there were could potentially be some challenges for Region C and, uh, and 
is certainly a region uh, that has significant economic needs. Uh, I would certainly suggest that Region B also had some certain uh, economic needs at the same time. Um, so I it fully appreciate our authority to reconsider. Uh, I just uh, struggle with the facts uh, as it relates to grounds for reconsideration for reconsidering this application. Can we make a, a few comments? Keep it very narrow. Absolutely, sure. and, and again, um, I'm in the awkward position of um, having been requested for uh, the mayor to speak, and I would offer uh, the mayor to give his remarks. As to my friends from Schenectady, I'm, I'm not sure where you are. They're not here. They're not they're here. Not here. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they didn't come. But I, I do want to offer at least two minutes or so. Mayor, you've come here, and we know that you're in a very particular position right now, so thank you. Um, with that said, again, it's, uh, you've heard from my fellow commissioners on the legal uh, issue. We will take your, your follow-up before we make our, uh, if there's a motion before us. Okay, thank, but thank you, Madam. first let's hear from Mayor Rodriguez, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, and welcome. <laughs> under these circumstances. Yes. Um, you've already know and heard the issues that our city face. Uh, and it's been brought out here uh, very clearly. We have the fourth largest school system in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Boston, Worcester, Springfield, and then Brockton, which possibly makes us the fourth largest community in Massachusetts. But yet, when you sit down and think about it, and it's been brought out here, Boston is Boston. Worcester just got the Paw Sox. Uh, Springfield has MGM, and what does Brockton have? We from the southeastern part of the state feels that uh, Massachusetts ends around 128. And the rest of us are left with crumbs. We get crumbs and we don't have the ability to do much for ourselves because we often feel that the state doesn't do much to help us out. Anytime an opportunity shows up or presents itself, for some odd reason, the upper part of the state gets it, the western part of the state gets it, Boston gets it, and we are left with absolutely nothing. We are also the only city in Plymouth County, the only city. There's 26 commu 27 communities, 26 towns in one city. That's where the hospitals are, that's where the social service agencies are, and lately we've become the catch-all for the issues of homelessness and the issues affecting the opioid crisis in our community. We did a, uh, a little survey not too long ago. We found out that over 70% of the people who are homeless in our city are not from our city. They're people that come from the outside, from the smaller towns, migrating into the city looking for help. But what can we do to help? As a city official, we're looking at, we don't have the resources that the Bostons and the Worcesters and Springfields have, but we have the issues that come along with cities. I have been a supporter of this casino project since its inception. Um, heavily Catholic, sometimes you look at gambling as, but I'm not looking at it because of gambling. I'm looking at it because of three issues. Jobs, resources to our community, and creating a destination for Brockton, which we do not have. Uh, recently we had a, uh, a visit from the president of Cape Verde that came to Brockton. They had to stay in Quincy because we don't have a high-end hotel to host dignitaries in our community. We don't have hotels. We don't have restaurants dignifying of dignities that come into our community. So when this opportunity was presented to us, we're looking at it as an opportunity to kind of get into the city, to look like a city. Uh, the jobs, when you look at it, 2,000 plus jobs. It might not mean much to Boston or to the folks sitting here, but to us it means a lot. You know, we've got a, a very diverse community, people who barely speak English in our community, uh, but those individuals want nothing more than an opportunity to be able to, to, to work and provide for their families. And then when you look at resources to our community, we talked about the fact that our high school is over 50 years old. And it needs renovations 10 years ago. But we can't afford to do them. 
you know, any time a project comes down the pipeline, you've got opposition from opposition, and then the state drops the ball most of the time when it comes time to helping our community out. So I ask you, what do you got to lose by helping the fourth largest community in Massachusetts? What do you have to lose? Why, I mean, when they put up the slide as far as uh, miscarriage of justice, that's what I see happening to Brockton in the surrounding community. There's a severe miscarriage of justice when it comes to, when it comes to providing the fourth largest community in Massachusetts with resources and opportunities. That's all we're asking for. So I implore you, although you're sitting here saying you don't want to reopen this because there probably could be some additional competition coming down the pipeline, but I'm here basically pulling for my city. I'm pulling for my city because no one else is. The state isn't helping us. No one else is doing this. And if there's individuals who are willing to help us, please do not stand in their, on our way and let us become the city that we should be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, just three, three quick points. I mean, I, I have others, but I'll pass on those. Or Mr. Bloom, he, I know he's paying for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, three, three quick points. One, one is just a reminder. I don't think anyone really needs reminding, but it's important to keep in mind that reconsideration is not the same thing as approval. And the homework that you're talking about, the checking of the market studies, the checking to determine whether or not the market really is oversaturated or not, could all be done in the context of a robust reconsideration process uh, before a determination is made whether or not to approve the reconsideration. Uh, second, second point, all of the other alternatives, including opening up a new process, um, which we've already been through, but all of those other alternatives, I would suggest are unreasonable. And unreasonable because they necessarily and inevitably cause additional delay of at least three years before any shovel is in the ground. As compared to reconsideration, which could give $85 million to the Commonwealth immediately, and shovels would be in the ground quickly, if not by the end of this year, in early 2020, which would make an enormous difference. I mean, the Schenectady project that we flipped through, Schenectady, Schenectady opened in 2017. The RFA process for Schenectady started at the exact same time as the RFA process for, uh, for, region, for region C and yet they're now getting tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, and Brockton and the Southeast region are getting nothing. And then finally, the last point is, before, before making a decision not to reconsider, not to have a discussion about reconsideration, um, why, not, why, why not test what what Mr. Berseris described as the hypothetical of other competitors by doing what Chairman Crosby suggested about a year ago and putting out a, an informal solicitation of interest to see if anybody else raises their hand, if anybody else is interested and is willing to make the sort of commitment that Mr. Bloom has made over the course of the last five years. I would think that would be an important factor to consider if no one raises their hand, given enough time to do that, uh, that would be an important factor to consider before determining not to reconsider uh, mg es proposal. Thank you. Are you all set, or do you have anything additional to add, Catherine or Todd? Nothing further to add. Okay. Fellow commissioners, do you have additional questions, comments? The only other comment that I would make in terms of the points you just raised is um, I keep hearkening back to our obligation to have an open competitive process and having sort of a presumptive person who's already further along in a process who's continuing to go and then inviting bidders to me while it would test the market to some extent. I think there are risks to that as well. And so while I hear you, I would not be inclined to do that on this posture in terms of reconsidering. But aren't those the, the exact sort of considerations that could be made in the context of a true reconsideration process? 
where you're deciding whether or not to approve the project or not approve the project. I disagree. I think that it gives an unfair advantage and doesn't give an open process to anyone who wants to take a look at the region. That's but but, but I don't see what, what the risk is. If somebody raises their hand and says, oh, you know, it's a viable alternative or it's a viable market player, it's not just, you know, some in, you know, outlier individual then that could be factored by the commission as to whether to exercise its ability to reconsider. We're not suggesting that, you know, th then no one would get a head start. The, the, the point that we're making is that there are no viable alternatives. And if this commission decides that it's you know, not going to even consider this question, then Regency may never be tapped. Because the prospect of going through another two to three year process here where a casino would be opened then you know two years after that meaning five years before any benefits to region c that will just chill any application and meanwhile you know, the you know just the economics of it you have tiverton and um the other rhode island casinos will just build up their market you know control as the you know first movers in the market i i, I don't see the downside to actually soliciting interest if nothing's there, then no, there has to be no worries about a head start. If there is someone there, well, then that could be taken into consideration. That's a very different posture than asking us to reconsider what was denied in 16. I think you're talking about two very different things. Uh, well, I think we're, I mean, we're just asking you to see whether you have the authority to reconsider. I think that was the question put before us. And then, you know, in the you know, next hearing, month, two months ahead, we can sit, consider whether to exercise that authority, that you're only here to decide whether you have, and then you can decide whether to exercise it. And in that time frame, there can be a solicitation of interest. And if there is you know, great interest, then maybe that's taken into account. And it's so, you know, there are all these other competitors. But I'm gonna stop open. you for a moment. My understanding, and maybe the chair and the other commissioners can clarify. Um, I, I believe the commission marked up for agenda and is prepared to vote on the question of do we have the authority and if we are choosing to, to do that today. If there are grounds uh, sufficient for us to move ahead on the motion for um, reconsideration of the 2016 denial of the um, application for the license in Regency. And that's important. Uh, from the start, um, Mr. Braceres, I've made it very clear that I inherited this motion for reconsideration and quite frankly it was hard for me to understand whether or not we had the authority so we marked it up very clearly for a narrow narrow legal issue with that said as I stated at the very beginning if we make a decision to move forward with your um, motion for reconsideration we would get the public input mm -hmm. if we decide to not move forward on your motion for reconsideration, we will get that public input. Uh, uh, but there'd be no process. There'd be no, uh, how would you get because that? Because I mean, we're, we're suggesting remains open. We're suggesting, we're suggesting, we're suggesting a hybrid, really. Well, you're, you've, you've, you're, you're suggesting a hybrid, but it does take out one factor, and that is, and that I see, I'm not sure how my fellow commissioners see, the topic of Regency will um, take into consideration, I suspect, but I can't guess what the public may be interested in, but it could take into consideration factors beside who is interested in actually applying. And so you're suggesting if you, know, you determine that there's no other bidder, we could move forward on your motion. Am I wrong? Is that what you're saying? No, I, 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 just, I just think all of those factors can be considered in the in the reconsideration process as to whether to grant a license what we're asking is but it would eliminate a competitive bid it it would there but there you that, know what shouldn't be ignored is that there has been a competitive process there was a long competitive process and right. only one Green. man was left standing at the end of that process. Right. And but now, that, as you've pointed out, there are changes in the market. There are changes in the legal landscape. Mm -hmm. We don't know, one, if there are other applicants. We are, you know, we've made the great, great, you know. True, but that's what and we're. And it's fair assumptions. So 
But, but that's, that's what we're suggesting before deciding not to reconsider. But there are certain other assumptions that you've made that I think I would like to get more information on. But, but so you could you get that in, in the reconsideration process. You would get that. And, and with respect to the there's... context of your motion for reconsideration right. as opposed to a clean slate. Right. And there, there was a comment made you know, that you were, you're, you're asked to take our word for it, but really not. There was a comment period here. And through that comment period, we saw the other players who solicited comment. And there could be another way to do that, a more, you know, a, a more rigorous solicitation of, of interest. It's the, the, the denial now and the suggestion that there's absolutely no reconsideration could preclude development at all of Regency. It'll have to go back to the legislature and then there'll be, you know, a, the law will be changed. Well, because that, that, this that is, is This is saying opinion. it's going to be five years from now. Yeah, I don't, I, that, you know, you've stated that, but I'm not sure if all of us would agree with that. So, um, I, I am, as I will reiterate, this is not uncomplicated, and I am very appreciative of all the time that's been taken on this subject matter, um, and, and your, your motion for reconsideration. I do think there's more than just one avenue, and I'm, you know, I'm hearing that they're the same avenues, and I think you're, you've distinguished the two, that there are more than one as well. And Mr. Bloom, I very much appreciate your coming in today and, and highlighting your commitment to the area. Brockton's very, very fortunate to have that commitment from you. But as I stated, I am very concerned about fairness and informed decision making. And I'm not sure if I've heard the grounds today of um, sufficiently changed circumstances to warrant the motion for reconsideration at this time. But I turn to, to you all. No, I, I agree. I mean, I'm prepared to move on both our authority and on the substance of whether or not to move forward on, on the motion itself for reconsideration. I don't know how commissioners in against Stephens feel. Well, I think it's intriguing to split it and ask for additional comments. I, I don't really know that we will get substantive, um, um, you know, I, I, I don't really, I don't think we will be satisfied as to the, uh, who may be out there that could put together a proposal with, with enough time. I think a lot of the arguments that they make are uh, compelling, but in my mind, that the city makes, the mayor makes, um, uh, are compelling, but they point to reopening, um, uh, if anything, reopening the, the bidding process, not this consideration, this reconsideration that they, uh, that's before us. Richard Stebbins? I, I'd uh, make that same argument. I have a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission find that it has the discretion to reconsider the Commission's decision denying MGNE's January 2015 application for a gaming license in Region C, as is outlined in the presentation made by the Commission legal staff. And I further move that after review of the materials submitted in the presentations made today by both Commission staff and Council for MGNE, that sufficient grounds do not exist to support a reconsideration of the Commission's decision denying the MGE's January 2015 application for a gaming license in Region C and that we thus do not move to, we do not open for reconsideration. Second. Any further discussion, questions? Are we permitted to make one more comment? Um, the, I'm just picking up on one thing that Commissioner Zuniga said, that um, a solicitation of interest doesn't, be, doesn't need to be narrow in time. Uh, you could you could open up a process say six months and say in the next six months we will leave it open in the next six months for others to raise their hand to show us whether they have an interest have a plan for Regency and take that into consideration before foreclosing reconsideration of an existing plan that could get off the ground promptly the only thing I should respond, and I go back to my initial comments, is that 
if this motion does prevail, this in no way is precluding this company from continuing to make its bid for this work. Uh, we, we un it we would understand. just be pursuant to a process. It might in that practice, is, though. But, pardon me? It might in practice. But, well, we understand that, legally that's, it doesn't. That's but one that, that it, is. It could, uh, it could preclude any. I understand. I understand. But it does mean it becomes a process that would be different than the one you've envisioned, certainly today. Any further discussion from my fellow commissioners? We have a motion that's been seconded and before us. Any further questions? I, can I make one point? Yeah. Um, I don't honestly know how long you expect us to be hanging around here for Brock. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I don't see why you can't vote that you have the authority to reconsider and then for a period of time see what interest there is to for others to potentially bid on this and then if you have no interest then you can go back and make your decision but to vote that you are not going to uh, reopen this under any circumstances uh, I don't know how I can continue to hang in here on behalf of Brockton. I've spent millions of dollars with studies, so all of you saw them on the list. I don't know what you lose, if anything, by simply saying that you have the right to do it, you vote for that, and then see what other interests there may be, and then revisit our request. But to deny our request, uh, I think I think you, you lose me, I, I can't hang around. I've been doing this for more than five years. I spent millions of dollars. I, I very much want to do this for Brockton. Uh, but I don't know what the commission uh, or the Commonwealth loses by simply taking that intermediate step. I do think, oh, go right ahead, Commissioner. Um, you. you know, I, w I was just going to suggest um, would, would you mind maybe splitting the vote, uh, perhaps, uh, that the motion that you made, Commissioner? Because I think, um, I think they make a, 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 there may be a compelling reason. Or, there, there, I think there's a compelling argument to solicit public comment relative to anybody out there um, who may be interested for however long it would take. Uh, I think um, by necessity of closing the door now, would then prompt a later decision, which I, I, I understand um, would necessitate a lengthening of the, of the process. I'm not inclined to separate them at this point. I don't, but if you wanted to make a competing motion, uh, Commissioner, you can make a competing motion. Well, I would move that we move on the first, uh, that, that we find that we have the legal authority to um, to have this, um, to have this decision, to, that we have the, the legal authority to have a, 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 a reconsideration. I have a question around the rules of order. I mean, we have a motion on the floor. I seconded it. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some vote to either approve or defeat that motion. So before I hear we that. Consider another motion. I hear Commissioner Zuniga has asked for an amendment to your motion. Um, the, the next rule of procedure would be a vote on his proposed amendment. Is that correct? And we, and to we, be clear, it was um, the it's because um, you would like to be able to separate so that you could move separately on whether or not there are sufficient grounds today to support. Um, reconsideration of the 2016 application they, that you're that that's what you would want to vote on separately you know I stand, uh, I stand corrected I think the the motion did say about it does speak about uh, sufficient grounds to support the reconsideration 
I'm prepared and this to vote on the motion. this is why this is a difficult matter. Well, I'm, I'm prepared to, to, uh, to vote on the motion that's been um, it, made and second. So I withdraw my second motion. So do we have further questions or discussion on the motion before us? Barring none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Barring uh, opposed? No. Okay. Three, one. Thank you for your time. We have heard you today. We have spent a great deal of time individually. This is, of course, our opportunity to think about this together. And um, we, we have uh, appreciated the input that we've received from our legal advisors, from you, from um, the others who have commented. So uh, we are hearing you, Mr. Bloom and we will continue to meet our statutory obligations in a responsive and timely fashion. Thank you very much. I think we need a break. Yes. I'll set Austin. Great. Thank you. And thank you for everyone's patience. We are moving on to item number five on our agenda. This is a reconvening. We just broke on our meeting. And we have Ombudsman Ziemba in Encore. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, today, Encore Boston Harbor is here to present its quarterly report for the second quarter of this year, which ended on June 30th. As you know, during that period, Encore Boston Harbor uh, had its opening, uh, which will be discussed by Encore Boston Harbor President Bob DeSalvio and Encore Senior Vice President and General Counsel Jackie Crum. Uh, before their presentations, let me turn it over to Joe Delaney, Construction Project Oversight Manager, uh, who will give you a very, very brief status uh, on the 90-day commitments review that is currently underway. Joe? Uh, thank you. Um, as you know, at the project opening, there were several items that um, were outlined in a memo to the commission uh, that were given an additional 90 days to be completed. Uh, Encore is making uh, very good progress in completing these items, uh, most of which have been completed at this point. Um, we're still waiting on some of the backup documentation on those, um, so they haven't all been fully closed out. Uh, what we plan on doing is we're going to meet individually with each of the commissioners before the 90-day period is up to go over exact status. You know, as we're still getting items in, uh, we can't fully close out everything, so we want to give an exact status, and then we will talk about uh, any next steps that we need to do um, if necessary. And if there are no questions regarding that, I'll turn it over to Paul. I just I'm assuming yes, that that approach means that everything is progressing to the point where you think it will be resolved in 90 days. I, I could just add one thing. There are one or maybe one or two that are minor construction items that are in process. So um, we're just trying to rush to get them done in time. But I, I, I think there's a distinction between um, what Joe is speaking about and the license conditions. So the license conditions are moving forward. One of those license conditions is uh, further documentation regarding the commitment closeout. So we've got a commitment tracker that has thousands of items on it. And I think um, some of those items we're, we're trying to get before the 90 days, um, but we may need an extension um, to get some of the paperwork done so that we can demonstrate that we've closed out all of those commitments. Yeah, we're, look, we're down to, I think, 30 or 40 items that on those that, the several thousand item list. Um, you know, and a few of these things are as simple as um, uh, the, the looming and seeding of the, the connector over to the uh, uh, the Gateway Center, uh, the, the, you know, it was seeded in June, so a lot of weeds grew in, had to be reseeded. That may not be fully stabilized by that point, so that may need a, a short extension, you know, to get the uh, sign off from the Ever Conservation Commission, something to that effect. But, you know, the work is done, uh, but it's just really a lot of dotting I's and crossing and T's at this point. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, John. 
Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Bob DeSalvio, President of Encore Boston Harbor, and I'm here uh, with Jackie Crum, our Senior Vice President and General Counsel. Um, we're pleased to report on the activities uh, surrounding our opening. Um, I have to say from, uh, you know, from being in the business for quite a while and going through openings, uh, this one really ranked up there as, uh, I'd say, excellent in terms of execution. You know, we, we said we wanted flawless. I'm not sure there is such a thing, uh, but we, play, we came pretty close. Uh, and that is really a testament to the 5,000 team members that have joined us as part of the process and the real significant effort of their team leaders to make sure we get organized. And I also, it's a, also a testament to Wynn Resorts for giving us the opportunity to bring those team members on the vast majority of them on on June 3rd for a June 23rd opening and clearly we had almost a thousand people of the 5,000 about a thousand came in at least uh, if not years in advance like some of us but a good solid week before that we had the entire culinary team in and we worked with Everett High School for them to do their training before we even had access to the building and quite honestly most companies would not put that kind of resource and investment into allowing team members to have a full three weeks worth of training before we actually opened the doors uh, to the public. So we're very thankful that the company gave us the resources to be able to uh, pull that off. And I think that was then reflected in how smooth that the opening did go. Um, I also want to point out that the, um, the process of having the casino preview days was extremely helpful to the process. I know that it's done here in the Commonwealth and in some, some other jurisdictions do it, uh, but the way that it's done here, I think, um, is actually uh, very, very well thought out. We were using live money. The games were real. Um, at the same time, you know, we were able to raise some good money that Jackie will talk about and was uh, given to some very worthy nonprofits. But it really gave the team a chance to um, get their feet wet, work with customers, see how it went, and then constantly fine-tuning the operation. So all in all, um, we think it went extremely well. The big news, there were no traffic issues. Um, and I know how much time that we spent talking about that, preparing for that. Um, it really was well executed. The time that we spent with law enforcement and other um, interested parties, I think, really paid off. And, um, and that uh, story on traffic continues today. Um, there have, you know, as we start to approach our 90 days of being open, there have literally been uh, no issues. Uh, and what we've come to find out is that in the morning, we do not collide at all with commuter hour. Um, we know that from being on Broadway. Um, I can tell you with 100% certainty, our customers are not coming at 7 a.m. They typically come around 11 a.m. We start to see the build. And then the real positive surprise of all of this is that the night business is actually coming in later than what we thought. Um, you know, it's really, it's really 9, 10 o'clock in the evening when we're starting to see the night business build. And quite honestly, that's well after commuter hour. And so um, while all the planning was terrific, the good news is there does not appear to be uh, really much overlap at all uh, between our traffic. And I know that was one of your concerns. So great news there. Um, you know, how are we doing from a business perspective? Um, I will tell you that we are in the ramp up mode as most um, you know, new operations would be at this point in time. We have really, when we think about it, there's really three um, major segments that we deal with. First and foremost, we are working very hard to be Greater Boston's hometown casino. And by that I mean we are introducing ourselves to literally thousands of people every week who, um, as um, I'm sure you've heard, uh, you know, the idea of uh, the Commonwealth repatriating money that had previously gone out to other jurisdictions, that process of repatriation is working. We have folks that are, um, you know, right living around our area that used to travel out of state, and they're now um, starting to enjoy their hometown casino, which is exactly what we hoped would happen. 
Um, on a larger scale, we're starting to get visitors from around the country. Uh, and uh, to a limited extent now, we're actually starting to see some visitors from overseas. Um, I know you've heard us talk about that. Um, we did not want to rush into um, the larger um, international uh, travel program that our company is known for until we could get really our um, service levels, our dealers, and all of the folks that work uh, the property up to the level that is required when you're dealing with a um, significant amount of players that come in from overseas, but they're already starting to arrive. And so we're starting to see that segment. But clearly we're working hard. If I had to sum up really the, the I'll call it the, you know, the, really the four business drivers, the hotel is in the process of ramping up. We've introduced the hotel product. It's been very well received, um, but we're trying to get our name out there. Um, and we're doing so, we're, we're offering some very good introductory deals through our own website and also through the online travel agencies. So you can get a very reasonable room price for what we believe is the top room product. And as people are discovering it, uh, we're gonna see the hotel occupancy start to ramp up. The restaurant, same story there. Great restaurants at all price points. Um, we've made some adjustments in the food and beverage product, um, recognizing what in particular the hometown customers are looking for, which is um, some items at lower price point and things that uh, for folks that are not staying in the building very long that they're um, used to and comfortable with. So we're constantly refining the food and, be uh, refining the food and be beverage offerings to make sure that it matches in particular what the local market looks for. The table games business, as you've heard about and you've seen when you saw the public numbers announced in July, has uh, been extremely strong and continues to, the, to grow uh, as of right now. We're actually adding a few more tables on the casino floor uh, as we speak. Um, but I will tell you the slot business has been soft. And so we are um, continuing to look at that. Um, we're looking at everything from the product um, you know, people are, are used to a certain type of equipment uh, that they might have seen in other locations. Uh, we have an, a, a brand new slot floor, and for those folks that come in and the ma as the manufacturers change the product, um, sometimes they look around and it looks different from what they're used to. So there's definitely going to be an adjustment cycle for that. We're even looking at, we're actually going to change mix on, on the floor and look at some of the games that we have now seen are more popular and do some potential conversions and swap outs. But um, that's really from, and, and as you know, our company will announce and talk about numbers on a quarterly basis. Um, so as the third quarter starts to wrap up, um, typically in early November you will see uh, the Wynn Resorts go out with its investor call, and um, we like to limit our specific discussion about numbers uh, to the periods when we have, as a public company, our typical investment uh, calls. So that's where we are from a business perspective. We had some photos we wanted to share with you. Um, great shots from the opening. Um, as you know, we had a wonderful day. It was a Sunday. Um, this is a group of team members that joined us as part of the uh, ribbon cutting right out front. That's a shot of the lines uh, that were built up all the way around the Harbor Walk. The next, um, this was really quite unique when we did the, um, the opening daytime fireworks, which most people had never heard of or thought possible, including myself. Uh, and um, uh, Grucci really pulled it off. Uh, it was really a wonderful event. And, um, and folks, I think, really enjoyed it. And then the next shot is, um, here's everyone uh, uh, rushing to get into the front doors uh, right after we open. Um, next is a, um, on the construction schedule, uh, no reason to really go through this in detail because we're now open. I did want to report, I spoke to Peter Campo this morning, we now have 91 items left on the punch list. And if you recall from Peter's uh, previous uh, visits with you, that list started out in the thousands. And so literally we are uh, clicking them off one at a time and working our way down to what is really a minimal punch list as far as construction goes. We're closing out Suffolk. Um, there is one outstanding item that um, we've talked about in previous meetings, and I'll address it before you even ask, and that is the work on the daycare center. 
Um, yep. That is actually underway in full swing. Um, I think the last meeting we had told you that we'd be done around the end of the year, mm -hmm. uh, and I will tell you that schedule is still holding. We are looking to get done in November and then turn it over to ABCD, who is our operator, uh, and then they're looking to get done by the end of the year. So, so far, so good. Construction is moving along. And then also a question that I know you ask is um, in the interim. Right. And ABC did agree to help us um, and so they can assist if, for any current employee who might need, uh, have needs between now and then. They agreed to help them try to place and then they ultimately could move over to the new station landing location. So, so far so good on the, um, on the daycare front. Is there uh, demand? I'm Is sorry? Is there demand for it? Um, yeah, um, I think there'll be more demand when we're at station landing because it would tie into the fact of where they could park and you think of the normal sequence, how difficult this is for families in the morning right. to execute that transition. And if you could literally uh, drop your son or daughter um, and then drop your car and then get on a shuttle bus and go, all logical. So I think now people are probably using their existing or local until such time as they can reorganize their uh, morning routine or evening routine. We're also working with our employees so that they, if they do have childcare needs and we can rearrange their schedules at this point, we're, we're being very open to doing that so that they can, um, they can work and make sure their children are taken care of. Um, the, I want to now skip over to our um, uh, kind of an update as we uh, get to the end of our construction. Um, on the design phase, this particular work is virtually done, so I'll skip right to the summary. Um, in this particular work, we had a goal of 18.9% of the work and wound up at 22.7 um, with almost $15 million worth of work going to uh, minorities, women, and veteran businesses. So we, we felt good about exceeding that overall goal. As far as the construction contracts, we, there is still some closeout work on here, so these numbers will change, but not by a lot. Um, another great story here, uh, on the minority business front, we had a goal of 5% uh, and came in at about 5.8% on the, uh, for the WBEs, 5.4% was the goal, came in at 12.5%. Uh, and the VBEs, a goal of 1% and came in at 2.8%. Overall, we had a goal of 11.4, and it looks like we're going to come in about 18.9. The percentages are not the story. The story is the number. Mm. The number is large. It's a $263 million worth of work. That's a lot of, that's a lot of money. And so we feel really good about um, exceeding that overall goal as the construction phase. And I saw, I guess yesterday, I know you guys are working on a, um, some sort of a forum that you're doing as it relates to this particular topic. Uh, and it's good to see, because I think there's been um, momentum built up uh, in a number of different fronts. And we like to think that our project in some way, shape, or form has helped uh, folks have wonderful careers that will last long past our project. And so I was happy to see that um, you've got a session upcoming on, uh, on uh, women and diversity in, in the construction trades uh, and look forward to that. And that really leads me to um, our next slide, which talks about the actual workforce in construction. Um, you know, we had a goal on, on, for minority workers of 15.3% and we um, came in at 25.7%. On the female side, 6.9% and came in at 7.2%, and on the veteran workforce, 3% came in at 5.3%. Uh, and so significant number of folks were able to participate in the process. Um, as far as our um, permanent employment, um, right now we're at uh, 4982 uh, in terms of the active roster. Um, we have about 220 in the process. That is mainly gaming because I think, as you know, we were actually short at opening in terms of uh, dealers uh, and other casino staff. So we've been hiring them as uh, uh, fast as we can. Um, I also like to acknowledge um, uh, both Karen and the uh, licensing team. Um, we put in a call for help in terms of trying to get people through the funnel 
as fast as possible. And, um, and I got a, a big thank you from our casino folks because I think it was all hands on deck in the licensing bureau to continue to try to crank out the number of folks that we need. So thank you for the efforts and for uh, the entire licensing team. Um, we're getting caught up now so that as we introduce some new table games, um, we'll hopefully have the appropriate staff because it's important for the customers. We're trying to provide games at the, um, at the betting limits that they're looking for. And so by us having enough dealers and getting the games open, we can have a wider variety of lower limit games um, so that we can accommodate all levels of customers. It's important for us to be able to do that. Um, and then on the, my last slide before I turn this over to Jackie is on transportation. And I wanna repeat, we've had no traffic issues since opening. Um, it's been great. As you know, we have multi multiple modes working. Um, uh, at a point not too long ago, we added our uh, fourth boat into the water shuttle service. Uh, that has been extremely well received. Um, and so we're seeing that working. Um, we've got the neighborhood shuttle. We have the, uh, of course, the folks coming in off the T. And then we have the premium park and rides, all which are um, driving volumes uh, in and out of the, out of the uh, building. So the entire traffic plan has worked. The garage is smooth. Customers have been able to get in and out. And so really on all fronts, uh, testament to proper planning and uh, good execution. Bob, a quick question on the boats. Um, is there a time frame or a schedule as to hope, how long you hope to keep using them as kind of the winter months? We are approach? attempting to go year round. Um, of course, that will be weather dependent. Okay. And you know, sometimes if you get those, if you get a really bad ice buildup um, where it just shuts it down, then it shuts it down. It does happen from time to time in the harbor. Um, and we'll have to see how our harbor area works right in front of us. Um, but we'll wait and see, but we're going to keep running them. Even on days now, if it's raining, we put the sides down and the operator continues to run. So we're going to see what we can do about trying to keep it going um, as much as possible all year. So for those who are taking it on a cold fall day, there's, it's, it's warm. Correct. There's heat. There's heat yes, and air conditioning. I wanted you and to we can that. either on nice days, we leave the sides up and then there's these um, the uh, the portable pieces we put in to close it up, and they can see the oh, they River love it. It's in a changing in changing weather. Okay. Yeah, and it's uh, for anyone who hasn't uh, taken the ride. I really suggest it. Uh, it's just great to see Greater Boston from the harbor and from the waterside. What what time did they run till uh, uh, in the evening? Eleven, just about eleven p.m. Mm -hmm. And that eleven to midnight, depending Gets on where you're dropping off. But that's yeah. about it. And then we shut it down. And part of that's out of respect for the uh, dock areas where you don't want late night service. Um, you know, we're into a long wharf and out in the seaport. Right. And so at some point, you know, whether the operators, uh, you know, they want you to shut down for the yep. evening, obviously. Yep. Well, can I go back to the prior slide? Um, will you in the, in the upcoming um, quarterly reports be reporting um, some of the demographics? Uh, yes, yes, of those, we uh, always plan permanent employment? after the first um, quarter of true operations. Okay. Uh, that would be Great. our next update. Uh, the format of this report will obviously change from a construction report sure. to an operations report, yep. much like Penn and MGM are doing. Yeah, I think I think we've seen some some early breakdown of folks and where they lie in different positions. I think you guys have actually come up with a table that we'd like to use with our other licensees. So everybody's kind of speaking the same language and sharing the same data and information as it relates to employment. So that's great. Thank you. All right. I'll turn it over to Jackie. Uh, just very quickly before I begin, an additional thank you to uh, all of your staff uh, for the opening. I know there were a lot, of, and, and you too, uh, I know there were a lot of late nights involved and uh, it was a ton of feedback that we received. We've implemented it. It's an ongoing uh, process and they've just been exceptional to work with. So thank you. Um, on the license conditions, as you know, we had uh, eight different license conditions uh, in, our, in our operation certificate, and uh, pleased to report that most of the things have been complete. We're still working, as we discussed before, on the closeout of the commitment tracker, but actually that'll become, that'll transition into a new tracker on the operations side as well. Uh, the other thing is the uh, angling of the frontline cage facial shots. That's in progress and I believe should be done by the end of this week. 
Uh, we have one remaining sign to be installed, and then on the casino credit department ceiling off from the cashier's cage, that started today, and we do uh, believe that that should be done uh, by the 21st, which would be the 90-day mark following the opening. Remind me, these were uh, conditions from the operation certificate after the yes. test? Yes. 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 Uh, just wanted to report we had, uh, we did this last year, uh, and then this year um, we did the great, uh, great Place to Work survey only in Las Vegas. We did not do it at Encore Boston Harbor since the majority of our staff were not on board yet. Uh, but we were really pleased Las Vegas was certified as a great workplace. And um, what really came back through the scores were that our employees were proud to, to tell others where they worked, that they were made to feel welcome, uh, appreciated the camaraderie that the company leadership encouraged. And they, where our scores were really exceptional was the opportunity to uh, contribute to the local communities through uh, the company's charitable efforts. So we've got a whole bunch of new company initiatives that I know has been presented to you previously. But uh, we're going to, to the extent that these haven't already been implemented at, at Encore Boston Harbor, these will all be in place um, by the end of the year. Moving on, just a little bit of the work that we've done with nonprofits uh, over the last few months. We, we did try to slow down some of our volunteer hours of opening, so we'll definitely see that go back up now that we're, we're stabilizing. And uh, in particular, the uh, last quarter of the year, we've got some great volunteer opportunities um, available. Uh, this, was, this was a unique uh, partnership that we did with Camp Harborview, and it's the first time this camp has only been open to kids within the city of Boston to, at, until uh, we partnered with them. And so this was the first year that kids from Everett, almost 30 kids from Everett, were able to participate in this amazing uh, opportunity for um, underserved uh, children. We also did a partnership with Boston Landmarks Orchestra and it was also sort of uh, multi-dimensional. We brought them into Everett, into uh, the For Kids Only After School Summer Program, and they brought their instruments and musicians played with the kids and taught them how to use various instruments. So that was fun for them. We also sponsored a uh, concert at the Hat Shell. We did the National Children's Day Festival. Uh, continued our work with veterans at the New England Center and Home for Veterans. And we did our annual water chestnut removal where we <laughs> lost two team members. They fell into the Mystic River. Uh, fortunately, we were able to retrieve them um, and they have uh, come out unscathed because the Mystic uh, River now uh, is suitable for swimming. <laughs> Uh, we did a back to school shopping spree where we essentially we invited um, kids in Everett to come in. They got to pick out a backpack, pick out their supplies. We worked with a, a lot of our different vendors to get uh, people to donate various supplies and our employees to uh, fill their backpacks, getting them ready for school. I love the size of backpacks. They're all huge, yes. <laughs> <laughs> on these tiny little kids. Yes. yes. Jackie, the, the home at the New England Center for and Home for Veterans, is that in Chelsea? Is that the Chelsea? That's in Chelsea. And then uh, we also did, we, we've been working with Summer Search and Beacon Academy students, and so we also did a, um, we did a, a, a volunteer drive for them as well to send, to prepare care packages for them. And finally, this has been sort of a department by department uh, initiative. D departments are, uh, have, you know, sort of an hour or two hours where the entire department will get together and they'll um, decorate outpatient kits or write letters to soldiers. Um, uh, who are serving abroad, and it's it's just been a, a really great way for the department to get to know each other and do some volunteer activities as part of the, the whole thing. And finally, um, we are a finalist in the Massachusetts Economic Impact Awards, which I believe comes up in the next yeah, week or two. Weeks, yeah. yeah, so we'll we'll report back following <laughs> that, hopefully. <laughs> um, we have donated 2.3 million to uh, local charitable organizations this year. Um, we have, even though we only had uh, the majority of our employees start in June, we were able to log 2,400 2, employee volunteer hours year to date. I think one of the coolest things we've done this year is, as you know, our money from the uh, play dates was all going to be donated, on, on the gaming side, was all going to be donated to charity. And so we held an event. We didn't tell the six charities that we'd selected how much money we'd made. And we unveiled it at that event. Uh, there were also the mayor of Malden and Medford were there as well. And they were floored. They had no idea that they were going to get 
this kind of money. So that was a, a great way to uh, to uh, move past the play dates. Yeah, one hundred and eleven thousand dollars, and and it was funny because we asked the organizations what they thought they were going to get, and they said something like, "Well." So it's going to be like 10 grand right <laughs> and so they were i mean the uh, <laughs> red red of life was unreal <clears throat> yes oh uh one other thing um uh just to clarify uh the board of directors of win resorts has selected uh with matt maddox's approval and an, an executive coach for him uh the person has been um they have entered into a contract and matt has started meeting with the executive coach and really seems to like the person. So I wanted to give you that feedback as well. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Great. Well, any other questions? Thank you, Commissioners. Thank that you. concludes Thank my report. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Commissioners, I think that, yeah, I think, no, I think the question is now, um, do you have the, um, fortitude uh, to do the junket regs because it may be that we want uh, some of the folks from Encore to stay during that um, and then take a break and go to lunch. Yep. Are you good? Yeah, I do. I, I do uh, probably have a couple of questions for Bob um, we'll and Jackie. We'll be right here. Yep. Thank okay. you, Bob. And thank you for your, your report. Thank you very much. So, So we are jumping now, we're going backwards now to 4B. 4B. Council, Councilor Troisi, thank you, and Director Wells, Bans, thank you. All right, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, so Director Wells, Director Band and I, and um, Director Vanderlinden, Vanderlinden should be here uh, momentarily. We're here to talk to you about the junket regs, which you discussed a bit at your last meeting. Uh, so in your packet, you have two draft regulations. You have 205 CMR 134.06, which is the actual junket regulation. Um, there's also an accompanying memo that just sort of outlines uh, the purpose of each section, but uh, just some of the key components. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the regulations require all junket enterprises and representatives to be licensed. They require uh, our licensees to maintain a monthly junket activity report that would be made available to the IAB upon request. And they uh, prohibit junket enterprises and representatives from marketing to individuals on the licensee's no marketing list or the a voluntary self-exclusion list. Um, so there's also a second regulation in your packet, which is the licensing regulation. That's 134.01. So that regulation just adds the solo junket representative that you discussed at your last meeting to the list of persons who would be required to be licensed uh, as a key gaming employee standard. That was the one type of license that wasn't already accounted for in the regulations. <clears throat> so um, I just want to point out before we get to any questions that um, we do have one change that we plan to make to the regulations that you have in your packet, uh, just based on some discussions this morning. So section 5B talks about the uh, process for how the junket enterprises and reps would receive the names of people to which they're not allowed to market. Oh, where is that again? Uh, it's on page two, right at the bottom. Of, this. of the of the two page reg. So oh. with the red line. That's why. So the way it's written right now, the process uh, would be that the junket enterprises and reps would uh, have to provide their potential marketing list to the licensees. The licensees would go through the list and sort of eliminate anyone who uh, fits into these categories that we've defined as not being appropriate for marketing and return the list to uh, the enterprises or reps. But we intend to change that and have the process be that 
the licensees will simply provide their complete no marketing list to the junket enterprises and reps and it would include anyone on the VSC list but you wouldn't be able to identify from which list people had come so it would just uh, make the process a bit more efficient and I think there were some privacy concerns about doing it that way when we talked about the last time have those all been resolved um, yeah I think that the privacy concerns uh, revolve in large part around the voluntary self-exclusion list um, uh, the statute clearly spells out that, that privacy and confidentiality is of utmost importance for for individuals who sign up for the voluntary self-exclusion list. I think the uh, the solution that was drafted by Kerry and the team really does an excellent job of, of protecting um, the privacy of those on the BSE list because it combines individuals that would be on that list with all other persons that would not be marketed to. So, in, so in it's essence, not a, masking it. It's not a bar that prohibits disclosure. It's just disclosure can be made as long as privacy is maintained. Wait. Well, especially in effectuating the purpose of signing up for both lists. Right. I if just you, want to, if, because of the privacy it, concerns last time, I just want to make sure that what you're proposing is the new approach. We had talked about that the last mm -hmm. time, and there were concerns raised about the privacy protections that are inherent in the voluntary exclusion list. So I'm just looking for affirmation that doing it this way yeah. is not violating any sort of non-disclosure prohibitions on that list. Mm -hmm. So the point is that you've raised a good point. The disclosure of the name, even though the privacy will be protected, is okay under the statute. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I, I, because I would like to legal yeah. to, to answer that definitively. I believe that, you know, just in terms of um, protecting the identity, because it's it's a uh, more than one list that's coming together that you wouldn't be able to determine whether or not this individual is on a no marketing list, whether they're on some other list, or whether they're on the voluntary exclusion list. Right. I'm just looking to make sure that we're not technically violating anything that says you cannot disclose this name. Yeah. I, I agree. I if we can work sure. the solution, I think it's a better way to do it. I, I actually like this modification. I had a, a, the concern on, on, on the other way in which um, if the, the whole purpose of signing up for these lists is not to be marketed to or invited to. Yeah. And if, if that acts as a barrier, because realistically the, the operator cannot um, know for sure who is on the list and has to go back and forth as to, can I talk to this person or can I not, um, may, may really end up being a real, a real barrier. I, I, I believe, and maybe, um, this is this is something that I, we should certainly put uh, make a disclosure, let's say, on anybody who's f signing prospectively, that the, the the names are going to be shared only to the extent to effectuate the the program, which is essentially what this is uh, happening. I think there was a concern that there's already some people in the list that maybe did not get a notification like that. And that could have been, you know, an issue. And if we had talked about maybe needing regs, I'm just thinking back to the last time we talked about it. And I guess what I'm saying yep. is I like this approach better than the one you've just talked about amending I, it. I just want to make sure and get affirmation that we're not running afoul of any statutory prohibition on disclosure. Yeah, I'll have to confirm that, but uh, I think we could, you know, seeing if there are more questions, we could still move forward and confirm that right. while we're in the process. Right. I like this approach as well, and I think notwithstanding the notion that the need for uh, uh, confidentiality, uh, I think there's, there's a, the, by necessity to execute the program to make sure that people are not marketed mm -hmm. to, you need to share right. those names. And it's, I understand that this is the beginning of the rulemaking yeah. process, so yeah. we would get input on this, this particular issue, right. which would be really helpful if there are concerns and it gives us an opportunity to just cross the T, dot the I on, mm -hmm. the, on the mm -hmm. precise legal question that you raised. I presume, Carrie, you that's addressed here, but it's important to just check that and then we'll get, the, we'll get input. Mm -hmm. It's just the beginning of the process. Correct, Director Wells. Did you want to add? I, oh, you I, have I, you've got competing interests of privacy and then the uh, interest of not marketing to people who have a gambling problem. Right. So, you know, this uh, solution seems to be the best way to address both those.
those concerns with giving the most privacy to the individuals on the list. Yep. Um, just a quick question since we're on uh, section number five, just so I'm clear on 5A uh, number four, we're talking about individuals have been placed on the exclusion list. Those are people we want on the exclusion list for certain reasons. But when you get down to B, I just want to make sure that those are the people who are reflected in item number one, the gaming licensee is identified as being not appropriate to receive marketing. Yeah, so I didn't include it in the reg because that information is publicly available, but I certainly can put it in if you prefer that it be in the reg as well. Yeah, it's a public list. Right. Yeah. You can check it in our website. But we could, we could, so setting this section aside, the way that it would be written now would be that the licensee provides a list including, uh, you know, everyone who's outlined here in one through three, all in one list to the junket enterprises and reps. And we could include, even though the information is otherwise available, we could also include people on the exclusion list if we prefer it all to be. Mm -hmm. in one place. We think it's to be specific. I mean, right. the information yep. is public, but I still would want it sure. to be that specific, and it doesn't really become a requirement of our licensee. It becomes a requirement of the junket operator to look to that list. Mm -hmm. so. yes. Belts and suspenders. I, I, um, I was wondering if the exclusion list incorporates uh, junket, so it only applies to the requirements of the reg on the exclusion list. Is places an onus only on the casino operators, not on I the junkets. I believe it's only on the casino operators. Well, then that would that would then point to Commissioner Stebbins' point of bringing the exclusion list into this. Right. Well, so it the no the the marketing restrictions for the junket enterprises and reps uh, already they do include that they can't market to anyone on the exclusion list. Uh, this would just be talking about the list, the actual list that they'd be receiving from the licensees. Uh -huh. So the restriction is already there, it's just how do we want the physical okay. list so they, to look. Okay. But uh, so to can't Commissioner identify. Stebbins' point, we might as well include might all of them in one place. Okay. Mm -hmm. The VSE list, um, it, obviously the, the MGC manages the voluntary self-exclusion list. That list is sent out to gaming licensees twice per week. Um, gaming licensees, um, it's explicit that they can't share that list beyond their other other casino properties that um, that they own. So they could share it with a, a uh, you know, Encore can share it with their property in Las Vegas, or um, Plain Ridge Park Casino can share it with other pin properties. But beyond, it's very explicit that 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 it ends right there. And so it would not allow them to share actively share that list with junkets. But I think that the the solution that that um, is presented. It's not sharing the list, but it's uh, the junkets are sharing the list uh, and removing the name. That's that's all good. And uh, the, just the, li the last point was talking about the exclusion list, not the voluntary oh, self-exclusion. Okay, I'm sorry. Just for just for the record, which is a public list. Right. Uh, it only has ten people or so, however many, and I see no harm in just including those ten people as well, as you point out, Commissioner. It, um, how, how do folks that uh, Encore exclusively doesn't want on the property, how does any of that information get shared? People who are, you know, have a trespassing order, I mean, those aren't people you want back on the property. How does that information potentially get shared with a junket operator or a licensee? It could all be a bigger list that um, that then that then uh, you know um, further alleviates the need for the you know the, the privacy issues. Plus, we would have confidentiality agreements embedded into our agreements with, with the junkets. Yeah, that sounds good. So we are. Looking, you're looking for a vote today to begin the regulatory process. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> Are there further questions for Carrie or Karen or Bruce or Mark? Anything you want I, to add, Bruce? You were kind of quiet. I'm back to the next <laughs> I actually just have um, 
a couple of questions just from the industry. Perhaps I can just direct to Bob and Jackie. Um, these, um, yes, please. You know, I'm Bob or, or Jackie. I think Mark is going to switch. Um, I just, I just like to understand a little bit more of the of the industry. Um, these um, re these representatives typically will want to market to people outside of um, Boston or Massachusetts. It's typically for the outside player. Uh, what is your sense? Does it does it even matter? Sure. Typically, in the industry, for uh, a place like ours, it would be folks that are outside of the bounds of the local region. It would be a little unusual to have a rep went right in your backyard. So it could be, and they're all over in major cities around um, the United States. You know, it could be someone from Chicago or Miami or wherever. And those are folks that typically traditionally don't want or not interested in working inside a casino operation but um, just no customers. And so um, this is very common in the industry. Um, as a matter of fact, there are uh, you know, reps that rep uh, win and Encore in Las Vegas. And I'm sure, actually many of them have already uh, said we'd love to do business in Massachusetts. Um, but, and so we said we would uh, you know, try to advance the, both the licensing and the uh, promulgate the regs uh, portion so they could get in business. But it's, yes, very common in the industry and usually it's outward coming uh, into us. And is, is it typical for a junket uh, representative to um, work with more than one operator? Yes, um, usually not in the same market. Right. So they usually they would have a preferred place in a particular jurisdiction is the norm. Mm -hmm. But sometimes multiple, it depends. Vegas is a little bit different. A place like ours, you know, it would be pretty much exclusive to us, I would believe. Thank you. Great, thanks. Excuse me, any further questions? Comments, do we have a motion for Councilor Troisi? Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for the amendment to 205 CMR 134.01 and the new regulation section 134.06 licensing and registration of employees, vendors, junket enterprises and representatives, and labor organizations as included in the packet. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4-0. Catherine, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move <coughs> that the Commission approve the version of the amendment to 205 CMR 134.01 and the new regulation <coughs> section 134.06 licensing and registration of employees, vendors, junket enterprises and representatives and labor organizations as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Um, sorry to interrupt. We may want to just modify the motion to uh, with the with as the amended <coughs> as amended at, yes. and as, as as amended at this hearing. Second that. Everyone else set up with that amendment. All right. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. Four zero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure In spirit. <laughs> I, I suspect it would, it would have been a five zero. <laughs> Thank you. I think that it makes sense now to, um, I'm looking at my, my timekeeper, Janice, does it make sense now for us to do a break? Could, uh, could we just, uh, in terms of the afternoon session, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest um, that when we come back, both for viewers' purposes and the Commission's readiness purposes, that we go to item number nine, um, which is the Responsible Research Gaming Magic Report. We have a guest who's traveled. Uh, that would give her the ability to present, leave, and then staff what they would fill up the rest of the agenda. Sounds good. I, I want to extend, though, an invitation for Rachel to stay for the rest of the meeting if she would like. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think that makes great sense. I saw that you were here, so thank you very much. Um, we will convene. It's 117, quarter of two. Is that okay? 145? 150? 150. Sure. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Austin. Uh, we are reconvening meeting number 276 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission today, September 12th, and we have skipped ahead on our agenda uh, to item number nine, research and responsible gaming. Director Vanderlyn, please. Great. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, before we dive into the agenda item, um, looking at the Massachusetts Gaming Impact Cohort Wave 3, I just wanted to mention uh, Responsible Gaming Education Week. Um, Responsible Gaming Education Week is September 16th to 20th. Uh, the theme this year is Watch Your Time and Have a Game Plan. Um, educational activities are being led by our GameSense advisors at, um, at each of the GameSense info centers at all three casinos. Uh, the MGCs partnered with the Mass Council on Compulsive Gambling um, and each of our licensees to promote the week via their social media platforms, in-house signage, and have purchased items um, to be used in the GameSense Info Center educational activities and prizes. One of them is a very nifty little watch to commemor commemorate Watch Your Time. Um, and uh, the licensees have purchased these and uh, GameSense advisors are distributing them at each of the casinos. Um, we, at the end of the week, typically what we do is we come back and we share some stories about uh, events that happened during the week and um, hope we can do that at a, a future meeting. Um, so the, the uh, presentation today, I'm joined uh, by Dr. Rachel Volberg. She's the principal investigator of, of this project and she's an, a uh, professor at UMass Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences. Um, I'm not going to give too much of an intro because she, I, her PowerPoint is excellent, but I will say this is, this is a unique project um, and the information that it provides um, is incredibly impactful. Um, prevalence studies take a look at a given point of, of time and can tell, you, can tell you the condition as it exists. I'm not, and are very valuable in their own right. This particular study, a cohort study, tracks individuals over the course of time. Um, why is this important? Because we can, we can kind of see how problem gambling, how at-risk gambling, how gambling in general progresses in an individual over the course of time. We can see how problem gambling um, progresses. We can see how it starts. We can see how people recover from, from at-risk or problem gambling. We can see um, what are the risk and protective factors um, that are associated in individuals um, to help begin to craft uh, very specific, very targeted prevention and intervention initiatives. Um, if we know what's, what are contributing factors to problem gambling, we can, we can address that. that. That puts us head and shoulders above. So, the Gaming Commission now has been um, investing in this study for, for several years. Um, and it's, it's especially now, and with each, each wave of this study, um, we get more and more valuable information, more and more specific information that can be used by the Gaming Commission, by the Department of Public Health, by, um, by other state agencies, and by other stakeholders generally um, to help them better understand um, this issue. So um, I hope that tees it up, and I'm going to just now turn it over to Dr. Wolberg. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you very much, Mark. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Madam Good Chair. Afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. It's been quite a while since I have presented to the Commission. I was trying to think when the last time was. I think it was the summary uh, integrative report that we presented in December last year. Um, so it's a pleasure to be back in Boston and to be appearing before you. So as, as Mark uh, indicated, uh, I'm going to be presenting today on the results of um, the cohort study. Uh, this is going to be looking at results from the first three waves of uh, data from the cohort. Uh, we actually uh, have um, additional data that we'll be hoping to present in early 2020, uh, which will incorporate the next wave, wave four of the study. And we just came out of the field with wave five of the study um, a little bit earlier this summer. So, you know, it's, the, the data is piling up and we are um, finally being able to sort of push out 
um, what some of the really intriguing results are. So since it's been a while and since um, we have at least uh, two members of the commission who haven't seen uh, any of this material before, I thought I would go back to basics. Um, I want to start by uh, giving you some definitions and, and talking through a few key terms. Um, it, it's a it's a very scientific, very scientific -y, um, sort of report. So um, I think it's probably helpful to understand what some of the basic things are that we're trying to understand. I want to give you some background on how the study came to be. Uh, give you uh, a, a sense of our current status and then move into the findings and implications and future directions. So if I'm, if I'm talking too fast, <laughs> please slow me down. Um, I've, I've given the front part of this talk a couple of times, um, both to the commission and then to the Public Health Trust Fund. So, you know, just slow me down if I'm talking a little too fast. So Mark indicated um, in his introduction uh, that there's a, a difference between um, what's called a, a prevalence uh, study and what is now what we are looking at today, which is a cohort study. Um, the, the surveys that we're doing under the social and economic impacts of Gamley in Massachusetts study are what are called repeat cross-sectional studies. So they take snapshots at given points in time, but they are not the same people in, in the sample. So it's not the same people in each snapshot. The, the value of a cohort study is when you're following the same people over a period of time, they're all exposed to the same uh, issue of importance that, that you want to understand um, what is affecting their behavior. So in this case, we are collecting uh, information from the same people um, as they all experience the introduction of casino gambling in Massachusetts. And the reason that's important is because it gives you much greater um, power to uh, make causal attributions. So you can actually um, because you can see how their behavior changes over time, you can look at something that precedes a change in their behavior and be much more confident that that change in their behavior is attributable to something that is behind them in time. So <laughs> Mark asked me when we were getting ready, he said, are you going to have your bathtubs? And I, I was like, oh, yes, absolutely. I have to have my bathtubs. Um, prevalence of problem gambling is something that um, generally everyone's concerned about when you are talking about expansion of gambling. And um, from, uh, from the point of view of public health and from epidemiology specifically, uh, that, that prevalence rate, it tells you like what the level of the water is in your bathtub. What it doesn't tell you is anything about what is affecting the, that level of water. So if you think about um, you know, sort of who's in the water at any one time, um, you want to, when you're developing services for those people, um, it's important to know if it's the same people that are in that bathtub at all times, or if there's some kind of exchange such that you know, there's people who have had gambling problems but not for very long, or you know, if it's all the same people in the bathtub, those are people who have um, chronic unremitting gambling problems and um, usually are considered by treatment professionals to be much more complicated cases and much more expensive to treat. So the, the, the water level is your prevalence rate, but then your incidence rate is the number of new cases or the new people that are flowing into your bathtub. And then there's ways, there's a couple of different ways that water can leave the bathtub. So there's different plugs that you can pull. Um, one is uh, if, um, if people uh, leave the population because they've died or if they've moved out of the jurisdiction, they're no longer part of your prevalence rate. Um, another is if, and if this is the second bathtub because I couldn't find a bathtub that did both of these in one picture. 
but another way for people to leave the the um, the the group that are uh, that are creating your prevalence rate is if they recover from a gambling problem. So that's sort of like evaporation out of your bathtub. Um, and then there's also the issue of um, particularly people who've had a gambling problem in the past are more vulnerable to um, developing a problem again. And so uh, we're very interested in the rate of recurrence. Um, you know, people who had a gambling problem at time one didn't have a gambling problem at time two, but then have a gambling problem at time three. Again, these are um, very important uh, pieces of information to know in terms of crafting effective and efficient um, interventions. Um, th another term that uh, I like to make sure people understand or at least try to help them understand is the term etiology. And etiology is a specific area of um, public health research. It's concerned with the causation of a particular condition, and in this case, um, how problem gambling develops and fluctuates over time. What etiology lets us do is identify the risk factors and the protective factors. And these, in, in some cases, um, these factors can, uh, can be modified. So you can modify people's behavior, you can um, change things in their environment um, such that uh, you, you prevent the, their progression from uh, being engaged in gambling to experiencing gambling harm to then having a gambling problem. So moving on into uh, a little bit of background, um, there were uh, quite a number of uh, small-scale cohort studies of gambling and problem gambling that were conducted in the 1990s for the most part. And they all had uh, some serious limitations. Um, because of their size, they tended to have very small numbers of problem gamblers enrolled in them, uh, which limited uh, the robustness of the findings because they were, there were just a few people that were sort of in the study for uh, a, a, a while. Um, and they were all quite circumscribed in terms of time. In other words, they went from anywhere from two to five years. And what that means is that um, you might have uh, good information for those people, but there's not very many of them, and you have good information for those people, but it's for a very short period of time. So you don't know what sort of the longer stretch of their experience might be. The limitations of those early studies um, led to the launch of a number of much larger scale cohort studies in four countries. Um, and this slide shows you some uh, details about those four studies. Um, I'm not gonna spend very much time on this. I just wanted to give you an indication that two of the studies, um, the two in, uh, in Canada, in Alberta and in Ontario, um, were all headed up uh, by Rob Williams, who's our uh, co-principal investigator on the on the cohort <coughs> here, and the Swedish, uh, Australian, and New Zealand study were all studies that I was involved in. So when Rob and I uh, were putting our proposal together to do the cohort study here in Massachusetts, um, we pretty much had a uh, a bird's eye view of all the mistakes and all the challenges that these other studies had run into and we were able to build I think a much better mousetrap as a result of um, that experience with those with those large-scale studies earlier on. So moving on to uh, Massachusetts specifically um, it may surprise all of you to know that there actually have been no major cohort studies of gambling in the United States. Um, Massachusetts is the very first one. Um, another unique feature of the cohort study in Massachusetts is that uh, the change in gambling availability while this study is underway is going to be much greater than for any of the other cohort studies that were conducted internationally. 
because of the introduction of casinos during the time that we are um, interviewing people, that's a, that's a very significant change in the gambling landscape and it's occurring right in the middle of when we are um, involved with these people. The, as I indicated uh, just a minute ago, um, because we sort of knew all the challenges uh, that these other studies had been, uh, had encountered, uh, we were able to address those limitations, but we were also able to be much more efficient uh, because we were building on uh, what had been found in these previous studies, so we didn't have to ask every single question we really were able to target in. And then because the um, cohort was actually uh, built from uh, people who had participated in our baseline general population survey for Sigma. Uh, we actually are very synergistic across the two studies, and we've been able to use data from Sigma to triangulate on what we see happening with the cohort study, and we've been able to take uh, data from MAGIC to understand what we're seeing um, in, the, in the impact study. So the Massachusetts Gambling Impact Cohort Study, or MAGIC, um, which some people hate that name, but um, we actually, we, 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 we liked it ourselves, and then it turned out that um, all of our participants in the study really like it as well. They, they, they feel, they've really taken um, great pleasure in being a member of the cohort. Uh, every time we go out for data collection, I, I get many, many phone calls and, and phone messages from people in the cohort, like, where's my questionnaire, and aren't you supposed to be out in the field again? <laughs> and so it, they're, they're, very, um, they're very invested in the study, uh, but the study actually has um, three specific goals. So the first one is to examine incidents. Uh, and again, that's the, the water flowing into the bathtub. Um, the population that, or the proportion of the population that newly develops a condition over a specified period of time. And the reason this is important to understand is because new cases and relapsing cases require a different mix of services to be effective. The second goal of the cohort study is to examine stability and transitions associated with problem gambling, and I'm going to be able to talk a little bit about that uh, today. And then the, the third and largest goal is to develop a full etiological model of problem gambling in Massachusetts to identify the risk and protective factors and to enable uh, the development of um, strategies to um, you know, to promote those protective factors and to minimize the risks. So this very busy little slide um, tells you something about our current status. Uh, as I indicated, wave one uh, was actually our baseline general population survey. The full sample of 9,578, uh, we uh, selected about half of those people for, to be invited to uh, join the cohort. Um, we selected 100% of five um, high-risk strata, and then a third of our remaining respondents were um, from, uh, from our low-risk, one low-risk stratum. Wave two is actually where we established the cohort. Um, we went out in the field in uh, 2015 and completed uh, data collection later that year and the established cohort was 3,139 people. Dr. Bilberg, how, um, you mentioned that this is the first major um, cohort study. Cohort study. Cohort. How do you define um, major? Is it uh, in, in terms of size. Is it, yeah, in terms of size. Yeah. So is it a percentage of, because uh, I saw, for instance, Australia had 15,000 and now we have 3,000. Can you just, just Yeah, that? so, um, because that's the, a great statistic, so we just want to be clear. Sure. So um, a, a major cohort study would be a, a sample that included several thousand people or more. Um, in the case of Australia, they uh, interviewed uh, 15,000 people for their baseline survey, similar to the almost right. 10,000 that we had in our baseline survey. 
and, and then they followed up with about 7,000 of those people who actually stayed in the cohort for a number of years. So we had about a, a, a third, right, of ours? So, yeah, so we had about two-thirds of the people in our, uh, we had about two-thirds of the size of the Australian baseline sub survey in our baseline survey. Um, we had about a half of right. the size of the Australian cohort in our cohort. Um, I, I would just note that um, there was, that in, in your remarks, there were five major studies which you were all involved in, mm -hmm. um, which is, is also a major one, not just because of the size, um, but also the other elements that you described, which is the major introduction of casinos, right. um, is one that is really unique. Uh, it is, in, yeah. That, that we are going to straddle, be that we straddle between, because we started with the baseline before, which is the first wave, before the introduction of casinos, and we're now going to see the effects of those introductions. Um, and another another piece that's unique is that it's uh, the first cohort altogether, small or major, in the United States when it comes to gambling, and that's so also very important. Small as well, because okay. Thank well, you. It, it, well, because it, there has not been any other cohort studies right. on gambling in Mass in uh, the United States. Yeah, and and one of the things that that I wasn't planning to go on in into a lot of detail, but one of the reasons that we're able to um, to have a cohort of this size um, and still be able to get all of the value out of the exercise that we that we hope for is that um, we we purposely oversampled um, for people who would be at risk for developing a problem. One of the challenges of those earlier cohort studies was that um, the, they all tried in different ways to over-recruit problem people who would develop a gambling problem. Um, but uh, in Australia, for example, the the um, the difficulty or the one of the challenges that they ran into was they had to have a very large baseline general population survey. The strategy that they took to over-recruit for people who might develop a gambling problem was they over-recruited in geographic areas where there were a lot of gaming machines, and it turned out that that was not a great strategy for getting people into the cohort who would transition. So they ended up having far fewer transitions. Look, so to be able to look at people changing is one of the things that gives a study of like this power. And so we over-recruited for people that we thought would change. And in fact, we have been, um, successful in doing that. So wave, th oh, Mark, did you have something? No, okay. So um, wave three uh, was fielded um, a year after wave two. Um, we were able to get um, about uh, two thirds of uh, the folks who joined us in wave two uh, to um, complete the, the questionnaire in wave three. We then had a hiatus, uh, so wave four actually went out in 2018, but we um, have been uh, able to maintain the size of the cohort pretty well um, at about 2,400. Um, we just were talking with the data collection uh, folks about um, wave five. They're getting ready to deliver wave five to us, and they told us that, that um, they're pretty sure that we're going to be just over 2,400 um, for the sample size for wave five. And we have in our um, deliverables for uh, fiscal year 20 going out with wave six uh, next, next spring. So I would have to say that um, the Massachusetts cohort study at this point with, what, with all of the work that we have planned through fiscal year 2020 is already the longest lasting cohort study that has been carried out internationally. Um, I also would like to just mention that I never in a million years expected that we would start a cohort study in Massachusetts prior to the opening of all of the casinos. And it was the commission's vision, I think, um, to have this cohort start very, very early in the process of introducing casino gambling to Massachusetts 
that I think in the end um, is going to serve all of us in the Commonwealth um, because it really is going to be um, a, a unique in the world opportunity to understand the impacts of an introduction of this scale uh, of gambling um, into a population. Actually, I just wanted to add to that. It's, it, it wasn't really the wisdom of the commission, although you are all very wise. Um, it, was, it was outlined in statute, section 71 specifically, <laughs> specifically called for. Come on, Mark. Right, there, there absolutely was. It, it was decided that the, it was a requirement in section 71 um, that called for the research agenda. But the commission um, made a very wise decision to say, if we really want to understand what is the, what is the impact of the casinos on the progression of, of gambling and problem gambling, so we can really understand the etiology, let's launch it now. Um, and so that's, that's uh, we launched it very early compared to, to perhaps when we would have necessarily needed to. So kudos to everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to spend uh, very much time on this slide uh, because everybody hates uh, waiting except a very small number of people in the biostatistics department of my, of my school. Uh, yeah, I think um, I was going to tell you to cut this to slide. To cut this slide. <laughs> yeah. We only, we only use waiting to adjust um, the data in, in calculating the incidence rate so that we can be more confident about generalizing to the adult population of Massachusetts. We don't use weighting for anything else uh, in this study, but we do use weighting for all of our other population studies. So unfortunately, we do have to acknowledge how we weight and um, so that other uh, researchers can um, delve into the data eventually and, um, and understand what we did and see if they agree with it. So this slide um, lays out on the left-hand side. This tells you the um, strata that we sampled from, uh, from the uh, baseline general population survey. Um, so we took 100% of the people in the baseline survey who were problem gamblers, 100% of the at-risk gamblers, 100% of the people who spent um, $100, a month, $100 a month or more on gambling, and those who gambled weekly, and then we had a small group of um, people, uh, military veterans who had served since 9-11, uh, since uh, who had very high rates of problem gambling in the um, baseline general population survey, and we felt that it was important to include them as a specific stratum, and then all of the other participants in the baseline survey. Um, the next column over gives you the sample size and then the, uh, the achieved cohort. Those are the people that we actually were able to complete interviews with in wave two. And um, you can see that there's somewhat different uh, response rates by group, but overall uh, we recruited 65% uh, of the people that we selected from our, from our uh, baseline survey. Rachel, is this strat all mutually exclusive or can somebody be uh, somebody who gambles weekly and spends, let's say, $1,200 annually? Yeah, so basically um, we took all the problem gamblers first and then we took all the at-risk gamblers because they were mutually exclusive groups. And uh -huh. then anybody who gambled uh, $100 a month or more but wasn't an at-risk gambler or a problem gambler. You start to add them the up. Next it's a cumulative add up. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So then by the time you get down to military service 9-11 or 2001 after, those are the, those are the um, veterans that were in the sample but who had not been caught in any of the other In any strata. one of the top. Yeah. Is that what you were? That's exactly the, yeah, okay. what I was asking. Um, we use a uh, multimodal uh, strategy uh, in uh, data collection for wave one and wave two, well, with wave two, when we recruited the, the cohort itself, we used the same approach that we had used with the baseline general population survey, initially inviting people to participate online, a self-administered online questionnaire. And then if they ignored us, we sent them 
a self-administered hard copy questionnaire a couple of times. And then if they still ignored us, if we had a telephone number for them, which we did for about 80% of the people, um, we actually called them and tried to complete an interview by phone. Um, we've changed a little bit uh, for wave three and, um, and more recent waves. Uh, we initially invite them to complete online. Uh, then um, if they don't complete online within a period of time, we invite them to, or we send them a self-administered questionnaire. And then if they still haven't responded, we, we don't try to complete an interview by phone anymore, but we do some telephone prompting to try and get people to complete one or the other of the two ways. And part of the reason for that is um, it's less expensive because you don't have to train telephone interviewers and do telephone interviews. But also it, it means that um, all of the data for wave three and forward is self-administered. So there's no, there's, there's much less likely, likelihood of social desirability biasing the, the data. So I presume it's effective, the prompt. Yes. Yeah. We, we usually get, we get a lot of people who, um, who want to complete the self-administered questionnaire. And so when we send out the, you know, the initial letter, you know, it's the next wave of magic, you know, here's your online, your, 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 your code to, you know, to get in and complete online. And that's when I get all of these phone calls from the participants saying, I don't want to complete online. I, I'm waiting for my questionnaire. Like, when is the questionnaire coming out? And so I have to have, and we, we have quite a few conversations with folks who are like, I don't have a computer and I'm, I, can't com I can't do this online. I'm like, yes, we know. We'll be sending out the, you know, the questionnaire comes about four weeks after the initial letter. Um, so another very important piece of uh, stuff that we have to do is we have to make sure that the same people are participating in the, uh, in the study. Um, and we do a lot of work with each wave um, to match participants across waves. And so what, what this slide shows you is that across the, the various waves, um, we've got, um, we actually had a small number of people, about 44, in w who, who joined the cohort in wave two when we started it but had actually not been the same person at that address who had completed our interview uh, for the baseline survey. But they completed our interview for the cohort study, so we're like, okay, now you're in the cohort. Um, now we're gonna keep you. Uh, they just, for whatever reason, I mean, you know, maybe somebody had moved out of the household and, and somebody said, oh, I'll finish this, and didn't pay attention to the instructions that this had to be the person who had completed last time. So we, we take a lot of um, time to um, basically match people across uh, gender, age, race, ethnicity, and level of education. Um, those are the four variables that we use to match participants across waves. Um, so you can see what that does is it affects the size of the group that we have available for analysis. But we're in wave three, we're at about uh, 2,450 people who um, have participated with us in all three of the waves. And then this is, this is a, a nice little map that I like to sort of use to demonstrate that um, this is where the addresses that we, um, that we know the cohort uh, participants live at. Um, there's a star on the map for each of the addresses that we mail um, advance letters to. And um, I like the fact that it looks pretty representative of the distribution of the population of Massachusetts, including just a couple of people out there on the islands. So now actually getting into some data for you. Um, I have my glasses because I want to make sure I read this properly. So this first uh, slide here on the results um, shows uh, changes in gambling participation across the three waves of the um, study to date. And I just want to clarify for you that this is what's called a pairwise comparison. So this means you're looking at the same, the same people 
answering the same questions at three different points in time. Okay, it's, and, and again, it's, um, it's, it's much more powerful in, in understanding change if it's the same people answering the same question and you're comparing their behavior in wave one to, their, to that same person's behavior in wave two to that same person's behavior in wave three. So this is unweighted data. We're not attempting to represent the general population. We're looking at the 2,428 people who completed all three waves and completed all of enough of the questions in all three waves for us to include them in this, in this graphic. Um, the, the analysis of the results um, shows that from wave two to wave, to, I'm sorry, from wave one to wave two, there was a significant increase in the uh, proportion of people in the cohort who participated in daily lottery games and a significant increase in people who uh, bet on sports and those who uh, wagered privately amongst themselves. Uh, however, the magnitude of these changes was uh, quite small. In looking at wave two to wave three, there were significant increases in uh, daily lottery uh, participation and in online gambling participation. However, both of these changes um, were the result not of actual changes in behavior, but changes, uh, they, were, they were due to what we thought were very minor changes in how we asked the questions. And in fact, people are quite sensitive to exactly how you answer the questions. So it gave us real insight into how careful we have to be in every wave of the survey or every wave of the study to um, not change the questions if we want to be able to compare to previous waves. So it's not that we're not going to change any questions, it's just we have to be very careful when we change questions and not try to attribute any change to, um, you know, to their behavior when we know that we changed the wording of that question. In the, in the case of daily lottery, we felt it was important to be as up to date as possible, so we, we actually added just the, the names of two new uh, monitor games that had come online since the beginning of the study, and that led to that increase in daily lottery play. It was, it was that small of a change. Um, so we just, it, it made us very vigilant um, about uh, looking at uh, changes that we see across waves and making sure that we can confidently attribute any changes that we see uh, to, you know, their actual behavior or reporting of their behavior rather than, you know, something that we've done to try to be, you know, more reflective of what the current situation looks like. The, oh, the casino. Oh, yes. Um, that's right. <laughs> that was the most important finding. <laughs> um, so uh, you'll see uh, on the, the sort of third set of bars that um, there was a significant decrease, and it's a statistically significant decrease in the uh, proportion of uh, participants in the study who had gambled at an out-of-state casino in the past year. So it went from about 33, 32% in wave one, it was 33% in wave one, 32% in wave two, and then it went down to 22% in wave three. Wave three, the data were collected um, after the opening of the slot parlor. And so this finding um, triangulates very well with um, information that we have from the Plain, Plain Ridge Park Casino cohort, um, patron survey, excuse me, um, where uh, we were able to ascertain that um, a very significant number of the people who were patronizing Plain Ridge Park Casino in that first year actually would have spent their money gambling at an out-of-state casino if Plain Ridge Park had not opened. So this was very nice corroborating evidence of um, the success 
uh, in recapturing um, Massachusetts gambling dollars that were leaving Massachusetts and going elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Well, this is the stuff that I like. <laughs> so, um, so this this is unweighted data, but it is um, basically uh, looking at the numbers of people in the cohort who um, had a status um, at wave one, and then their status at wave two, and then the, the table below is their status at wave two, followed by their status at wave three. Um, this is just a, uh, basically uh, an accounting table to tell you where every, every one of the 3,139 people uh, fell um, from wave one to wave two, and then wave two to wave three. More significant is um, the incidence and remission uh, table here, tables. And um, we've presented these data both in terms of unweighted data, which is the actual cohort, and then the weighted data to give you an idea of how many people uh, in the state of Massachusetts are represented by uh, the, the, the number of people in each of the rows. So, um, my slides are very small. Oh, that's very helpful, thank you. So you can see that the, um, the incidence rate is, um, is calculated by the number of people who go from no, not being a problem gambler in wave one to being a problem gambler in wave two, divided by the, um, the, all the people that, are, um, that were not problem gamblers in wave one, um, but, and, and, and so you add the 2493 and the 60 together, that's your denominator. Um, similarly, with the weighted, um, you add uh, the no, no, and the no, yes together, and that's your denominator for um, the people who are incident or going from not being a problem gambler in wave one to being a problem gambler in wave two. Below that um, is what's called um, the way you calculate the remission rate is these are the people who were problem gamblers in wave one and looking at their status in wave two. So you've got, and, and this is interesting and, and important to know, you've got about um, half of the people who were problem gamblers in wave one transitioning to not being a problem gambler in wave two. Um, at risk. But maybe at risk, yeah. Um, and probably are at a little bit of heightened risk because they were problem gamblers at wave one. So we know they had been problem gamblers in the past, but then they weren't at that level when we interviewed them in, uh, in, in 2015. Um, and then down below that is the same table, but for the, um, the uh, cohort from wave two to wave three. So you've got an incidence rate that's um, quite a bit lower, uh, and we know that there were some um, there were some uh, recruitment differences between the the recruitment uh, for the baseline survey. We we basically told people it was a health and recreation survey because we didn't want to over recruit people who were enthusiastic gamblers. If you tell people it's a gambling survey, you get a lot of gamblers. Um, so by the time we recruited them into the cohort, we were being much more honest <laughs> or straightforward, and they, they knew from the baseline that it was a gambling survey, um, and then they agreed to let us contact them again, and when we did, we told them it was a gambling study. And so we think we actually over-recruited gamblers, and, and that probably contributed um, to the somewhat higher incidence rate that we have from wave one to wave two. From wave two to wave three, the incidence um, is about is, is quite a bit lower, uh, but it's now reflective of um, what's actually going on with this cohort, and it's also very similar um, in terms of uh, the other cohort studies that um, that we've uh, been involved with and are aware of. Um, this is about 
um, it's certainly within the ballpark of what we've seen in other jurisdictions. Um, but again, uh, the remission rate is, is still um, quite high. That is about um, almost half of the people uh, who were problem gamblers in wave two then transitioned to not being a problem gambler in wave three. So moving on into the issue of stability and change, um, this is very similar to what we've seen in other jurisdictions. Um, recreational gamblers tend to stay recreational gamblers. They're, they're not very likely to, um, to change. They're the least likely group to change. Um, Non-gamblers, about half of them remained in that category across all three waves. Uh, but a little over half of them actually moved into um, a higher category. So most of them moved into being recreational gamblers, but a few actually moved into being at risk or problem gamblers. Um, problem and pathological gamblers, about a third of them remained in that category across the three waves, so there's quite a bit of movement. And then at risk gamblers were the most likely to change status across the three waves of the study to this point. Then there was another uh, very interesting group of people who moved in and out of risk categories across waves. So for some people, they experienced a decrease in risk category. Um, you know, certainly uh, the proportion of problem gamblers, the, the, the two-thirds of problem gamblers who moved out of problem gambling, many of them moved to an at-risk category but quite a few of them also moved even further down to uh, recreational gambling. There were also individuals who experienced an increase in risk category, so they moved up the continuum. And then there was this very interesting group of people who like went back and forth. So they either went up and then came down, or they you know, went down and then came back up. Um, and each of these groups you know, is, is interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, but in, in, in the current instance, it's, what's most interesting is the amount of movement because typically or conventionally problem gambling has been viewed as a chronic and unremitting disorder. And to see this, this amount of movement is really pretty surprising. Um, and, and, and has implications for you know, the kinds of um, messaging that you might want to do to people, but also has implications for the kinds of services that you might want to roll out. Do you have something? Yeah, I, I, I think that that's, that's really where the rubber hits the road, is, the, is trying to take this data and interpret it in a way that um, we, can, we can use it we can um, begin to think about resource allocation. We can think about messaging. If we think about game sense, um, understanding that at-risk and problem gamblers are actually moving around, um, to me, gives me a lot of hope that um, there, there are things that we can do within that environment that will hopefully assist people to, to move down that continuum to be, to be recreational gamblers. And if recreational gamblers are the most stable group there, um, we, it reinforces the idea that we need to provide a different type of information that hopefully maintains this group as recreational gamblers. Yeah. What, was there, um, uh, maybe you'll get to this later or, or in the details of the report, but um, um, is there something to discern between um, the differences between those that decrease in risk category versus those that increase? in the risk category? I know you talk about protective factors or risk factors. Our um, next report. That's the next report? <laughs> that's the next yeah. report coming in. So we're, we're currently analyzing all of these data plus wave four. Yeah. And what we're going to do um, with that next report is we're going to look specifically at the risk and protective factors. That is, what are the variables that um, that you see in wave one that, or see in wave one that predict uh, status in wave two, what are the variables that you see in wave two that predict status in wave three, um, and basically, you know, what are the variables that predict an increase 
in, um, in severity versus what are the variables that predict a decrease in severity. So we'll have four, we'll, we'll have one, two, three, we, one to two, two to three, three to, we'll have three transitions for each of the members of the cohort, which will give us a lot more statistical power. And then with each uh, new wave of the, of the study, um, we'll be able to add to that, that power of the analysis. Um, and, and then the other piece that's going to come in um, with uh, wave five, but then even more with wave six, is we will be post-casino introduction. And then we'll be able to go back and take a look at are there differences in what predicts transitions from before the casinos opened to after the casinos opened? And that, again, will be a very unique and one of its kind um, areas to explore. So I'm not going to spend any Can time. Can you just remind us how long the sorry? timing is for these waves? So when we call somebody a recreational gambler or non-gambler, what's the um, the time frame in terms of amount of time for the stability? So for the for for one year. So every each, all the, so each one is really a year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let me try and get through this discussion fairly expeditiously. Um, so we did see small increases in gambling participation, uh, but the changes that we saw in wave two to, from wave two to three, I think I, I, I went through this, um, were actually uh, due to changes in how the questions were phrased. Um, it is notable uh, that out-of-state gambling decreased significantly. I'm sorry, out-of-state casino gambling. I need to be specific about that. Um, decreased significantly, and we do think it um, triangulates well with other data that we have from Sigma uh, to um, suggest that the slot parlor uh, does seem to have been successful in uh, recapturing Massachusetts residents who had been gambling at out-of-state casinos. The problem gambling uh, incidence rate from wave one to wave two uh, was quite high, as I indicated, but is due to, uh, is subject to some uh, methodological limitations. And uh, the incidence rate at, from wave two to three declined, uh, and remission was quite substantial. So, um, so the, the equal size of those groups um, is very interesting in terms of uh, the implications for services. Um, okay, so the second set of bullets here, uh, I wanted to just draw your attention to one of the differences between um, the 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 amount of transitioning that we've that we've seen in the Massachusetts cohort um, <clears throat> is, is much higher uh, than uh, transitions that were observed in some of the other uh, studies. Uh, for for example, in Victoria, only 4% of the uh, participants in that cohort study actually transitioned down over the course of their entire study, and almost 6% transitioned up. Whereas in, uh, in the Massachusetts study, just even in the first three waves, so the Victoria study was five waves, um, it, in Massachusetts, we already have 13% of um, our uh, uh, participants who've transitioned down. We have 15% who've transitioned up and 13% who've moved at both wave two and wave three. So that's just a, a significantly higher um, rate of movement and we think what it reflects is our um, success in recruiting people who are at high risk for movement. Um, we we mm. think the sampling strategy that we used has actually su been successful. What, what about the possibility that the one in Victoria, at least, or some of the others, were mature gaming markets, that it's precisely the introduction the cas of casinos that may be created, creating this volatility? Well, but this is, all of these transitions um, are before uh, anything except the slot parlor. Uh -huh. in, in Massachusetts. That's right. But you're right. The, um, the results in Victoria 
um, are very much reflective of a, of a very mature gaming market with very widely distributed gaming machines in particular in many, many different venues. Um, we saw a very different um, mix of um, incident and remitting cases in Sweden, for example. Most of the uh, new cases in Sweden, in, in the Swedish cohort study, were new cases. Um, they, they hadn't had a previous history of gambling problems, so it wasn't, a, there were far fewer people who remitted um, in Sweden. So there, there's different things that are going on in different jurisdictions and different gaming markets. Um, so, again, it, it's not just a question of, um, you know, sort of identifying transitions, but there's a number of possible reasons for the differences. Again, the maturity of the gaming market. Um, there's also a good possibility that some of the uh, differences may be due to how problem gambling was measured in the different studies. Um, we use the, the PPGM in Massachusetts. Uh, in most of the other studies, they use the Canadian Problem Gambling Index. Um, it may also be due to the somewhat longer um, inter-assessment period from wave one to wave two. Um, some of you may recall that we had to wait until uh, the referendum to... Um, to uh, the next wave. We had to wait until the referendum uh, was decided uh, in 2014 before uh, we could go ahead with um, data collection on the cohort. Um, so there the was first, a, that was the first wave or the second wave? Well, so that was wave two when we when we established right. the cohort. We the had cohort. to wait until after we knew there were going to be casinos yep. in Massachusetts to yep. proceed with the study. We did. Um, and then I, I think I'm leaning more and more towards this, this last one, which is the cohort in Massachusetts just has a much higher proportion of individuals who were selected to be at high risk for transitioning, and that's exactly what we're seeing. I'm, I'm struck by that issue because uh, I'm not an academic mm -hmm. or scientist, and I, I would have thought that you would skew to make sure you're neutral in those things, but you're saying that you actually recruited for that, and I, and I thought I understood it at the beginning, but maybe I didn't, so now are you suggesting that that does that impact you negatively on your conclusions, or does it just support your theory? No, it, it actually provides us with much more uh, information, ultimately, about what is, what, what is causing those transitions to happen. And that, in, in the end, gives you much greater power. That, you, yeah, you had mentioned that at the beginning, so that's what. So that's why we knew we wanted to over-recruit people who would transition. And, that and we anticipated that they would transition towards problem gambling. Um, but we, we now are also seeing that there's a lot more movement back and forth um, than we had actually and, anticipated. And you get, you get um, information that will benefit you in a different way, even though you can't do direct comparisons to other studies that have been done around the world. Yeah, I mean, we always want to look at what else, you know, at, at what other uh, research uh, studies of a similar kind have right. found because you want to sort of benchmark. Exactly. Um, but the Massachusetts study is, is really unique in a lot of ways, and, and I, I really have to pay tribute to all of the people that, that conducted those earlier um, cohort studies because you know, I, I participated in, in several of them, and, and Rob Williams contributed, um, obviously, to, to the other two. Um, but we were really able to strengthen uh, the design of, of what we uh, proposed in Massachusetts based on what had been learned okay. uh, in those other jurisdictions. Richer data. Yeah. Richer and yeah. more powerful. Yeah. Uh, my recollection of the oversampling of um, at risk and problem gambling on, on wave two um, was really driven, and this is what I recall, but you know, you're, you're being more nuanced, is driven by the fact that the incidence um, is really small compared to the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. So we, if, we, if we simply sample according to the population and we lose people which we anticipated that, that the cohort does, because eventually time works against you in the cohort, 
we risk losing the key people that we want to study to the point of not being able to ascertain much from them. Um, so I, th I think yours is a lot more nuanced in terms of talking about the volatility of this risk um, group. Um, but at least from my perspective, it was also practical in terms of the longevity of the cohort itself, that we needed to keep it richer initially because we are prone to lose people, gamblers at risk and non-gamblers, along the way. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. What have I got here? Oh, so this is something that, that um, many people find surprising, I think. Uh, but there's good research across all of the addictive disorders, alcohol, um, illicit drugs, uh, and gambling now, uh, which suggests that these disorders actually are much less stable than had historically been thought. Um, there are many, many alcoholics and, and, and drug users uh, in the general population who you know, remit for a while or who stop using for a while. Um, and similarly, there are people who, you know, become concerned about their gambling and decide to stop gambling for a while or decide to cut back on their gambling for a while. Um, so, um, the, the chronic, yeah. <laughs> I either need my glasses or bigger slides. Um, Right, so um, the, the interesting thing about um, the, one of the interesting things about this instability is that there are people in the population who are chronic, not in the sense that they have long-standing unremitting problems, of, although there are some that are like that, but in the sense that they are at a higher risk um, at any given point in time for a relapse. Okay, so once you've had a gambling problem, you know, you are more vulnerable for having a gambling problem in the future. Similarly to if you've, you know, overcome an alcohol problem, um, you know, and circumstances in your life change, you're, you're more vulnerable to going back to that pattern of behavior than someone who had never been there in the first place. And then it's also important to understand that, um, that that, there, that people who are experiencing addiction tend not to have unremitting manifestations. That is, they go back and forth, sometimes quite often, and to the extent that you can keep them from, you know, moving towards the more severe end of the spectrum and keep them sort of on the safe side of the spectrum, um, you know, that is a long-term contribution to their personal health but also to their community's health. Um, there are, is are you, can, can you, um, are you, for example, thinking about the progression down from not, uh, from um, casual gamblers to risk, at risk gamblers or from at right, risk gamblers? Right, so to, to, to increasing severity. So, yeah. you, I mean, the, the, the whole notion of effective prevention is to keep people from sliding. moving along the continuum, from sliding down to that severe end. So, you know, the more you can keep people on this side, um, the better off ultimately you are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the rest of this slide. It more speaks to um, sort of the, the psychiatric or the, the clinical issues related to disordered gambling in the DSM-5. Um, I do want to talk briefly about the limitations. Um, any good scholar <laughs> has to acknowledge that every study has its limitations. Um, we don't think that we were um, successful in accounting for all of the sampling biases uh, when we developed the weighting scheme. Um, but that becomes less and less of an issue because now there's only one thing that we're using the weighting for, which is the incidence rate. Um, individuals who were recruited into the cohort were aware by the time they were recruited into the cohort um, that it was a gambling study, and so their decision to participate may have been shaped by the fact that they liked to gamble or were interested in gambling. Uh, the there is uh, research to show that um, 
people who are asked to reflect on a regular basis about their behavior uh, may actually um, improve their behavior just because they're reflecting on it. Um, and also some social desirability to show improvement to the researchers, although we've tried to address that by uh, making sure that um, all of our respond or all of our participants now um, are self-administering the questionnaire, so there's no interviewer bias um, that's inter interfering there. And then um, observed changes over time are sensitive to the reliability of the measurement instrument, meaning, you know, <laughs> any any sort of device that you use to measure something, you know comes with some sort of confidence interval around it. Um, and some instruments are more precise than others. We use the most precise instrument we can, but it is still an instrument and it still has measurement error. So my last few slides here um, are in terms of implications for prevention and treatment. Um, I indicated uh, with my bathtub slides, I think, that a stable prevalence rate over time can be due to at least to, to two of, of, or one of two possibilities. Um, either you've got ongoing, unremitting problem gamblers in the same individuals, or you've got a rate of new cases that's roughly equal to the rate of cases that are remitting. And that seems to be the situation that we have in Massachusetts. The um, second one or both? Well, we don't know yet about the, whether the prevalence rate is stable or not. But we do know that we've got a rate of new cases that's roughly equal to the rate of remitting cases, both in wave one to two and wave two to three. Those two scenarios have very different implications. Um, if, P if problem gambling is chronic and new cases are uncommon, then you really want to devote resources to treatment to get those people to, um, to get them some help and to get them to um, and particularly to get them to help in terms of remitting. However, if incidence and recovery or remission are both high, um, you want a greater emphasis on uh, prevention as well as treatment and recovery support because you've got, you know, these new cases who may not have, who may have just developed a new vulnerability, or you've got these remitting cases that clearly have some vulnerability, but if you can put some measures in place, you can prevent them from relapsing in the future. Can I ask a, um, a question um, here to the following? Um, there has been other uh, studies and researchers, uh, uh, you know, notably the Division on Addiction, who talks about this arc of adaptability adaptation. or adaptation. Um, in general, what could we say would be a reasonable time frame to either be passed or account for that adaptation, if any, relative to so, these scenarios that you point out here? Yeah, so the, the adaptation hypothesis basically says that once you've exposed the population to a new creator of disease, that the vulnerable sectors of the population will, you know, experience the disorder and then will either um, uh, recover uh, and then and be immune or immunized, or uh, they'll leave the population because they die or they move out. Um, and then you'll be left with an immunized population, uh, mm -hmm. which you know, which means the prevalence rate will come down. I think. You know, the, it, that's a, um, it, it's an interesting sort of thing to try and interlace with what we're finding from the cohort study uh, because you're talking about a population level um, set of changes. The, the adaptation theory really speaks about the population, whereas the, the cohort study is really looking at individual trajectories. And so those individual trajectories have to like be built up you know, to be a population, you, you really have to build up a lot of those trajectories, which is what we're trying to do. I think once um, we have an idea in, 
you know, in 2020, uh, the plan is to do a very large follow-up general baseline, general population survey, and what we'll, what we'll know once we have those data is whether the prevalence rate has changed. And then what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to put the pre-post um, snapshots together with what we've learned about what's going on at the individual level to understand what's contributing to any what, what contributed to the change in prevalence in the follow-up population survey. And that will give us an idea of whether we've had adaptation or whether we can expect adaptation in Massachusetts after the introduction of the casinos. What, what, is there anything, do you care to speculate any one of these? I mean, I have a, my own armchair analysis, but uh, as to whether we might be seeing a lot of variability, and then of course the, the recommendation is to do both, not just um, treatment, but prevention and treatment. Uh, if we are having, if we are seeing um, high rates of um, ins and outs, mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're not. I, I think or is it too early to tell three, for now? With three waves of data, it's a little, it's a little too early to tell if. We're seeing, um, you know, long-term remission, and that would be adaptation. Or if these people are going to continue to move in and out, that's again, that's going to be an important piece of information for us to have um, in terms of the services that we might want to. Yeah, I wasn't talking about adaptation anymore. I was just okay. thinking about the high rates of in and out, leading us to then take away that uh, we, we would need a greater emphasis on both prevention as well as treatment. Yeah, I think the, the, the piece of analysis that we're just starting now with wave four is to try to understand the similarities and differences between people who move a lot versus people who don't. Because that's going to tell us if there's like a, a sort of a, a stratum of people who just are problem gamblers all the way along that's your chronic unremitting cases, and and we know that there's probably some of them in the cohort, but we don't know how big the fraction is. Um, and and then there's going to be like you know a bunch of movers, and then there's going to be the people who don't change. And each of those strata um, is going to be interesting, and um, and and informative in terms of the kinds of services that people in that stratum might best um, Respond benefit to. from, mm -hmm. but you need to know the size of the strata. Okay. It's end of time. Yeah. Um, I'm Mark, if you can help us. These are very critical slides, but I almost feel as though we're staying tuned a little bit uh, mm -hmm. going forward. So I'd like for you to be able to complete your thinking, Dr. Volberg. Uh, but also be aware of we've got a few more yeah. items for today. I, th I think we've only got a couple more slides here, actually. Um, to, to me, it's, it's, it's really interesting. We have to, to recognize that recreational gamblers are an incredibly stable group um, and um, that's supported by the data in this study. And um, I think that that does uh, support um, support the uh, prevention efforts both inside the casino and outside of the casino. Um, the uh, instability of specifically at risk and problem gamblers is also really interesting. And as Rachel's pointing out, the next wave will put a little bit more, will put a lot more detail to it. What it does uh, to me, for me, um, and what I'm hoping it will do for the broader community of, of treatment providers mm -hmm. is to say, uh, is to, to help kind of orient them to the nature of, of problem gambling um, in the population in specifically Massachusetts. Um, that, that, that people do move around a lot and that's, that's the more common thing than uncommon. And, um, and the, the other thing that I, I found really interesting in this is that um, individuals who um, are problem gamblers or at-risk gamblers tend not to stop gambling altogether. Um, they tend to, to continue to 
to gamble, um, hopefully at a, at, a lower, at, at a lower risk or recreational. That to me has a lot of treatment implications in understanding that um, while your treatment goals are, are a personal choice, um, that it's, it's common for people to want to try, if you're a problem gambler, that abstinence is not always um, the, the true path towards recovery, that you can, you can be in recovery, you can be in remission um, without saying that, that um, you need to abstain altogether. Again, it's, it's a personal choice where, whether or not you abstain. This was an interesting finding in our voluntary self-exclusion evaluation as well, where individuals at enrollment in voluntary self-exclusion were asked about what, what their goal was in terms of gambling. Individuals that approached it um, saying that they wished to gamble more moderately um, but continued to gamble it generally had better outcomes than individuals who, who expressed a desire to abstain yeah, and that, that was the, the last slide that I sort of wanted to draw um, your attention to is um, this issue of um, uh, not, people, people are not likely to stop gambling even though they're experiencing harm or having problems controlling their gambling. They really want to be able to continue with something that they at one point really enjoyed, um, but it's gotten, it, it's gotten very difficult and challenging for them. And so the, the whole notion that um, in order to uh, get treatment or to um, get help for a gambling problem, many, many treatment professionals will, as they do with, with alcohol disorders, will basically say, you know, abstinence should be your goal, abstinence is the best goal, and if you're not going to be absent, then I'm, you know, then I can't provide treatment. Um, and this whole notion that people can continue to gamble but at a lower level and sort of putting the other parts of their lives back together um, really is uh, consistent with, um, with the data that we have here, that people are very unlikely to transition to being non-gamblers from, from any other part of the continuum. And so we have to figure out how to basically get to people where they're at in terms of what they want to do with their gambling. And um, this is very consistent with this idea that um, controlled gambling or moderate gambling um, is not incompatible with recovery from a problem. And so we can, I, I would Here's love to conclude, but I would also just say well, this study is contributing to a much larger um, study and group of studies of cohorts where we're, we're in our our research teams in the process of developing low-risk gambling guidelines, which really is, is it's at the heart of what we're trying to do through through GameSense as well, of, of providing guidance, um, nudging people in the direction that if they're going to gamble, um, to do so in in a way uh, that is is um, no harm uh, to the individual, to their family, to the community. Or it's a harm reduction. I mean, we will settle for uh, harm reduction if that's what works incrementally, right? right. Yeah. So if you want any more information, feel free to visit our website or send me a question or send me an email. You know where to find me <laughs> on the road to, <laughs> to Boston. Thank you. Excellent. Do we have any questions for Dr. Wilberg at this time? Commissioner O'Brien? Commissioner Stebbins? Thank you. Okay. No, thank you, Rachel. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, Rachel. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there's been a request for a short, short break, and we should take it so that we can finish up our, our business. Uh, Ten minutes, so that puts us at 325, and we will reconvene in order, if that, unless there's somebody with a competing schedule. That would put... Uh, Item seven. Yeah. Item seven. That will be next up. Excellent. I'll be here all day. Somebody said. Thank you.
Thank you again. We are calling, reconvening meeting number 276. And again, we are going slightly out of order. We are now turning to item seven on the agenda, licensee policies on switching jackpots. And Commissioner Stebbins, I know that you've been looking at this with um, Bruce and Burke. So thank, you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll hand it over to the experts, but this is uh, an interesting issue that has popped up. Um, I certainly appreciate the, the value team that is uh, confronted this and worked with our gaming agents um, and to work with our licensees to to raise their awareness of it but um, overall again this is a report there's no vote expected uh, but I think this is just a reminder of how we're trying to help protect some vulnerable patrons as well as meet some of our statutory obligations to collect outstanding obligations as we may come across them as uh, the statute uh, was pretty clear about but um, I'll hand it over to the experts. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, this topic is, is really kind of unique to Massachusetts because nobody else really collects money for the Department of Revenue, uh, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, we didn't have this in New Jersey when we were there. Uh, it's a unique topic for here. Uh, I brought in uh, Field Manager Burke Kane and the Supervisor Ballerina kind of flew them uh, because they were kind of pioneers for us in this state to, to find some of these inconsistencies and, uh, with the jackpots. And I'll let them explain. I will steal their thunder. But just to give you a little heads up, last month alone, we accounted for the Department of Revenue uh, $223,000 for job in the state. So it's not a small amount. But that, that's including everybody who is checked, right? Not necessarily yeah, people who might be... Not not necessarily switching jackpots, but mm -hmm. that's a dollar amount that we're dealing with on a monthly basis. For the three casinos or for three only one? Yes. And is that unpaid taxes or child support? Uh, or, it, or do we know the breakdown? It would be, it'd be a combination of the two. Do we know what the breakdown under, is? Under an intercept, right. But do we know what the breakdown is well, proportionally? I guess, we could, I guess well, we, could I, we could probably get that for you, but I don't have those figures. I was just curious if you had it. Okay. Yeah, they delivered to us as uh, intercept money. All right, good afternoon. As Bruce said, uh, we're joined today by Val Trendafalova, supervising gaming agent uh, at the Encore property and the PPC property that we call Boston Harbor Metro Zone. A um, little background about this is uh, I think Val took it upon herself, so a little kudos to Val, last February, March to start reviewing uh, the accounting paperwork, I track reports. And she would uh, reference when, where, what time a jackpot was hit, a taxable one. And then she would go to the CCTV review room and just watch the process. And on rare occasions, she was noticing that patrons who won the jackpot would get up and allow another person to sit down in their place. So today we have a uh, PowerPoint um, program for you to show some of the highlights of this. We have a memorandum we want to talk about. So I think in the package is the memo. A lot of the memo information is shown in the PowerPoint, so I'm just going to breeze through some of the highlights of the memo for us. The Investigation Enforcement Bureau Gaming Agent Division has been focusing its attention on the surveillance of uh, switching, the practice involving the slot machine player switching seats after a jackpot of 1,200 or more with a friend, accomplice, or other player. This act is illegal and hinders the enforcement of Chapter 23K and our Regulation 205 CMR 133 because it would allow a player who may be on the self-exclusion list or a player who may owe monies to Department of Revenue to improperly collect winnings. Recently, as I said, MGA, MGC gaming agents have reviewed surveillance footage at Plain Ridge, MGM, and Encore and we uh, can go over that uh, in the PowerPoint. Uh, the impact on VSCs. Individuals place themselves on the Massachusetts Gaming Commission voluntary self-exclusion list to do so in an effort to mitigate the negative impact gaming may have on that individual. Pursuant to 23K, during any period of voluntary exclusion, 
the person shall not collect any winnings, recover any losses resulting from gaming activity at a gaming establishment. Additionally, our regulation, the voluntary self-exclusion reg of 133, a gaming licensee shall not pay any win winnings derived from gaming to an individual who is prohibited from gaming in a gaming establishment by placing their name on that list. A VSC agreement could be circumvented if a VSC patron simply switched seats with another person to accept the winnings. The impact on the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. The Expanded Gaming Act of 2011 specifically spelled out in MGL 23K the need for jackpot winners in excess of $1,200 to be reviewed and ascertain whether the winner owes any past child support money or ascertain whether the winner may owe past, um, past due tax liability to the Commonwealth. So now we'll get into some of the slides. All right, slot machine uh, jackpot process. What we ask the uh, casinos to do with all the internal controls is uh, based on the, what the con internal controls say for that section is to give us what they, uh, how they want to do it. We call it out in the field the submission. For instance, what level do you want to have a shift manager involved with the uh, slot machine jackpot, perhaps a $50,000 one? What surveillance is responsibility? Uh, when does security officer help witness the payment, for example? But last but not least is the uh, 13856 absolutely states that you must pay the winning patron the money. Additionally, a slot machines are programmed, as we know, to lock out at $1,200. So a person um, trying to circumvent the system by, by switching, if a, um, anything was hit for $1,400, a, a voucher, Tito, would not be printed out. The machine locks out, which means there's going to be interaction with casino staff, um, meaning that you're going to probably have to be checked through the um, Department of Revenue system and uh, surveillance would probably be in uh, looking at that uh, jackpot also. And lastly, as I discussed a little bit, the 23K Section 51 is the Department of Re Revenue requirement that a person uh, who may owe past child support or may owe past tax liabilities is checked in the system before they pay out the uh, jackpot. Gaming agent review. Uh, led by Val and all the other gaming agents, we've been reviewing jackpot switches from March of 2019 through August of 2019. During this time, we've looked at over 2,200 individual videos of uh, jackpot payments at all three casinos. The gaming agents have found 14 incidences of successfully switching seats. And after we began to alert the casinos and talk about this process, the casino surveillance departments have halted another 29 uh, attempted switches. With respect to the 14, were we able to do anything? Pardon? With respect to the 14, I'm oh, so sorry. <laughs> With respect to the 14 incidents, were we able to, to correct them or mitigate Yes. Uh, once we notified a compliance office about this, they worked towards uh, finding those patrons. If the other patron we can track these surveillance, perhaps they have a player's card, they were playing somewhere else, we uh, would uh, put something in that the um, player's file that next time they come in, they would uh, be talked about, asked to uh, you know, pay, make, make good with the arrangement. But a person who receives it uh, unjustly, uh, we're, they would be interviewed next time they come in if uh, a note is in their file. Um, can I, um, maybe we'll, I was going to get to these, but might as well uh, uh, get to these now. Um, is it ever um, customary? Do people who are friends or married come together and they know that they're going to be switching seats because that's what they like to do. They pull their money and they take turns. Is there ever a situation, if you will, where a switch could be uh, justified, let's say? Well, we, we look at that. Um, sometimes you're wondering where the, the money is coming from. If it's a husband and wife situation, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, the husband's pushing the button and then the wife pushes the button. 
I mean, good sense could mean that uh, they're a, a family, so. Um, they're trying their luck together, if yeah, you will. Right, right, right. <laughs> trying to stay clear of that one, aren't you? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we use common sense when it comes to something like that, and we re review their play for a little bit and, mm -hmm. you know, use our head. If it's something that it looks like one of the individuals is definitely avoiding uh, the jackpot altogether, we would look into that mm -hmm. a little deeper. Okay. A comical example could be if I'm sitting here playing the machine and you're going by whoever spun the reels, won the, won the jackpot, what if someone just came down the aisle and reached over his shoulder and pushed that button? It's my money. He didn't win it. He pushed the button. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, work with what makes logical sense. Mm -hmm. uh, statistics. We have some statistics from each of the casinos. As you can see, uh, at Plain Ridge Park, we had 1,200, uh, up to almost 1,200 reviews by IEB. As you can see in the center uh, column, seven of the eight uh, jackpot switches were noticed at the beginning. After we alerted the surveillance department, most of them have been uh, prevented by the surveillance department. So they've done a very nice job out there. Uh, the next slide, MGM, a lesser sample size of uh, 800 plus. Mm -hmm. We have five situations where we uh, noticed the switch and there's two situations where MGM surveillance department has prevented a uh, switch. And Encore obviously just being open uh, almost 200 um, reviews, and right now we have one situation where we've noticed. Was that last switch. week you found the bell? Uh, I think maybe right after the end of uh, August we've had a second. Okay, so um, with that, that. That we've observed. Pardon? That the IEP has observed. Yes, I observed. Uh, uh, two rather than one. Yeah, uh, right at the beginning of September we make it two now. And with that, so in in this in these three charts, um, you start with uh, the higher number is the reviews conducted by the IEB. Um, is that the universe of jackpots over twelve hundred dollars for that period? Yeah, yeah, these are taxables. They don't take long to review. Um, no, no. My my question is: is that is there any other jackpots that were that happened? but were not reviewed by the IEB for whatever reason? Well, oftentimes, I think when we talk about jackpots, I think I often think of it as a taxable jackpot of 1200 yeah, more. Th that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So anything above $1,200, yeah, this, 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 is this is the universe of what can happen at any given yeah. time. It, especially that they're, with PPC, they were saying, telling us the length of time it took so we kind of kept track of how long it took us, and it didn't take us that long. They are totally on board now with the review. Mm -hmm. but it's, uh, mm -hmm. You see how many of they've bought since then. Well. Mm -hmm. you know, speaking about the um, submission process, some casinos have a like an iPhone on the slot attendant's wrist, and they'll see where the jackpot is. So once they get over there on their way, they can notify surveillance, hey, uh, Section D, machine number 50, I have a $2,000 jackpot. They could start their process there. I haven't even, this flight attendant perhaps hasn't even gotten there yet. So by the time you go there, introduce yourself, verify it, get information, go over to the jackpot kiosk and run the information through uh, the DOR system and start to get the cash, there should be more than enough time for, them. for surveillance to call down and say, hey, it's not the lady in the red dress, it's a ge gentleman in the blue sweater. Mm -hmm. Did you? Um, so I know that the lottery has this sometimes with people doing ticket switching for the same reason to get around DOR child support. Uh, they'll sometimes grab vulnerable people and say, "I'll give you 10 percent." Those people don't realize they're going to take a DOR hit. Now they have DOR issues, that sort of thing. There's an obligation in lottery, my understanding, when you pick it, when you go in for certain winnings, to aver that it's your ticket. You're claiming it only for yourself. That sort of thing. Do we have anything in our regs or in the casino rules that are the same thing on bigger jackpots and hits? Well, uh, the only rule we have in our submissions are the winning person has to be paid that jackpot. Do they 
sign anything? I know in lottery you should actually sign the ticket to say it's yours. But it's, oh. it's, it's in our regs that apply to the casinos. I think you're talking about a, perhaps a, alerting the public that you have to be the person. But also the consequences. So you're not, yeah. you're not supposed to... Right. So I, but I guess the question is, have we looked at all in terms of this, in terms of the lottery and how they deal with making sure people don't do the switching? Because they've been looking at this for years in terms of maybe statutory changes, too, to make it a criminal act to knowingly switch or anything like that. I, uh, I don't know. I assume you have to sign your W-2G. And, and submissions are a fluid document. If uh, after this review, if we get together with the casinos and if it was a prevalent problem, Seeing the statistics, we're under well under one percent, I think. But uh, we don't want it. You know, you don't want any of this to happen. If uh, we started to review this with compliance, we could ask them to update their submission to be more uh, in compliant with our concern. I think the difference with the lottery is you don't know. I buy the ticket. I take the ticket out of view of anybody to scratch it and bring it back. Whereas, you know, a locked-up machine, we're actually. Catching somebody, I think. Right. In lottery, a lot, there's a tacit agreement between the person claiming and the person who's going to have it. Right. And so there's a fault of Irma going up to the lottery saying, yes, this is my money, my ticket, when in reality they have a side agreement. They're right. only keeping 1000 and they're giving nine right. to someone else for the specific purpose of and we, defrauding. Right. And we have the tiebreaker of having a surveillance system. So. Right. Okay. Uh, so can you bring us to these slides? Yes. Uh, Val's going to walk us through some examples of actual switches. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, yeah, it's on, right? Yep. Okay. Just nice and close. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so in this slide over here, we can see that um, a man and a, and a female are playing on, uh, they are uh, sitting next to each other. Uh, it's clear that the female is the one playing on that swap machine. And um, over here, after after the, um, the female uh, wins the jackpot, it's clear that uh, they switched spots, so now the male is sitting on that machine. And um, right here, you can see that the, um, uh, sl the slot attendant is, is there to retrieve all the information from the patron. Um, and so they, they take um, their ID and um, issued the W-2 form. Um, on yeah, over here, the uh, slot in is giving the W-2 form to the, to the male patron who signs uh, the, the form, and the slot in gives them the cash money. So is the, the, the male was observing the female before the jackpot hit, right? They, is yes. it, it's fair to say that they're at least perhaps together in that situation? Uh, yes. Well, yes. <clears throat> or did, they, was they she switched or, and he provided his information. Yeah. Could, did we find out? Uh, were we able to correct this? If, we because we, we are called surveillance, to. and um, since this is happening, like weeks after it happened, uh, they didn't. We didn't have any information on the woman, so we don't know if if she had a player's card, who she is at all. We just had the information of the male page, mm -hmm. patron. So I'm not sure if Angkor is able to do anything about so it. So, for instance, if is, is she Angkor? had had an obligation Angkor. to pay child support, mm -hmm. we don't. We weren't able to recover that for DOR. So that would be an example. They may be together, Commissioner, yep. but they would well, could have separate interests. That's why it's really important that we have the casino check these before they pay the jackpot. Uh, that's and right. you would catch it every time. It's a 10-minute process to do that. It probably takes 15 to pay the jackpot by the time you check everything. And you mean check um, the, the, yeah, the surveillance? Yeah, just check it's very a, the same person that, that was sitting at the machine when uh, the jackpot hit. But it's also possible, and I'm just speaking theoretically here, that they were related, that they were married. Or boyfriend, girlfriend, or, you know. No, meaning that it would be of no consequence 
Perhaps. Well, you know, does or he have a child support from there? a previous marriage? Yeah, she might have a child. Back taxes in his name, or you know, there can be a lot of scenarios with that. So yeah, because even though you're married, you could have separate interests. For instance, right. with respect to a former marriage, to have okay. child support obligations that yeah. run through mm -hmm. one of you. So this. Is if you if you notice this first slide up in the left hand corner, you'll see 10:19 as the time, and mm -hmm. if you'll go to the fourth slide uh, when they're paying the patron, you'll see that it says 1039. I think that's more than ample time that a casino could be checking. Right? Checking 10, 20 it, right. 10, 20 that it's yep. right. right. Yeah, so but, yeah. eight minutes, enough time to check it. Right. 20, 20 minutes? 20, 20, 20 minutes. minutes. 10, 1019 to 1039, is that right? Yeah. 1029 is 10, when the 29. slot attendant 29. comes over. 29, right? And then 10:39 is when he comes back with his W2. Maybe we don't have the time. Oh, it says 10:39 there. Yeah, 10:19 there. Oh, there it says 10:30. Yeah, got it. Yeah, plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I was thinking eight minutes was plenty. So 28, 25. Let's go to number two. Okay. Thank you, Al. Number two. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, this example is from uh, PPC, where this, it's clearly that this female is uh, playing on the slot machine. Uh, when the jackpot hits, she gets up, go to the nearest um, uh, eight, uh, tier U machine, and right here we see that when the slot attendant comes in, another female who was sitting next to first one is presenting uh, the the information needed for the slot attendant to um, complete the transaction. And right here we can see that the slot attendant is uh, paying the female in a in a with a uh, dark hair the the jackpot. And I think. In this situation, we, um, I think, we knew. Uh, I think both females had players cards, and um, I'm not sure, sure if uh, uh, if PPC was able to retrieve uh, the money. But so, if I understand correctly, to Commissioner Zuniga's point that while they could be married, the rule though is it by statute, by regulation, that we must that pay the winning patron. It's uh, the regulation. The regulation, right? Yeah. So the regulation requires, even if it's a married couple or a couple, shared interest, yeah. sisters, brothers, whatever, they must pay the winning. That, that's what the regulation says. And, and I think the regulation is very much on, on point. It makes total sense. I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, and I should, this is not just a hypothetical. I am actually related to somebody who likes to play with his brother in Las Vegas, <laughs> and they actually play together. And they change sweet seats, you know. Yeah. Try your luck now, and they pull their money. They say, you know, your turn now, and they all cheer for each other. And then they change, and they also do this. In that situation, not here, because that they've never done that in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> so otherwise, I would really have to tell them. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the problem is in these other jurisdictions they, they don't have to check against no, a yes. DOR thing. Right. right. But, but uh, in that situation, what should somebody like that say then they should both present their information they should both present went. their information is that uh, what would well you know I, I would the first thing I would ask is why didn't you want it in your name mm -hmm. and you know I I would run it in the DOR uh, uh, system just to make sure that that individual didn't know back stuff and I don't care if it gets paid in his name but uh, you know I would make sure that he didn't know taxes or you know child support yeah, no, there's another, there's another principle here. Anybody yeah. doing that, knowing that everybody's yeah. under surveillance in a casino. Should so, Enrique, how many jackpots has this happened on? Never. <laughs> it has not happened. But, no, no, but this is not, uh, they, they do pull their money. That is part of the fun. Yes. yes. And they, they take turns. Okay. And because it's never I don't happened. think in Las Vegas that would ever happen to you because the, they don't they're check not double-checking you against the system or you know, right. anything like that. So, I think you're clear. You know? I'm, I'm concerned about what 
do we do is, is, with is some, that, in somebody a situation like that, like that here? I say I think I think we would check uh, the DR system to make sure that that individual doesn't know anything, you know, in back taxes or, or child support. The one who won? Who actually it? won. That, okay. You know. Not the other one. Yeah. That's, I think that would be pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're both technically violating the reg, so what's the consequence to violating the reg? Yeah, well. Is there any, I mean, do they get excluded for some period of time or? No. Yeah, that I think would be left up to the casino. I, it depends how, you know, how big of a deal you want to make out of that well, the, or whatever. But the, the, the reg is on the casino. We regulate the casino. We yes. are asking that they check, yes. go back to the tape to pay the winning No, I'm aware. Patron. I'm just saying that once you've determined someone's violated the reg, you're telling, you're saying it's a reg that the winner has to collect. And the purpose of it is to make sure DOR gets child support and the yes. appropriate taxes. So once it's been determined they violate the reg, do we have any other reg that talks about the consequences or mandates yeah. they do anything? You no, know, that's something we can even look at the regs and see if we want to strengthen that a little bit and make sure we require them to, uh, you know, check the jackpots and, and do this correctly. I could see some advantages to doing that. Right, especially if you have a recidivist who keeps doing it. Yep. Right. Oh, absolutely. Right. Uh, we have an example three. Female playing at the uh, machine triggers the jackpot. Patron locates other players on the casino floor to claim the jackpot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a little more egregious. Yeah, right. Somebody yeah. sitting next. Slot attendant right. retrieves the information from the male patron who is attempting to claim the jackpot. The male patron then gives the cash collected from the jackpot to the original female who activated the jackpot. He just turned. Did he, yeah. Did, so, we know? Uh, did he take quite his an bet? Episode. Now, uh, remember, some of these are in our, in our review. These are days and weeks later. We're finding this from our initial right. review. No, but right. did you see now him skim any money off for his cut? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's in the footage. <laughs> oh, yeah. And once again, the... Um, goes, yeah. yeah, palming. You know, once again, the video ago. is much more clear than still shots, right? Right. Right. But this is, from your summary, this person was on the VNC. Uh, on this last example? Uh, yeah, it looks like yeah. it from your yep. summary. Oh, okay, right, right. Which, of course, right that, so this is an important exercise. Right, mm -hmm. right. Not only for the DOR coffers, but... For responsible gaming, absolutely. For our responsible mm -hmm. gaming, right. yeah. So we're, we're trying to um, prevent this. We have alerted the casinos. They are working well up with us. you got to remember the... Um, MGM Encore Casino has table games revving all day long, big properties, so it is a task, and uh, a very good good faith effort is being produced right now, and um, so we we will continue to work with them with the, with those findings. I just I, I strongly think the more important message is we're trying, you know, we're working with our licensees not to allow people to kind of one skirt the regulation, skirt. You know, when a BSE signs up, hey, don't let me on the property, and following those regs, as well as, you know, you know, making every effort to catch somebody who owes her friends a DOR some money. Correct. Right. And I think and it's a positive thing that the uh, uh, Commonwealth does versus other jurisdictions. Yeah. That you just see the dollar amount that's retrieved. Yeah. And and as we've seen, the amount of time for the slot attendant to walk over when the they get the alert to check the W-2 information and come back with the payment is more than enough time for surveillance more to uh, yes. double check. I suppose they could, they could also um, they could also um, be trained the slot attendants to say when they arrive something to the effect we're going to roll back the tape just to make sure that you were the one um, that they, they at which point, <laughs> at which point they yeah. could, they could uh, they, at which point there may be no need to roll the tape back is, is part of my point. Yeah, they could. I I don't know if that would happen all the time. It would be nice well, if it did, but I just don't know. My um, the, the the reason of my questions is that um, I can I can imagine the argument from 
the operators saying this takes away resources for us. Um, we need a higher threshold because we are otherwise observing yeah. the high stake games, for example, because we have all these other surveillance. Um, is that is that a fair argument from this side? Uh, you know, I've been in this industry a long time, and and my specialty has always been surveillance. I would find that a real hard argument to swallow. You know. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I think it's great work on Val's part to identify. <laughs> well, I, you know, it, it just doesn't take that long to do that. And, right. you know, they have people in the room that are reviewing things all the time. And it, it just would But I like that she was vigilant and she saw something that was unusual. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we appreciate that. Um, it would be worthwhile, I think, just checking on the lottery because mm -hmm. there was some chatter a while back about Come even on. proposing misdemeanor consequences for people that did this. Okay. Um, I don't know if they ever did anything about it. Um, I think it's a bigger issue for the lottery because, to your point, it's far easier to switch a ticket. Yeah. And then well, imagine it's harder to track. It is harder to track, but um, for consistency's purposes, and then just a, a conversation about whether there should be consequences, particularly if people continue to violate, I'd be interested to know what their status mm. is. Okay. Great. That's worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are now moving on to item number eight, Investigations and Enforcement Bureau. Director Wells, please, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know you've had a long day. I will try to uh, expedite matters here. Uh, so I have two matters on for your consideration. Um, the first matter is uh, entitled Modification of Massachusetts Supplemental Form. So as you know, uh, throughout the history of the Gaming Commission, we've used the multi-jurisdictional personal history disclosure form to get information on not only qualifiers, but also for key executive employees. And when the commission uh, started, even before I was a member of the team here, they uh, uh, created the Massachusetts Supplemental Form to add some questions to that multi-jurisdictional form that Massachusetts regulators would be interested in. So what we've done is taken a look at the form, particularly in light of the uh, events of last year and the issue with uh, Wynn Resorts, uh, and we are proposing that we add some questions to the form with relative to settlement agreements and uh, sexual harassment and also we have sort of a, a catch-all question. These, these are questions we have investigators generally uh, currently ask in the course of uh, interviews, but these kinds of questions can be a little awkward in interviews and it makes sense to have a uh, regulated format where the questions are asked the same way and, the, and they're put forth in, a for, in that kind of format. Um, so we're suggesting that we put them in the form. You can see um, the first two questions, 17 and 18, uh, have to do with settlements. We uh, took this language, tweaked it a little bit, but generally this language is what uh, the Nevada Con Gaming Control Board has uh, modified their supplement to add those you know, after the, uh, the win matter uh, came to light. So that's where we got those. Um, and then there's the other questions that have been presented before you. So in uh, briefing the commissioners individually, uh, you know, in particular, we did uh, speak with uh, Commissioner Zuniga. He had asked that we could uh, potentially specifically discuss whether we need question 19, which asks, have you ever participated in any type of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, or unlawful discrimination, and whether we need that question in light of the fact that we have also included question 20, which says, have any allegations of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, or unlawful discrimination been made concerning your behavior, including by employees and or subordinates? So uh, you know, we, we could do it either way. Uh, the uh, thinking behind putting question 19 is there is it's a broader capture of information from the actual applicant, him or herself, uh, that more information is generally 
uh, better and more more leads if there's any information which might be relevant to suitability but I'll leave it you know to the Commission's discussion and, and deliberation and whether or not you would like that included on the form and if there's any other questions on the form that you think uh, should not be included or would like modified I'll leave that to your uh, comments and discretion here yeah, let me let me just uh, expound to that um, I'm thinking specifically of um, uh, question 19 that appears to me quite broad, um, especially um, as it relates to um, you know situations that were, were that are sometimes blurry, and that people come in uh, and leave with a different understanding. Um, I think it's better to use this example since it's public, but um, let's just assume that um, somebody like uh, Aziz Ansari or Mr. Al Franken was responding to this um, uh, to this form um, prior to those allegations that were public or after those allegations were public. I suspect that they would have a hard time answering this question. Now, my more fundamental question is, what are we trying to get to in this question, in question 19? The objective of the question, I would suggest, is to try to be able to capture instances of sexual uh, harassment, misconduct, or unlawful discrimination which have not been reported and therefore the, the company's unaware of. Yeah, but it's the, the, it's the person filling this out. Right, so they'd have to self-disclose. So if somebody went on a date that turned out to be not a great date and they don't know how that person, the other person, is going to look at that situation now looking back, is the reason to, uh, to put this here to get them on the record so that should something later surface to be able to come back and take away their license, for example? It would seem to be, so the, the language is somewhat of a term of art, yeah. those phrases, sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, unlawful discrimination. It seems like the distinction between 19 and 20 is 20 is specifically related to allegations and by context in the workplace. 19 would seem to capture allegations of the same ilk, but not necessarily in the workplace. And I'm wondering, I get why you want it, and I'm just, I, I like the idea of it, and I'm, what I'm struggling with is how to capture the information in a way that addresses his concern about ambiguity. So yeah, are there I mean, other ways to ask the question broader than 20, or maybe a caveat within 20, that right. addresses Commissioner Zuni's concerns about sort of, you know, vagaries of life? Right. I mean, you could, um, I mean, I think that what 19 is trying to capture is a situation, you, you may have a, an individual, male or female, that is e even in the workplace, right. engaged in activity which would fall under, and I would suggest you're correct, that, that term of art, like as a legal term, sexual harassment and misconduct and unlawful discrimination. So that, sort of that legal term rather than right. that date. Right. The, um, but didn't rise to the level of an Well, that nobody reported. I think that's, that's the issue. It's, this is an issue of self-disclosure, mm -hmm. where s there may be a situation where someone absolutely knows they did something wrong, and this is their opportunity to disclose it. I, in, in addressing Enrique's, um, pardon me, Commissioner Zuniga's concern that, um, you know, what if someone doesn't doesn't know. What our expectation is in these forms is to be truthful. And we have that that language, you know, is in the is in the application forms throughout. And I think that um, you know, in a case by case analysis, if you generally didn't believe that what you did was sexual harassment, then when you put down no, then that's a truthful answer. So that would be how you'd address it. But I'll, I'll leave well, it. Well, I think sequentially too, if you it seems sequentially twenty should be nineteen and nineteen should be twenty. Um, okay. I, I mean, I don't know. In my head, if I'm if I'm reading through it, I would think yep. that might that. frame it a little bit better. And then the question is, really, does that and 21 give you what you need? Yeah. I mean, I think. 
Commissioner Zuniga's question when we had the discussion was if you have question 20 in there, which covers allegations which have been made against an individual in the workplace, do you need question 19 as well? And uh, I'll leave that sort of, it's that, that's, I, I would suggest as a commission's discretion, how deep do you want us to dive into these kinds of allegations? Because if you want it workplace reported, you know, internal controls analysis, that kind of thing, that's what you're looking at, then having question 20 should be sufficient. But if you really want the investigators doing a deeper dive into, you know, other acts of misconduct and generally broader analysis into integrity, honesty, and good character, then this may be something that you'd want to add. So we have included that for your consideration. And we just need some direction how you would like us to proceed. Is number 20 just limited to employment? Well, because I, 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 yeah, I guess you could put in there, um, well, we've got including by including. employees and subordinates. So it definitely includes that. Yes. But it's no, I guess, to your point, it may not be limited to that. Could it be at college? When I was, when I was at college? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. Yes. Well, the one that seems broad to me is 19, uh, only because there is perhaps a small but significant, um, uh, significantly important number of potential scenarios in which the person might legitimately not know whether, you know, there's, 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 a, there's not a I don't know option. Um, if the idea is to put in um, no, so that then when we later find out whether somebody was uh, accused, we could come back, that's, that's one thing, or, but um, which I, I, I don't feel good about. How about uh, phrasing it, are you aware of any other conduct? You know, in which you've participated in that would rise to the level, you know, like, is there a way to say it that sort of captures that aware? And so if they say, like, I didn't know she said that about, you know, five years later she comes and says, you know, what he did to me was inappropriate and I think it was sexual harassment. Well, at the time he fills out the form, or she, if it's phrased that are you aware of, it goes to the knowledge, the state of mind, it would then be falsehood if there's proof that they did, they were aware this person made the allegation contemporaneously. Yeah. I mean, I, Perhaps also, um, what do we do with somebody who says yes and uh, describes a situation that is just like the scenario paint, which is the one that I'm, I'm you know, mm -hmm. the blurry one, a blurry one in which, well, I, I don't know. I mean, there was so, that, so there was that bad date over there or whatever. Well, what are we supposed, what are we going to do yeah, with that? So what's what's was interesting. Um, the the, you know, the attorney from Rubin and Rudman was very helpful to us in giving us some sort of um, sort of expertise on these types of investigations. And uh, what she indicated to us is that uh, generally, if we're doing some kind of investigation into sexual harassment and this and sexual misconduct, is that uh, when you do an investigation like that. It, you are looking for patterns because generally if someone's engaging in this type of behavior, it's not a one-off. If, if it's real, you know, that sort of intentional, um, those, those acts. So she was telling us, which we found very helpful, is that uh, if, if you're doing a legitimate investigation to that, you're going to look into other, whether or not there are other instances or is it just the classic he said, she said, which you may not be able to do anything with if that's the only evidence you have. But delving a little deeper and seeing if there's a pattern, and as we all know now from uh, a certain other investigation that uh, can come to light, that once you start digging a little bit more and asking some more questions and checking into other areas, you might find more. So that would be the relevance of getting that information is because it may lead you to a pattern of behavior which may lead to a finding uh, or a recommendation of unsuitability. I mean, if you, I feel like I'm wordsmithing it, but if you say, are you aware of any incidents in which you participated in any type of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, or unlawful discrimination that did not result in a formal allegation? 
if it still goes to the knowledge. So if somebody comes five years after the fact and says, back in, you know, 2015, so-and-so did X, the person's not falsely filling out the form. Not so sure that gets to the pattern of conduct, though, that you're hoping to vet. Well, it, it, it's, the, it's the red flag. I mean, what you're looking for, you're, it, an answer one way or the other on, on this form is not going to necessarily be determinative, but it is going to say to an investigator, oh, okay, uh, let, me, let me look into this and let me see if there's an area, of, a further area of inquiry. Let, let's, you know, go to the HR department in your prior job and see, you know, were there any allegations in the prior job, not just look at where you are here. It depends, you know, the nature of suitability investigations is that you, know, you can never know everything about an individual, ever. And if you think you can, you're kidding yourself. But if you can create a system which will identify flags or areas where you need to make further inquiry so you can do a reasonable risk analysis and figure out where the areas um, of, of risk are for, for that particular individual, that helps you direct the investigation in a timely manner. So that would be, okay, this might be an area we need to look into a little more further, check with, you know, prior coworkers, maybe do another, some other interviews with people I, they've worked with. Single I family. agree with everything you're saying, and I think we get to that with the three other questions. Yeah, so that, you know, when ultimately, it's, I'll when leave it's that. Ultimately, when, when there was either an investigation, an allegation, a charge, uh, I just think that the broadness, even with your clarifications, Commissioner, about, you know, in the workplace or to your knowledge, I, I think the broad nature of it comes from did you participate in any? And by definition, some of these, um, the way how some of these allegations later turn out. Now, have there been allegations? That's, that's a clear cut. Right. But or a charge, no question about that. Could you establish um, uh, a track record by doing further inquiry after that? That's, that's a clear charge uh, in terms of you know, what you could do to, to, to get to the nature of maybe one allegation or 10 allegations, et cetera. But um, to me, 19 is just um, almost too broad for somebody to say, well, I, I really don't know. It is conceivable that a lot of people might think of a scenario in which, okay, there's not an allegation. I don't think I participated in what's the definition here, but there was never any charge or complaint or allegation. I cannot know for sure that there will never be, and that's the conundrum. Uh, to me, this is just unnecessarily broad. We can get to the other, what, we were, what we're after, um, with the other three. I'm just trying to think of a hypothetical that might sort of identify what then, if you don't have this, what you potentially are missing. So say you have a situation where, you know, John Smith, who is a qualifier or a key executive, um, had engaged, say in college or, or later, you know, in the workplace, uh, with a bunch of other individuals sent, you know, harassing messages to another employee and no, no, knew he did it and later became, you know, more aware of what he should or shouldn't be doing and so knows that, that he did the wrong thing, but there were never any charges. If we don't ask this question, then we may never get that information and that may be something that that individual would have self-disclosed. So that, I'm just trying to think of a hypothetical that would. So are cover. we looking for confessions here or? Ten, well, the nature of, uh, you know, regulatory suitability investigations is in self-disclosure. We do expect self-disclosure. So the question is, are you asking the right questions that are going to elicit the information? And I guess the question for the commission is, is that the kind of information you would like us to follow up on? Or is that something, you know, you'd be okay if we just never knew that? Sorry. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure and your obligation to be forthcoming in your application, is there any other information which might reflect adversely in an evaluation of your honesty, integrity, or good character, or otherwise impact a determination on your suitability for gaming license or such qualification, including any other misconduct not already disclosed above? 
goes a little bit more pointed than what you have in 21, but then would eliminate 19 mm -hmm. in terms of. Um, Did you say any conduct or any misconduct? Including any other misconduct not already disclosed above. I mean, just to pick up on that and give Karen a, a, a moment to think about that. I, first of all, jumping to question 21, I've kind of liked the fact that we're now including this. I mean, I think a lot of us, if we've been in public service, get mm -hmm. the question thrown at to, thrown at us. So I'm, I'm glad we've included that operationally because we're really talking about um, key gaming executives and casino qualifiers. So this is a small cadre of people. Uh, how often, because again, this is a mass supplemental form, may have differences from other forms where they've already completed forms in other states. How much outreach typically does an executive call up you or your team and say, hey, I'm going through this, help me understand what you mean by question 21 or 15, you know, how much, help me understand yeah. this question in this mass supplemental That's form. Rare. So if it's the attorney, they may say, hey, I'm helping Ed fill out the form. You have this new question. Give me an idea of what it means. Mm -hmm. You could get to kind of a whole broad array of, you know, well, we'd like you to consider these things, sexual harassment, uh, sexual misconduct. Those are the kind of things that we're looking for under this question. So it doesn't pigeonhole you even to some defined questions where there may be some vagueness, but it does, I think, at the end of the day, give the applicant a chance to say, all right, I'm going to, you know, point of self-disclosure, I will tell you about X, Y, Z incident now that I know you're looking for those types of incidents where I think 19 is a little bit vague, and then I would have a question for you of should we be segmenting out from 19 unlawful discrimination, because that seems to be more of a question or uh, less of a value judgment around my answer and more I discriminated, was it lawful or unlawful? Um, I don't know, I, I'm trying to understand why you tied unlawful discrimination into sexual harassment and sexual misconduct. Well, because it's misconduct and, and it's usually, it's you know, it's facts. just right. something, okay. you know, um, it's, it's another area, by the way, where I think there's also some blurry lines. Somebody could be joking about somebody's heritage, let's say, and someone else might think it's inappropriate and, uh, and discriminatory. Discriminatory. Um, so, um, so just take me, uh, in general, to the process. Um, and I like your suggestion, Commissioner, about you know maybe really the catch-all is really 21. Yeah, and that may, that, that may be a solve that everyone's um, comfortable with. Is, is it possible that somebody, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, puts in whatever, a situation that, and, and uh, so now you're going to interview that person? So uh, we generally do an interview of all the qualifiers and the key executives, so that would be standard. And standard protocol would also be to go through the application with that person and, and, and ask them about kind the of questions. Gets to right. the operational and question, yeah. how they help. Assuming that it's like he said, she said, or, you know, uh, are you going to interview the other person, for example? I mean, I can't, you, you'd have, that'd be very factually specific. It depends on what the allegation was. No, no, this is a not good an investigation would investigate both the accuser and the accused, correct? Right. But this is not an allegation. This is just a full disclosure, remember? If there's an allegation, sure. That, that's covered oh, in now. And that, in, that would be up to 20. the party whether they would want to participate. So if this is someone you know, from 20 years ago that doesn't want to speak to us, 
It would be up to the that's uh, up to that person, and we would not pressure that person into that. And then it is what it is. Or draw any conclusions from Correct. them lacking. Correct. Not, not and generally, you know, disclose. You know, that's what we find in these investigations. And even we'll get to the criminal. If you disclose things, that's you're demonstrating forthrightness and truthfulness. So if you're explaining, hey, there was this situation here, and here's what happened. That's an indicia of, of reliability in that you're coming forward and, and talking about it. You're not trying to hide anything. So that actually works in the favor of the applicant. Well, I like your suggestion about 21 uh, in terms of adding. Uh, are, we, are we talking about, uh, you know, if we eliminated 19? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's, in my opinion, it's uncomfortably vague. Mm -hmm. um, are we? Um, are we talking about workplace only, or are we talking about any kind of Well, no, it's connected situation. to anything that would be relevant to your suitability. So that it's already captioned to be relevant to suitability. Right. So it's giving a further example about and being a little more explicit in the catch-all. And number 20 is not confined to employment. Correct. Right. You know, ultimately, it sounds like where we are is um, we could either do the questions as is, or, or it seems like we could eliminate 19, or the third option is what uh, Commissioner O'Brien said, eliminate, eliminate 19 and add at the end of the question after the word qualification, including any other misconduct not disclosed above, which seems to be sort of in between the, the t two other options. So we'll just look to see whichever the commission goes with, we can then move forward with the forms as you desire. Yeah, to be clear, I was fine with the, the form as it was, um, but I understand there's some concern about being vague. Disclosures mm -hmm. for this level is high, um, heightened. The self-awareness that's required would also be need to be heightened. We can capture it in the way that you, you thought, so I'm fine with that recommended change. Okay. Generally, we, uh, my understanding is in the past the commission has approved these forms, so it probably makes sense just to do a quick vote on that, make sure that we're clear that that's what the commission wants, and then we'll go forward and I'll move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Is there further questions or discussion for Director Wells? So it looks like a uh, uh, consensus emerged on, mm -hmm. on eliminating 19. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the same mind. I didn't have quite the level of concerns on 19. I was more in line with the chair, but I see where you're coming from. I feel like eliminating 19 and adding the phrase to what's currently 21 what would become 20 mm -hmm. sufficiently gets to the purpose to the purpose of 19 and it might capture some other things that we're not right that's even beyond thinking 19. of under that's just 19. exactly right so i i do think you were seeking a vote um on on this form right. so do we have a motion certainly madam chair i move that the commission approve the modifications to the Massachusetts supplemental form as described by the commission staff today and as included in the commission packet. As further amended, however, to strike proposed question 19 and add to the end of question 21 the phrase, including any other misconduct not disclosed above. Second. Second. And any further questions? All right. Um, do all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Four zero. Thank you, Director Wells. Thank you. On. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. And then the next uh, area uh, for the commission's consideration is in the um, forms that we submit, particularly to the service level employees and the um, gaming employees. Uh, there was some uh, concern by the commission about the um, just sort of uh, clarifying the sort of the instructions in the form so people that are filling out the form know what they are required to submit so there's no ambiguity there. Uh, so we've added for your packet uh, some modifications just to make it easier for people to understand that we really need truthful and full disclosure and that's what we're working with and that's what we expect. Uh, so for example, um, you know, charge. In the definition of charge, we want to uh, including, uh, we want to include the language, including juvenile charges. Because what happens with uh, juvenile charges, there's the applicants required to disclose them, 
However, no juvenile charges are mandatory disqualifiers. So even though you have to disclose it, you don't, it's not going to be a mandatory dis disqualifier, even if it is a larceny charge that, if you had been an adult, would have disqualified you. It does not disqualify you as a juvenile. Um, and then we have uh, you know, that language under conviction to make that clear to the applicant. Um, dispositions also include delinquent and not delinquent, which are dispositions for juvenile offenders. Um, uh, the fact that you have to submit uh, in the form the charges or offenses, uh, even if you weren't convicted or found delinquent, or if, uh, even if you weren't placed in handcuffs. You don't have to actually be arrested to be charged with a crime. Um, we wanted to emphasize in the form also that applicants are not required to disclose records of criminal appearances, criminal dispositions, and or um, any acts of delinquency that have been sealed. So that information is um, not required on the form. And also to make uh, applicants aware that the Gaming Commission will make inquiries to establish whether you have had any involvement with law enforcement agencies and that failure to disclose such involvement will be taken to a, into account in assessing your character, honesty, and integrity. Just to make sure people are aware um, that, that that is an issue. And also, there was a suggestion just to make the, um, the space for the uh, applicant to fill out uh, any offenses, put more, more space in the form, just in case there were several charges. Uh, or maybe several charges relating to the same incident that they would list all of those charges. So those are the, the types of changes made to the form. Um, there, there was um, a suggestion um, in when we were doing the briefings that we might want to add something not to this part of the form, but also to the front of the form that uh, um, Commissioner O'Brien and, and uh, Commissioner uh, Stebbins we talked about, which is that we may want to put some language that applicants may want to check with the employee and casino HR department for advice on how to prepare out, prepare to fill out the application form. So we can add that as well if the, the uh, commissioners think that's a good idea. Just because the casinos themselves can help with this, you know, as the regulatory authority, it's not our role to, to work with the employee to fill out the form they're submitting to us. But the casinos can do that. And the casinos may have some advice getting all your paperwork together. Maybe you, you know, go to your iCORI and run your quarry before you fill out the form just to make sure you have everything correctly and you have mm -hmm. things. So uh, we've talked to the casinos about doing that with their, um, with their HR departments to work with their employees on that. Because nobody's looking for anybody uh, to uh, make a mistake on the form. We'd like everybody to fill it out honestly and completely. It's easier for us because we can run through these much more efficiently and it's better for the applicant. So communicating to these folks that are filling out the forms that honesty and completeness is extremely important in this process uh, can't be emphasized enough. So uh, putting that in the, um, in the sort of the, that front page on LMS I think would be a good idea if the commission's in support of that. I, oh. No, I, I, I like that idea and that suggestion. Um, you know, something else I think we should do uh, if we approve, you know, the changes to the form uh, with respect to a lot of our workforce stakeholders that mm -hmm. are out there, you know, beating the bushes, trying to get people interested in, in pursuing uh, uh, a casino career. And, you know, we had one of these meetings out in Springfield. Let's get them in the room and kind of, again, walk through this process, help them understand. Um, I think some of this language is, you know, might be, you know, might be viewed as um, intimidating. I know that's not what we're trying to get through, but I think having a conversation uh, with those CBOs to kind of help walk them through the process. Again, the same thing, you know, some of the instructions that a, uh, one of our licensees might use might be great information for that CBO to carry to an individual, like, go do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, if, you know, we find ourselves not able to, to make those suggestions ourselves, again, it's more people out there aware of our process, aware of what we're looking for, and helping the individual. Because, again, some of the cases that get to us are just people, you know, you've raised this before, people just not completing the form. And some of the omissions are clearly, like, how could you have missed that? Right. Um, but again, trying to get people to be 
truthful and honest on the form. You know, I think making extra room is is fine, even though if you're filling out that much room, um, you may not be a good candidate. Uh, but again, I think taking it to the next step is bringing those groups in, and, and also, you know, our regional employment board workforce people who are out yeah. there talking to them about the licensees' jobs as well. Uh, I think everybody being on the same page or having the overall awareness of what the forum is looking for, uh, I think would be a great next step. Well, I would go a step further to offer uh, not just the casinos, but the licensing department. Well, they've been, they've been very helpful. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I will point out, and, and uh, Bill Curtis mentioned to me the other day, you know, uh, Mary Polgarin is a Spanish-speaking uh, employee. And she has a great rapport with a lot of the folks that may call in with questions. If you know, they, it, some, uh, sometimes speaking in your first language is a lot more comfortable. So mm -hmm. uh, he had said, you know, let's get the word out. If they have questions about filling out the form, they could call and we could put them in touch with yeah. Mary, uh, just to make people yeah. feel a little less intimidated. And well, that, and that's precisely my point. That yeah. could we also offer in the form? Well, see to the call to if, if necessary, yeah. or if you feel um, there is the like, you know, he's. Not only that anecdote that you yeah. give, or that um, we've all, we've also heard from vendors who call licensing, and they are very appreciative of the ability to be able to to talk to Bill or whomever else. Right. Why couldn't we offer in the form if you have any questions on these? You know, if you don't know how to answer these questions. I'm trying you to can think reach, if there may be something like that on LMS the on the home page. I'll have to check if they, we may already have something like that because I'm thinking how do they, how do they already know how to call? Because people do call. When I went through the, the, the briefing, I feel as though it's there, but we can clarify. I did ask right. about whether there were interpretive right. services available. Right. And not, not in yes. every language. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but let me check, because that might already be there, but that's a good thing for LMS to have on there. If you have any questions about filling out the form, here is a, a resource for you, um, because they, they've been great. We get great yeah. feedback no, about I, our I, licensing team. We get great feedback from those who do, but maybe we observe only the, pro, the proactive people, the people who, you know, right. who think, oh, I, don't, I really don't know how to answer this. I better call somebody. Right. Um, I think a, you know, just noting that you could seek help in the form you could and should, in many instances, talk right. to the casinos, just like you're saying, Commissioner, talk to others. Right. The obvious place in my mind is mm -hmm. the licensing department. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that. And to I that that's same good group, idea. introducing them to Mary is a resource. Yeah, right. again. And also, i got to tell you, with the wave of applicants, I mean, it was crazy with the thousands coming in. But you know, when things settle down a little bit, it's actually a lot more manageable to have a little more interaction. I, and I would offer that it's probably even more efficient to have somebody oh, fill out, the, you know, fill it mm -hmm. out for, right and the first time around. We, that's what we want. We want people to fill it out truthfully and completely on the front end, and that's part of what licensing does: is make sure that, and then, then things move so much more efficiently on the back end. So we are 100% in favor of that. Right. I just want to thank. Um, Director Wells and, and IEB for being responsive. I think that this is derived from a decision that we made on an appeal. Mm -hmm. um, we, we noticed that the forum could use some improvement just for clarity, and you're very responsive. An obvious change is that there's more room so that it prompts um, individuals to, to be able to clearly write in their responses. There's a lot more uh, simplicity and clarity. So I think that the uh, the form is very responsive. And I think that we can be nimble and continue to improve it um, as we learn more right. and more how uh, challenges ar um, arise for any applicant. Other, other questions or comments or suggested edits for this? So this, the, what's in the packet is the um, is the actual form it's, itself. So it asked, you know, for a, a vote on on that. The uh, the language on the licensing team, then the contact number, and also the applicants checking with the casino HR department. I can just work with Bill on that. I don't I don't necessarily need a vote for that, but it'd probably be helpful to have a vote on the the form for the packet. But 
but will include th that language in the form eventually? Well, well, the form, the instructions. It's, it's sort of the instructions, instructions okay. in LMS versus the form. I may be, what, okay. may be splitting hairs as there. As long as people it includes reasonably it. can see it up front. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So we'll have to, we can even run through like a test on LMS and make sure somebody can see it. Because most, if not almost all these applicants are doing it on the licensing management yes. system. So that's where we'd really want to make sure people I can under, identify I understand. it. Yeah. Any further questions for Director Wells? Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the modifications to the criminal history section in the license and application forms as described by Commission staff today and as included in the Commission packet. Second. Any further questions? Discussion? Commissioner Stebbins, all set? Do you have an, do, are you noticing something that you want to bring up? Um, just for clarification, thank you, Madam Chair. Just for clarification, Karen, um, sealing of records only pertains to those things uh, somebody might have done as a youth under 18. An adult. An adult. You could both right. not require to right. disclose. This is this sealed. language is exactly from the regulation. So what it says, you're not required to disclose records of criminal appearances, that's adult, mm -hmm. criminal dispositions, adult, and or any information concerning acts of delinquency that have been sealed. So there's a broader scope for delinquency in the reg. So this is track, <coughs> exactly tracking the reg. And we've got an issue on the sealed records, which we're going to bring before you again. But right now, this is exactly how the language is, is in, the, in the regulation, which you promulgated right. years ago. Right. OK. Right. Would Thank it make you. sense to make that a sequence? Okay, so that no one, uh, uh, it has to be anything of delinquency that's sealed? Like I'm not really following. Well, it, the way I read it was I'm, not the I'm way you putting, just said We it. put it in there because this is exactly what the reg says. So I wouldn't want to deviate from the reg or sort of modify that because this is exactly what the regulation says. So um, what we are going to be bringing forward before the commission is we're going to ask for some clarification on exactly on what you want this to mean. So Got we'll it. have, but this is exactly what it says. So As how we know. implement it, we want to make sure you're comfortable with, but. Um, this is exactly how it reads. So that's why I make sure we don't deviate. Okay. Right. Yep. Thank you, Karen. Okay. And so we have a motion before us that's been seconded. I believe what I'm hearing from Director Wells is stay tuned. There will be clarity sought for that um, particular clause, and we may end up keeping exactly um, yep. to reflect the, re the regulation. Do we have further questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is 440, and we have one more matter on our agenda um, other than our commissioner updates and anything else that would be brought to our attention. Uh, commissioners and Mr. Grossman in the back <laughs> of the, uh, the room, are we all set to proceed? at this juncture? Phil. I think we can do a very short overview, and then my recommendation would be, I don't know what the agenda looks like for Springfield, we, we whether we then have to. the substantive when Commissioner Cameron is back in Springfield so that we can kick it off briefly, but given the time, is I, that I, okay? think, I think we do very, very brief overview, and then I'll I didn't, just continue this. On this item, I didn't want to get too far in the discussion without her. So. Right, exactly. I think that's a great idea. Do you, do you want to, can, can I start with that overview? We well, have uh, Mr. Grossman come up uh, front too. Thank okay. you. Should we let, let Mr. Grossman? We'll take um, everyone's lead on how you want to proceed. You want a brief overview? <laughs> <laughs> That's not brief. my forte, but I can try to <laughs> give you a brief overview. A brief brief. No. We will knock you off your cadence. If <laughs> We need to come up with a renewal scheme for <laughs> casino <laughs> license. Is this your telephone voice? <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
Well, the synopsis is that the casino licenses run for five and 15 years respectively. PPC's license expires on June 24th of next year. We do need a mechanism by which to uh, consider the renewal of that license. The law in a number of areas requires the commission to come up with the renewal scheme. Uh, there is not a lot of meat on the bones in the statutes when it comes to prescribing exactly what the commission needs to look at, um, other than the fact that you have to have a renewal fee. Um, and uh, one other minor detail about uh, impacted live entertainment venues. Otherwise, the statutes don't get into a lot of detail about what the renewal uh, process should look like. We did look at a number of other jurisdictions to get a sense as to how other jurisdictions handle renewal processes. Uh, there is no one model that um, is used in any uh, place, but there are a few themes that tend to emerge. Most jurisdictions will look at things like the suitability of the entities and the individuals involved, as well as the financial stability of the operation, including the parent. They all seem, generally speaking, to be less uh, thorough than the initial, what we call RFA1 uh, licensing process. Um, and of course, we can get into it at a later time, some of the particulars, which we lay out in the memo uh, that you have before you as to how other jurisdictions handle that. There were a few threshold um, questions that we thought would be helpful for the commission to consider uh, as we set out to come up with a process, which I would submit would be best done by way of regulation, um, just to clarify for all the players involved uh, what the process would be. Of course, the two category one uh, licenses won't come up for renewal for about 14 or 15 years at this point, so could be modified in the intervening years, which may or may not include any of us. So. Um, uh, the right. <laughs> well, it may include a different uh, panel just by that's virtue right. of the that's statute. What I mean. I'm not. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, so the the first one of the first questions to look at is uh, licensing fee. Whether you think um, there has to be a licensing fee for category two, it has to be at least a hundred thousand um, dollars, and it will of course include. Uh, the cost of any investigation that goes into uh, the renewal process. The question though, not that it needs to be decided definitively here today or even at your next meeting, is whether you want to um, uh, assess any additional fee on top of that. Um, some states assess millions of dollars, others assess very little. Um, the, as we note in the memo, the commission took the long view uh, the first time it looked at the assessment of a licensing fee and assessed the statutory minimum with the philosophy that it would prefer that any additional available funds be put into the establishments themselves. So that's something to think about, something to consider. Uh, looking at the other jurisdictions there may or may not be helpful uh, because there's no one way of doing it. Um, Let's see. The, um, the term of the licenses is another interesting question, uh, and this might be a longer conversation, but just to put it on your radar, the statutes, uh, and there are essentially two sections, talk about the clearly the initial terms of the licenses. Uh, in the case of category one is 15 years, and the category two is clearly five years. The question is whether you have any inclination to uh, adjust those for the renewal periods, and if so, we can certainly consider whether that would be allowable under the statute or not. Um, and of course, there are a variety of reasons you may or may not want to, to do that. The third question is really the big ticket item, which is what types of issues are you interested in exploring as part of the renewal process? We've talked a little bit about the suitability of the individuals and the entities, the financial stability of the 
uh, entity in the parents is, of course, uh, important. Uh, there are other things to consider, like compliance with uh, license conditions throughout the period of the licensure, uh, the compliance with host and surrounding community agreements, with the ILEV agreements, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and all those things are fair game uh, for review. Certainly, uh, compliance with the capital expenditure plan, whether it's uh, doing what we had hoped it would do, whether that needs any adjustment, uh, these are all things to think about as part of a renewal process. Of course, all these things are also things you can just do on a daily basis as we oversee the casinos um, to ensure their compliance on a regular basis. And finally, and I don't necessarily uh, think this is the case, but if there are any issues with the statute that require legislative um, updating, then uh, the door is left open in the statute to uh, send those over to the legislature for consideration. There was nothing that jumped out um, in need of adjustment, but the statute does uh, open that door for us. So those are the main issues that we wanted to uh, bring up. Um, and by we, I mean uh, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Zuniga, and I have discussed uh, these issues on a number of occasions, uh, but wanted to, of course, uh, bring this to the full attention of the Commission. Time is of somewhat of the essence in that, you know, we need to have a process in place for the re-licensing, uh, the potential re-licensing of Plain Ridge Park Casino coming up next year. I, thank you. That's a, that's a great synopsis. I, um, I would just um, add a couple of things that um, since the packet, uh, there's more information in a nice um, chart that, that you dug up, uh, Todd, that, uh, that you only alluded to, but we could provide in terms of context for, for uh, what other states do. Uh, I would um, perhaps put them in a couple of different buckets. There's a few states that have unlimited license licenses that I would say it's good for us to know, but really doesn't really apply in terms of um, you know the, the similarity to us, uh, given the competitive nature and the limited number of licenses that our statute um, has. So there's other states that may provide more um, similarities into how we might go about doing this. It's probably fair to say that everybody has some kind of process, just like you articulated, that we would also uh, mirror to some, or, or um, um, have or parallel to some degree. Um, the bigger question is those threshold issues that you, that you mentioned. Uh, the term, in my mind, is, is, is a big one, the licensing fee. Um, I do believe, uh, and this is part of what we really should discuss at a later time with more uh, a discussion about this, that there is a presumption of relicensing, that the notion, not only in other states that we looked at, but certainly in our, in our um, case here, um, that it would be really quite disruptive or overly, unnecessarily ambitious to think that we could just simply rebid this license. We would really have to account for what would be the asset that we currently uh, license on their pen that we do not own. There are cases in uh, Canada, for example, where the government does own the asset and they bid the operator and it's fairly straightforward to just change operators because that's not the scheme that we have here and for many other reasons that I guess uh, we could also get into, um, at least my read is this presumption of relicensing. Now, we don't have to give it away for free, and that's the point of the threshold questions that you well articulate, and, and that's how we embark on the discussion. Mm -hmm. You wanna add to that? No, and it just that we had asked uh, Attorney Grossman to do that to see if there was anything on point that would be particularly helpful in terms of guiding us. There's really nothing that speaks directly to what we need. I do think it's helpful to see so we can eliminate what we don't want and go forward with it. Um, I think there was a comment made about Maryland maybe being close to similar to us, but of course they're not in a posture to renew anyone anyway, and so they're not, even though in theory they would be helpful, it might be the other way around, that they'd be looking at us later. 
Um, and so the questions that are in the memo, I think, are sort of the primary questions that we think we need to decide on before we then set up the regs for exactly how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining continuing this agenda item potentially on the 26th. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yep. Todd, thank you for the overview. That was excellent. And I do think we will put it um, on the agenda for a continued um, discussion so that we can give um, more helpful guidance at this, at this point and really spend some time chewing on the issues that you've outlined. But it gives us a chance. Um, we'll, we'll, you'll update Commissioner Cameron. It gives Commissioner Stebbins and me a chance to really think about other questions we might have. So we'll push it over now to September 26. Right. If well, that's okay. Great. Sounds good. All right. Now, do we have any commissioner updates? Are you sure? Motion to adjourn. Well, I did want to go over oh. item number 11. No, oh. just <laughs> those matters reserved for the, any that the chair thinks had not reasonably anticipated at the time of posting. I'll set a motion to adjourn, second, and all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? 4 0. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your uh, attendance and your vigilance. Thank Thanks. you.